Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the Chief of the Indonesian Navy. Please be seated. The Honorable the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudo Margono. The Deputy Minister of Defense of the Republic of Indonesia, Mr. M. Herindra. Chief of General Staff of the Indonesian Armed Forces, Lieutenant General Eko Margiono. Navy Chiefs from friendly countries, speakers, and all delegation participating in the Fourth International Maritime Security Symposium 2021, attending here in Yosudarso Auditorium, the Indonesian Navy Command and Staff College, and also virtually from your respective countries. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants from around the globe, and welcome to this event. I am Captain Sylvia as your MC, and I would like to begin by wishing all of us to be in the best health condition and looking forward to following the symposium for the coming two days. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to begin this program, please rise and join in singing the Indonesian national anthem, Indonesia Raya. All rise, please. You may now be seated. Participants, ladies and gentlemen, next I invite you to view a short video presentation of the Ford IMSS 2021. President Joko Widodo at the 9th East Asia Summit in 2014, conveyed the vision of the World Maritime Axis, which is a form of realizing Indonesia's geostrategy as an effort to utilize Indonesia's marine assets economically and strategically. The Maritime Axis vision has five main pillars, namely the development of maritime culture, optimal protection and management, of marine resources for the benefits of the people, development of maritime infrastructure and connectivity, maritime cooperation through diplomacy, and development of maritime defense forces. The Indo-Pacific perspective automatically places Indonesia in the Southeast Asia region 
as the central point connecting the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean regions. Regional policies emphasize the development of regional cooperation arrangements, mechanisms and institutions that enable all countries to manage common interests through regional cooperation mechanisms that allow countries to develop mutually beneficial cooperation and discuss and manage potential conflicts, mistrust, suspicions, and various forms of other threats. Non-traditional security issues span widely in different but interrelated and sometimes overlapping areas, such as threats to environmental security, food security, economic security, energy security, human security, maritime security, and several security threats that have never appeared in the past, such as financial crisis, internet hacking, drug trafficking, to the spread of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, bird flu, and so on. The outbreak of this disease shows that health problems are closely related to social and political aspects. The strategic region in the Asia-Pacific region is now facing many challenges amidst many incidents in the Indo-Pacific region. This makes it quite difficult for many countries in the region to focus on solving health problems due to COVID-19 and issues of territorial sovereignty. Facing this, a form of cooperation is urgently required in solving various maritime security problems, cooperation in the spirit of helping each other, working collectively and having mutual understanding will be the utmost importance on top of individual national interests. For security, peace and prosperity, the relationship between the younger generations needs to be accommodated through maritime character training in the form of training sailing ship festival which is held in rotation and continuously on the continents of Europe, America, Australia, Asia, and for these reasons, it is very important to encourage the formation of training ship organization in Asia through this important forum. From this background, the Indonesian Navy for the fourth time holds the fourth International Maritime Security Symposium MSS in 2021 in order to explore the latest trends in maritime order challenges and build an effective multilateral maritime security cooperation framework in the region. This activity is expected to contribute to efforts to create order and security at sea to be enjoyed by all countries in the world. It is IMSS 2021. Indonesia as the host invites 58 representatives of the Navy from participating countries of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Through maritime diplomacy involving navies from various countries and in accordance with the theme of the 4th International Maritime Security Symposium 2021, which is International Maritime Cooperation for Security, Peace and Prosperity is expected to contribute an effective approach in enhancing the framework of cooperation between countries in the field of maritime order cooperation and an effort to realize order and security achieve that is beneficial to all countries in the world. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, our next program is the welcome remarks that will be delivered by the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudo Margono. The floor is yours, sir. Sorry, I'm open max. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, good morning. His Excellency, Minister of Defense of the Republic of Indonesia, represented by Deputy of Minister of Defense, the Commander of the Indonesian National Armed Forces, represented by Head of General Staff 
of the Indonesian National Ampos, Distinguished Chief of Navy, Heads of Delegation, Senior Officer, and Representative of International Maritime Agencies, and all participants of the Fourth International Maritime Security Symposium in 2021. First of all, let us praise all my God that we all get here by His grace and kindness. To commence, please let me begin by welcome to all of you in Jakarta. Also to express how honored we are to host this important symposium. I would also extend my profound gratitude to you, Distinguished Maritime Security Symposium, Distinguished Guests, for taking part in the Fourth International Maritime Security Symposium 2021. This event has become a routine biennial agenda hosted by the Indonesian Navy and today's symposium followed by 259 participants and 58 particip participant countries. Pandemic COVID-19 should not be a meaningful obstacle to carry out this symposium. By using the technology of information, we can strengthen the message that we want to submit to the maritime community. This event also show that Indonesia, as an archipelago nation, will remain keeping and sustaining our ocean. Your Excellencies, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, South as Asia and linking area with is connect both Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. As a result, every state have the policies and emphasize the development of arrangement and mechanism of cooperation within the framework of the management of interest together at sea, based on mutual benefit and cooperative to discuss controlling the potential conflict, distrust, suspicion, and various other from the threats. By taking a security threat as the background of the symposium, the theme of this International Maritime Security Symposium this year is International Maritime Security Cooperation for Security, Peace and Prosperity with the objective to explore the trend of development of challenges of borderlines and maritime security also to establish a framework of effectiveness multilateral cooperation maritime security. We need more and effort to realize of concept of underlines and security at sea. Non-traditional of maritime security threats related of environmental, food, economic, human and maritime security are being high legs resulting from linkage and the possibility for overlapping, additionally, this conditioning become was with security threats in the health sector, like the current, like the current COVID-19 pandemic. Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, in the future, the challenge of the maritime sector will be more completed so no country and overcome them alone. In my perspective, cooperation is the key element to improving and expanding the capacity and capabilities of the East nation in dealing with these issues. In accordance with the theme of this symposium, we need a critical thinking and the understanding of biological defense maritime challenge and biological defense, maritime challenge and opportunity, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. The, the ASEAN Cell Training Organization, Military 
intelligent activities in exclusive economic zone and autonomous vehicle operation. So we get fresh ideas, ideas that can be implemented for security, peace, and prosperity of our country. Even though the symposium is implemented in hybrid, but we must keep the spirit and do not make it an obstacle in expanding knowledge. Therefore, I ask the symposium agenda to become a foundation of the international interactive. Furthermore, forum education sucks as this symposium have become a necessity and I do hope that talk this event we all could recognize. The challenges and opportunities the further expand our, our cooperation to ensure our maritime security and stability. Your Excellencies, distinguished speaker and participants, finally, with the blessing of the God Almighty, as the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, I declare the fourth International Maritime Security Symposium 2020 is officially opened. May this event, may this event run successfully. We can enhance our current cooperation for our future, and hopefully, we can go talk this pandemic as the winner. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, Charles so Weva Jayamahi. Thank you, Admiral. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now enjoy a traditional dance performance originated and flourished in Batawi society native to Jakarta. The dance depicts the joy of girls during the party. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the dancing puppet Ondel Ondel.
Now I can invite the Malaysian and Brazilian defense attaché as representatives to come forward to receive the floral wreaths from Abang and Noni Jakarta. Malaysian and Brazilian defense attaché, please come forward. Abang and Noni are how young star are called in Batawi ethnic group. Abang means brother, Noni means sister. These calls have been adopted as the symbol of Jakarta Youth Ambassador of Tourism and Culture. The flowers red will be presented to Malaysian Defense Attaché Brigadier General Bizuan Abu Bakar is the most senior in rank and Colonel Zerno Faiz from Brazilian Defense Attaché represents the Brazil is the farthest in distance from Indonesia. Okay, thank you and please take your seat. Honorable participants, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue our program today by receiving the opening remarks from the Commander-in-Chief of the Indonesian Armed Forces, which will be delivered by Chief of General Staff of Indonesian Armed Forces, Lieutenant General Eko Margiono. Sir, time is yours. Sebelum saya bacakan sambutan Panglima TNI, Pada kesempatan ini, izinkan kami menyampaikan ucapan permohonan maaf bahwa Panglima TNI, Maskal TNI Adi Cahyanto, yang tidak dapat mengikuti acara pembukaan International Maritime Security Symposium karena pada saat yang bersamaan ada kegiatan yang tidak dapat ditinggalkan. Panglima TNI memerintahkan kepada saya selaku kasum TNI untuk membacakan sambutan beliau pada acara pembukaan ini. Sambutan Panglima TNI pada acara The Fourth International Maritime Security Symposium. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Shalom, Om Swastiastu. Yang terhormat, Wakil Menteri Pertahanan Republik Indonesia, Bapak Muhammad Erindra. Yang saya hormati, Kepala Staf Angkatan Laut. Laksamana TNI Yudo Margono SAMM, para kepala staf angkatan laut dan ketua delegasi negara-negara sahabat, para pembicara dan moderator, para perwakilan organisasi maritim internasional, serta seluruh peserta simposium yang saya muliakan. Mengawali sambutan, marilah kita majatkan puji syukur kehadirat Tuhan Yang Maha Esa. Karena atas karunianya kita dapat menghadiri International Maritime Security Symposium 2021 dalam keadaan sehat walafiat. Saya juga mengucapkan selamat datang dan terima kasih kepada seluruh peserta yang hadir, khususnya kepada para peserta dari 58 negara sahabat. Situasi pandemi COVID-19 bukan menjadi penghalang bagi kita untuk berpartisipasi dan berkontribusi positif bagi stabilitas keamanan maritim di kawasan nasional, bahkan internasional. Hadirin yang saya hormati, dalam beberapa dekade terakhir, keamanan maritim menjadi isu yang sangat penting, terlebih di masa pandemi COVID-19 seperti saat ini. Sektor keamanan, Maritim menjadi fokus perhatian untuk dijaga kestabilannya. Hal ini disebabkan stabilitas keamanan maritim mampu mempengaruhi kondisi perekonomian, politik, serta keamanan suatu negara. Tantangan di bidang maritim ke depan akan semakin kompleks dan dinamis. Dan tidak ada satu negara pun yang mampu mengatasi sendiri tantangan yang ada dalam rangka melindungi 
dan memanfaatkan kepentingan nasionalnya. Oleh karena itu, pendekatan kerjasama menjadi salah satu kunci penting. Di samping itu, globalisasi saat ini telah mendorong terjalinnya kerjasama kemitraan global yang lebih menguntungkan antar negara-negara kawasan, bahkan di luar kawasan. Kondisi ini menyadarkan kita bahwa tidak ada satu negara pun di dunia ini yang mampu menghindari saling ketergantungannya terhadap negara lain, khususnya dalam menciptakan sebuah stabilitas keamanan maritim. Dalam simposium internasional ini, saya mengharapkan adanya kontribusi dari seluruh peserta melalui sumbangan pemikiran terkait upaya meningkatkan keamanan maritim melalui strategi kerjasama multilateral yang efektif sehingga mampu mendorong terwujudnya kestabilan keamanan maritim yang mengarah pada peningkatan perekonomian sekaligus peningkatan hubungan diplomatik antar negara. Hadirin yang saya hormati, sebagai penutup, saya mengucapkan terima kasih kepada segala pihak yang telah berkontribusi sehingga kegiatan ini dapat terselenggara dengan baik. Semoga kegiatan simposium dapat berjalan dengan sukses dan memberi manfaat yang besar, serta memiliki nilai kontribusi bagi terciptanya perdamaian dunia yang kita inginkan. Sekian dan terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Santi 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 Om. Panglima TNI, Hadi Cahyanto SIP, Marskal TNI, ditandatangani dan dicap. Thank you, sir. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is the keynote speech and official opening statement of the fourth IMSS 2021 by Minister of Defense of the Republic of Indonesia that will be conveyed by Indonesian Deputy Minister of Defense, Mr. M. Herindra. Sir, time is yours. Thank you. Chief of the Indonesian Navy, all distinguished participants of the 4th International Maritime Security Symposium 2021, a very good morning. First and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation for your participation at this Maritime Symposium in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is very unfortunate that this pandemic still forbids us to meet in person. The COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. Despite the breakthrough of the COVID-19 vaccine, today we are still witnessing the new wave of COVID-19 striking some countries with more devastating impacts. Global disparity of vaccines risk prolonging the grip of the pandemic, including the Southeast Asia. Many countries have not been able to self-fulfill the domestic need for the vaccine. Therefore, in the near future, we still have to deal with this pandemic. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, other security challenges in the region and beyond require our extra attention. Traditional and non-traditional security threats are becoming interlinked and intertwined. The advance of technologies have made them transnational and unrestricted by national borders. I believe 
that then the continuing evolution of technology presents both opportunities for growth and threats to security in the region. Today, we have witnessed non-traditional security threats such as COVID-19 pandemic, cyber security, trade war, food scarcity, climate change, energy security, and maritime security could highly impacts our people's security and our region stability. As you are all aware, Indonesia and the Southeast Asia region lies strategically at the Indo-Pacific region, where more than half of the world's population resides and where 70% of the world's economic output is produced. Two-thirds of the entire economic productivity of the world comes from the Indo-Pacific region. Some countries might be the dominant players who run spares of influence over the region. This situation contributes to the increases in our regional economic growth. On the other hand, the interests of the dominant powers have increased strongly. This condition might lead to a vulnerable situation caused by the class of interests. In responding to the evolving geopolitical dynamics, we have no other option but to ensure that the region remains stable, peaceful, and prosperous. We must continue to promote the habit of dialogue over rivalry, strategic trust over trust deficit, win-win cooperation over zero-sum game, in accordance with the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, or AOIP. AOIP has reaffirmed ASEAN position towards the maintenance of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. The objectives and principles of the AOIP is to provide a guide for ASEAN's engagement in the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean region, while encouraging external threat. Sorry, while encouraging external partners, the four key areas identified in the AOIP. In this way, we encourage all major powers in the region to cooperate and build confidence to transform a zero-sum game into a win-win situation that benefits all our people. We cannot let major power rivalries and strategic competition among major powers of the world destabilize this region. One of the four key areas of cooperation stated in the AOIP is maritime cooperation, which covers enhancement of cooperation for peaceful settlement of disputes, promoting maritime safety and security, freedom of navigation and overflight, and addressing international crimes. Furthermore, it also includes cooperation for sustainable management of marine resources, cooperation to address marine environmental problems, as well as technical cooperation in marine science. In the defense sector, Indonesia is the initiator of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, views the importance of explaining in more details ASEAN approach to the Indo-Pacific from a defense perspective, particularly defense cooperation with ASEAN dialogue partners, which has greatly contributed to creating peace and prosperity in the world. At the last ASEAN Defense Minister meeting in June 2021, the discussion paper on the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific from a defense perspective has been agreed. ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific 
from a defense perspective serves a guide for ASEAN to implement the AOIP in the area of defense cooperation and ADMM interaction with dialogue partners. AOIP from a defense perspective is also aimed to bridge the interests of Indo-Pacific countries in order to maintain peace, security, and prosperity with ASEAN playing a central and strategic role. Ladies and gentlemen, we do realize that this region still has potential areas to destabilize the region if they are not managed properly. For instance, in the South China Sea issues, we must be very realistic in facing the critical issues in the South China Sea. We must recognize the national core interests of major powers in the conflicts. The world is becoming smaller. And we have to work together as brothers and the family of nations. Regional stability of peace are highly influenced by political will and the perception and wisdom of all the key stakeholders and the major players of the region. The major players of the region have been in this region for many years. We are all intertwined in one historical connection. We are all intertwined with cultural and civilizational relationship. Therefore, we are all in this region as one close interconnected family of nations. The key, therefore, in my opinion, is the utmost will to compromise and the will to understand the needs, the core interests of all parties. We have seen one small virus nearly brought this world to a standstill, nearly bring to, to a hub the human endeavor to achieve prosperity and security. I have to emphasize that one nation prosperity should not be at the expense of other national difficulties. We are no one, the family of nations. Let us resolve all problems in the spirit of common interest and common destiny. Compromise, give and take, mutual respect and wisdom. Even though I believe we probably need to recalibrate some of the things which is inappropriate to us to bring this region in security, peace, and prosperity. I'm convinced that all these issues can be and will be resolved through peaceful dialogue, mutual restraint, and wise leadership. With that, I conclude my speech and I officially open the fourth International Maritime Security Symposium 2021. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best for the good discussion in the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to commemorate our meeting today, now we will have a photo-taking session followed by a 15-minute coffee break. We invite all defense attaches, senior officers from Indonesian Navy HQ and SESQUAL, along with participants from Indonesian Navy officers to proceed to the official photo session that will be taken in the Pendopo building located next to this auditorium. If you could please follow our committee to the place we have provided for a photo station.
Honorable gentlemen, to capture our activities today, I would like to invite all chiefs of Navy to active your video, sir, to capture as a group photo. And we humbly invite the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, Deputy Minister of Defense, and Chief of General Staff of the Indonesian Armed Forces to join with group of photo with all chiefs of Navy around the globe. Okay, please get be ready and give your okay. best smile for the picture. Chief of Navy, thank you for participating in IMSS. Hopefully, our maritime relationship and cooperation can be improved over time. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the opening ceremony. And before we continue to the next session, may we invite Admiral Yudo Margona to have a coffee break for 15 minutes. And may we remind you that our agenda will be continued again at 9 a.m.
Discover the unseen world of Jakarta. A vibrant community that cherishes life in a myriad of interesting ways. Centuries of multicultural togetherness. From the tranquil seaside, fresh, exhilarating, and the mangrove forest, a nearby weekend getaway for families. The exciting waterfront and its variety of amusement. The Yacht Harbor to international expos. The National Theme Park. Jakarta still has the charm that fascinated travelers and traders since hundreds of years ago. Even in the Thousand Islands in the Jakarta Bay. Old strongholds. Museums feature histories of evolution and culture. Then, the old city hall brings together history and today. The today of a multicultural society that embraces song and dance and drama. Jakarta is also a global metropolis with its own brand of hot couture and invigorating nightlife. Dancing to the newest tracks or just cherish life. Fine dining with loved ones. Experience the good life in Jakarta. Innovative recipes, master chefs, gourmets, delicatessen, but also fascinating street food. There's always something for anyone. Shopping experiences are equally colorful in Jakarta, where traditional craft blend perfectly with global brands. Mix and match. And the art of bargaining is upheld in a smiling environment. Discover Jakarta and its hospitality that comes straight from the heart. The unique cuisine. The pampering of body and mind. Sheer amazement. And ultimately, lots and lots of fun. Discover Jakarta.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will commence shortly. We will ask you to please take your seats again. Thank you very much. Yang terhormat para hadirin, kami mohon dengan hormat untuk berkenan mengambil tempat duduk yang telah disiapkan. Acara akan segera dilanjutkan. Distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, we will shortly continue with our program today. We would appreciate it if you will please take your assigned seats. Yang terhormat, bapak-bapak dan ibu-ibu para hadirin sekalian, dalam waktu tidak lama lagi kita akan memulai dengan sesi satu dari simposium. Kami mohon dengan hormat untuk berkenan mengambil tempat duduk yang telah disiapkan. Terima kasih. Yang terhormat para hadirin, sesaat lagi kita akan mengawali kegiatan dengan sesi 1 dari IMSS keempat tahun 2021.
Bapak-bapak dan Ibu, para hadirin yang terhormat, sesaat lagi kita akan mengawali sesi pertama dari IMSS 2021. Kami mohon dengan hormat, Bapak-bapak dan Ibu-Ibu berkenan menempati tempat yang telah disediakan. Distinguished audience, we will shortly continue with our program for today. We ask that you will kindly take your seats. Thank you very much. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. We will now commence with today's schedule and continue with the first session of the symposium. Distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. To begin the first session today, we are honored to receive a speech by the Chief of the Royal Australian Navy, Vice Admiral Michael Noonan. I would like to invite Vice Admiral Noonan to deliver his speech. The time is yours, sir. Uh, thank you and, and hello everybody. I won't say good morning because I know for many people it's uh, afternoon and for some people it's evening. But uh, I'd like to firstly thank my very good friend Admiral Udo for the opportunity to make a few remarks uh, to this very dignified, distinguished and diverse audience that we have at this very important meeting today. I'd like to congratulate Admiral Udo and the Indonesian Navy for organising this very important event at a time when we are all in very challenging times. The issue of maritime security in our region has been no more important than it is right now. And certainly the opportunity to bring so many leaders and maritime security practitioners from our region and around the globe together is truly a testament to the leadership of Admiral Udo and his team. I would uh, certainly love to be in Jakarta in person. And uh, as I look around the screen and see so many familiar faces of my brothers and, uh, and fellow leaders from around the, uh, the globe, uh, I really do wish I could share a, a, a real cup of coffee rather than a virtual cup of coffee with you. But the importance of getting together uh, should not be understated. And this opportunity today and tomorrow to discuss, to, de to debate, and ultimately to drive forward the maritime security agenda is a very, very important one indeed. The current uh, pandemic has seen a tremendous impact on the world and our world's navies. But I congratulate each and every one of you for the resilience that you have shown, the leadership that you have shown, and the fortitude that your men and women have shown in continuing to undertake the very important operations and exercises and presence ops that our navies absolutely must continue to do during these difficult times. I know that many of you have seen cases of COVID-19 uh, in your navies and in your countries. And here in Australia right now, uh, I'm actually in lockdown in Canberra and uh, uh, having the opportunity to, uh, to connect virtually is, is wonderful because I can't leave my house until the end of, uh, of next week. But the importance of navies continuing their roles, not only 
in providing support to our communities and to each other, but it also provides reassurance to our men and women and our societies that our navies and our maritime forces are there when times are challenging. And I can't emphasize the importance that cooperation plays in everything that we do. We are all used to operating together in the maritime environment. And I continue to uh, be impressed by the way that we work together and exercise together in these challenging times. But over the last 18 months, we have seen our navies used to support communities and each other through the delivery of vaccines and the delivery of health support throughout our region. I'd like to congratulate the Deputy Minister for Defence on his excellent speech, where he called out the importance of cooperation and the importance of us working together and making sure that our collective actions are for the good of all and not for the betterment of one. Certainly, as I look at the effects that we have been able to achieve over the last 18 months, I'd like to draw upon one of Admiral Udo's top priorities, and that is the development and, maintain and maintenance of our human resources, of our people. It is our people who ultimately deliver our Navy capabilities. And it's through our people that we will prevail in the COVID-19 environment and against the other challenges that we might face in the months and years ahead. So gentlemen and ladies, as we work through the agenda of today and tomorrow, I would really like to underscore the imp importance of us working together to develop our people and for them to have a platform to continue to know each other, learn from each other and develop as a community of maritime security professionals and practitioners who will ensure the security of our region and the prosperity of our region for many, many years to come. Again, Admiral Udo and your team, uh, thank you for what you have done in bringing us together. I congratulate you and I look forward to seeing many of you uh, later this year in person uh, in either your country or in mine. And one final uh, uh, advertisement is that I will be hosting the uh, uh, Australian Sea Power Conference here in Australia, in Sydney, uh, from the 10th to the 12th of May next year. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible to join me and our colleagues for that event. All the best, Admiral Udo. Congratulations, sir. Over and out. Thank you very much, Admiral Noonan. Let us give a round of applause as appreciation to Admiral Noonan. Thank you, Admiral, for your insightful speech and making the time to grace the symposium with your virtual presence. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, please give your attention for a brief video presentation. Chief of the Indonesian Navy, distinguished participants. We will now move into the first session on biological defense, maritime challenge and opportunities. The presentations and discussion will be moderated by Dr. Connie Rahakundini Bakri.
a senior defense analyst, writer, and lecturer. Before we begin, allow me to read a concise biography of our moderator. Dr. Bakri is a graduate of the Chevening Executive Program for Democracy and Security in Birmingham University in the United Kingdom. Dr. Bakri also attended the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu and Fu Xingkang War College in the Republic of China. She was also a senior research fellow at the Institute of National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, Israel during her postgraduate research. Dr. Bakri is the author of two published books on Indonesian defense. She actively acts as a speaker in various forums and on media on defense-related issues. The doctor is a visiting lecturer at the Indonesian Armed Forces Joint College and the staff colleges of the Indonesian Navy and Air Force. For today's session, she will be accompanied by Colonel Werijon of the Indonesian Navy Marine Corps. I would like now to invite Dr. Koni Rahakundini Bakri and Colonel Werijon to take their seats on the stage. Let us welcome them with a warm round of applause. Welcome, Dr. Bakri and Colonel Werijon. I will now hand over the time to you for the first session. Good morning, Honorable Indonesian Mr. Minister of Defense, Mr. Prabowo Subianto, Commander-in-Chief of Indonesian Armed Forces, Air Chief Marshal Dr. Honoris Causa Hadi Cahyanto, Chief Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudo Margono, Excellencies, distinguished delegations, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. It is my pleasure to be a moderator for this seminar for session. I am Dr. Koni Rakunini Bakri, together with co-moderator, Marine Colonel Werijon. On behalf of IMSS committee, would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all. We deeply appreciate your taking time of your busy schedules and limited movement due to the pandemic, still be able to join us on our great event this morning, the Fourth International Maritime Security Symposium. It was great today to discuss our first session, the issue of biological defense, maritime challenge, and opportunity. This has become a symbol of globalization for goods to be distributed worldwide, and the emergence of our regions as the strategic center of maritime transport is also associated with an increasing numbers of threats which has happened at sea. Therefore, countries design their maritime strategy for na national security reasons. Domestic and socioeconomic factors such as economic growth, geostrategic interests, as well as other traits such as CBR and E, including biological events, may have such difference among states' maritime strategy. To harmonize various aspects, we need an inclusive and comprehensive regional maritime mechanism and strategic cooperation to maintain good order at the sea. Today in our first sessions, our opening speaker and three panelists that will be able to share in information between us were invited. Let us start our panels for the first sessions. Our topics in this session will be covering three, ma uh, three uh, major issues. First, the maritime security challenges in dealing with COVID-19. Second, uh, building military and civilian cooperation in overcoming COVID-19 challenges. And the last one is COVID-19 at its impact to shipping and port sectors. Now, allow us to invite our three great panelists. The first one, our panelists from the Naval Research Institute of China, Senior Captain Xiaofang Ren. He is researcher for the Naval Research Institute of the PLA Navy. He obtained his Doctor of Law from Beijing University, specializing in international law. He was legal advisor of the PLA Navy Escort Task Group in Gulf of Aden, an advocate and drafter of the Code 4 Unplanned Encounter of Sea at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. 
and one of the draftsmen of the rule of behavior for safety or air and maritime encounters. He also has been working a legal research on maritime security policy and related practical work. His publications include a monograph on law, military operation at the sea, the section of the law of the sea of international law adopted of China College and of an university textbook, as well as the chapter of the law of the sea and the law of naval warfare in the Encyclopedia of China. Next, our second panelist, Vice Admiral Ravnit Singh, FSM NM. Vice Admiral Ravnit Singh has assumed the office of Deputy Chief of Naval Staff of, on June 1st, 2021. Vice Admiral Ravnit Singh was com commissioned into the Indian Navy on July 1st, 1983, and specialized in aviation. The flag office is qualified flying instructor with Master Green Instrument Rating. He has flown S2. S2, Kiran HGT-16, TX-11, Iskra, Hunter, Harrier, Harrier GR-3, Jet Provost, Chitek, Gazelle, Hawk, and MiG-29 Coop aircraft during his illustrious career. The third panelist from Raja Ratnam School of International Studies, Singapore. His Excellency Ambassador Ong Ken Kiong. Ambassador Ong is Executive Deputy Chairman of the the Raja Ratnam School of RSIS at the Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. He is currently Director of Institute Defense and Strategic Studies. Mr. Ong continues to hold the position of Ambassador at large at the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is also a Singaporean non-resident High Commissioner to Pakistan and non-resident Ambassador to Iran. Mr. Ong has been the Chairman of the Singapore International Foundation since 2015. Mr. Ong was High Commissioner of Singapore to Malaysia from 2011 to 2014. He served as High Commissioner of Singapore to India and currently Singapore Ambassador to Nepal from 1996 to 1998. Mr. Ong served as the 11th Secretary General of ASEAN based in Jakarta, Indonesia from January 2003 to January 2008. The COVID-19 brought a great health problem around the world. Besides opinion and ways about how to prevent, protect, and mitigate, our government shown a massive campaign and programs. Indonesian Navy itself also shows a very serious commitment to get out of the pandemic crisis. Uh, starting from logi logi logistical assistance, oxy oxygen, blood donation to vaccination, simply to make Indonesia healthy and great again. But perhaps regarding challenges in dealing with this massive pandemic, we all still should learn it from China, which is accept the notion that the disease control is really a matter of science and technology. For that, we would give our first panelist, Mr. Xiao Feng Ren, 20 minutes to deliver his presentation. The floor is yours, Mr. Ren. Thank you, Chair. Honorable, you know, Magono, dear colleagues, good morning and afternoon. Um, my, it's my honor to attend this International Maritime Security Symposium, meet with you online and share views on the theme of the symposium, International Maritime Cooperation for Security peace and prosperity. At present, the COVID-19 pandemic is still rampant around the world. It keeps us from meeting each other face to face. While at the meantime, it also gives us a short interval to shendu. This is the concept in Chinese Confucian philosophy. That is, when you are alone, you can really look into your heart and soul and find out what a person really are and what a human being really want. During this period, the pandemic does give us, me a time and patience to look into certain professional issues. The ceilings of communication 
connected to the world. A sailor infected will put all his shipmates at risk. The virus can spread along the slugs. The current global public health situation has again proved a reality. That is, we are all connected in one community of a shared future. And the life safety of the human being as a whole are bound together. As a Navy officer and a research of maritime policy, I have struggling with the following theoretical issues. What is the significance of the concept of maritime community of a shared future for our times? How to further strengthen international maritime cooperation? Now, I would like to use this opportunity and platform to share some of my personal views. My presentation includes three parts. The first part, theoretical significance and aspirations of the maritime community of shared future. In April 2019, Xi Jinping, president of PLA, president of People's Republic of China, put forward his important theory of building a maritime community of shared future. When his meeting with the leaders of various navies and heads of delegations who attended the 70th founding anniversary of the Chinese PLA Navy. Maybe many of you witnessed this event. President Xi points out that we shall establish a new security concept that featured with common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable characteristics. We shall respect each other, treat each other as equals, enhance mutual trust, strengthen practical maritime cooperation, work together to address all kinds of maritime threats and challenges, and work together to safeguard maritime peace and tranquility. We shall promote maritime connectivity and practical cooperation in all fields, promote the development of blue economy, promote the melting of different maritime e cultures, and jointly enhance maritime well being. We should fully participate in the formulation and implementation of ocean governance mechanism and relevant regulations within the framework of the United Nations, implement the objectives of marine. Su sustainable development, prevent marine pollution, protect marine biodiversity, and realize orderly development and a sustainable use of marine resources. Nations should deal with their matters and problems through consultation rather than use or threat of use of force. We should improve crisis management mechanism, step up regional security cooperation and work for the proper settlement of maritime differences. As I understand, the above five points are the main content of President Xi's important concept. During the long history of discovering, pioneering, and exploiting the ocean, many maritime theories were put forward by those Greek thinkers such as Mac Clausen, that was brought by the British scholar John Southern, Mac Libram, Hugo Grotus, Sea Power, that is Mahan, using the paper Madurin dividing the world ocean, common heritage of mankind, etc. Through contentions and one package deal, these theories finally led to the current legal regime of the sea, such as internal waters, territory sea, EEZ, continental shelf, high seas, zones of international seabed, and a various set of rules and regulations for maritime activities, such as fishing, navigation, and overflight, etc. 
Today, the world is undergoing profound and complicated changes, especially the sudden outbreak of the COVID-19, which has lasting consequences on world economy, social political process, and the international relations. We need to explore future scenario for maritime domain from the perspective of the community of a shared future. For this end, the maritime community of shared future has the following theoretical significance. The first, emphasize that the ocean itself is the shared future of mankind, which subjected the ocean as a community rather than an object uh, for endless and exclusively taking or a geographic tour for certain nation policies. Second, calling for a new way of thinking with featuring mutual consultation, common effort, and global sharing. Different from other theories, the maritime community of shared future provides a way of thinking and hope that way can help us surpass the current world ocean reality. That reality, as many may describe as equal interests and equal chance that is disguised by sea powers priority or sea powers taking all. Third, emphasize of conducting maritime activities and handling maritime issues on the basis of mutual respect. In a community of shared future, international players cannot aim only at their risk, rights, and interests while ignoring the others. Fourth, emphasize of peaceful solution of maritime disputes and building maritime orders through peaceful ways and means rather than resorting to use of force or threat use of force, or gathering up in small bands to carry on confrontations on the sea and the air. Recently, in a field of global climate change and environment protection, there are two events that were noted here. One is that the UN Security Council hold an open meeting on maritime security. At the meeting, Despite the other matters, the UN Secretary General Office emphasized that the international society <clears throat> must make all their efforts together to ensure the sustainable development of the ocean. Another is the IPCC, International Panel for Climate Change, released its latest climate change report the report points out that the global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees centigrade will be reached 10 years ahead of the formal predicted time, unless effective measures are taken to control curbing emissions. The rise of sea level will be a catastrophe for coastal population. Considering this scientific prediction and reviewing the strong commitments of China in building a maritime community of shared future. I could deeply feel that President Xi's maritime community of shared future conforms to the time theme of peaceful development, complies with the historical trend and sees the characteristic of the times. We would like to strengthen mutual assistance and cooperate wholeheartedly through joining efforts to safeguard maritime peace, to pursue maritime society security, to boost maritime prosperity, to protect marine environment, and to vitalize maritime culture, or to foster a shared maritime culture. The second part of my presentation the common interest of the international society can only be best served by an international order based on the UN Charter and international law. After the tragedy of two world wars, 
the International Society formulated the UN Charter in 1945 and established that organization. The Charter stipulates the purposes and the principles of the UN. These principles, together with the five principles of peaceful coexistence, raised at the Bangdong Conference held in Indonesia in 1955, and the Declaration on Fundamental Principles of International Law, passed by UN Assembly in 1970s, formed the basic principles and norms of contemporary international relations and the basic codes and of conduct for sovereign states in international society. These principles should also be implemented in the maritime domain and the maritime affairs. Nowadays, some countries say that we should maintain a rule-based international order from the perspective of international law. This concept is ambiguous. If these rules are made by one country, they cannot be called international. If made by a small group of countries, they cannot be called international too. But rules for self or for a small circle. Apparently, this kind of rules could not be acknowledged or accepted by most countries. Even if some countries may temporarily acknowledge or accept them, they will change their position in time as long as they are, they see through the essence of these rules. The Chinese government has always held the position that only an international order based on the UN Charter and international law can best serve the common interests of the international society. We accept and abide by such an order and call for all nations to maintain such an order. We will follow the following fundamental principles of international law in handling maritime affairs. First, some international disputes in peaceful ways. We persist in solving maritime disputes in peaceful ways and emphasize direct dialogues and negotiations and consultations with the parties involved. Second, promoting equality and mutual respect among nations. We also always believe that a negotiation and a dialogue on the basis of mutual respect excuse me, would Mr. be Ren. much better than Mr. on Mr. the Ren. position of friends. Mr. Ren, excuse me, I think your time is up. Uh, okay. You have another one minute, please. Okay. Third, is that we abide by international law with goodwill, force, and we will apprehend the existing international law in a manner of evolution. That, that's my second part. The third part is some of my suggestions for international maritime co cooperation. My suggestion contains two, the three parts, the three uh, items. So although the world is suffering from the severe pandemic, the steps of cooperation shall not halt, the fuse of cooperation shall not window, and the will of cooperation shall not recede. We believe nothing is too difficult if you put your heart into it. We will put forward practical mar international maritime cooperation in the existing and the coming aspects. Okay, and thank you, programs. Mr. Thank you. Yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Now we are hearing for the second panelist, so it's Admiral Rafnan Singh. Uh, this is with the now respect for the borders requires a collective response. The concept of early warning system dealing effectively with the crisis by military and access to vaccines by civilians need to be built fast and proper. The lack of transparency and increasing disinformation in COVID-19 response has led to massive deaths. And so, the part of the crisis requires science-based cooperation based on common rule. The outbreak also showed that international cooperation could deliver results 
building military and civilian cooperation in overcoming COVID-19, or perhaps CBR and challenge and obstacle in the new future are the issues. For that, we would give for our second panelist, Vice Admiral Rafnan Singh, also, sir, 20 minutes to deliver his presentation. The floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Respected Chair, distinguished speakers, and participants in Fourth International Maritime Security Symposium being conducted under the aegis of the Indonesian Navy. I am Vice Admiral Ravneet Singh, Deputy Chief Naval Staff from the Indian Navy. It is my honor and privilege to share with you the Indian Navy's perspective on the topic allotted to us by the symposium organizers. However, with the permission of the chair, I would like to take the liberty of making a minor change in the topic as shown. And the reason I do this is that to highlight the mitigation measures India and our armed forces took to overcome the challenges posed by the global pandemic, that is COVID-19. We will navigate the, navigate the topic through the waypoints as shown. It is important for me to provide you a background of the Indian armed forces, the history of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, both nationally and internationally, to stretch the stage to explain how we in conjunction with other departments of the government, address the challenges posed by COVID-19. The bottom line up front, yes, COVID-19 impacted India significantly. Our friends like you went out of the way to stand shoulder to shoulder with India and help us in our time of need. To you and your countries, we express our sincere gratitude. The challenges posed have been overcome to a large extent through coordination and a whole of government approach. Additional procedures and protocols have been put in place to address resurgence. And while we continue to help our citizens, we continually are helping our friends in their difficult times. So for some of us who may not be familiar with the history of the Indian Armed Forces in addressing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, a brief prime. I would like to inform this esteemed audience that the Indian Armed Forces have had a very rich history of stepping up and helping overcome challenges posed by calamities, natural and man-made, whenever the country and the broader Indo-Pacific region has needed them. One of the most devastating calamities to strike India and many Indian, Indian Ocean was a tsunami in December 2004. The Indian Armed Forces, including the Indian Navy, were immediately mobilized. The readiness of the forces can be gauged from the fact that within a span of few hours of the tsunami striking the Indian coastline, naval ships had sailed out with relief and rescue equipment to render assistance. In 2014, the then Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir was struck by heavy rains. That soon transformed into devastating floods. The state government and the entire civil administration were overwhelmed. The Indian Armed Forces were called in and moved in numbers as shown. People were evacuated and rescued. Basic needs provided and communications restored, along with infrastructure and basic services. This helped the civil administration to take up their responsibilities. During this calamity, social media was extensively used to help people. In 2016, the southern Indian state of Kerala saw a celebration go terribly wrong when firecrackers accidentally got ignited, leading to a major explosion and loss of life. The Indian Army, Navy and Air Force responded immediately. Six helicopters, two aircraft, three naval ships and Army medical teams were deployed to assist civil administration. And while the Indian Armed Forces have always responded to requirements within the country, they have acted with similar alacrity when India's maritime neighbors and friends needed a helping hand. Revisiting the Indian Ocean tsunami, whilst 
the Indian Armed Forces, including the Navy, moved to render assistance at home. The Indian Navy concurrently sailed out ships to work with our neighbors. India launched Operation Castor to join in HDR in Maldives, Operation Rainbow in Sri Lanka, and Operation Gambhir in Indonesia. India was also part of a core group formed to address challenges posed by the tsunami. The unrest and hostilities in Yemen came to head in 2015 when expatriates' life was at stake. The security situation was complex with many stakeholders. The Indian government, with the assistance of friends in the region, was one of the very few who were accorded approval to evacuate citizens from Yemen. The Indian Navy launched Operation Rahat, which in English means relief. A total of 4,640 Indian citizens in Yemen were evacuated along with 960 foreign nationals from 41 countries in coordination with the Indian Air Force and the Ministry of External Affairs. The Indian Navy and Indian Air Force have undertaken similar operations earlier to in 2006 from war torn Lebanon and 2011 from Libya in the grip of civil war. The Indian Navy has always maintained presence in the Indian Ocean region and beyond to protect India's interest as also facilitate cap capability building and capacity enhancement of our maritime partners and neighbors as a preferred security partner. The presence got a renewed fill up in 2017 with formalizing of mission-based deployment, wherein our units were deployed in areas of importance so that India's interests are protected while being able to render assistance to our partners at short notice when required. Therefore, when, when Cyclone Idai struck Mozambique in 2019, Indian naval ships mission deployed in the region were immediately diverted to join an HDR effort. The ships, along with embarked helicopter, assisted Mozambique authorities in search and rescue and setting up of medical camps to provide immediate relief. The Navy liaised with international agencies, helping Mozambique tide over the crisis and to ensure maximum help could be rendered seamlessly. As can be seen from what I have shared, the Indian Armed Forces have always displayed flexibility and ability to manage change with alacrity. They have robust operational logistics in place and have all, always ensured economy of effort through sharing of resources, cooperation, and synergy. These traits help the Indian military and civil administration in enhancing cooperation and evolving strategies and methodologies to overcome COVID-19. Before we look at the challenges posed by COVID-19, a brief on timeline of the lockdowns that were implemented around the world and India. This slide is important to understand how different countries reacted it is important because it provides an understanding of how the situation was handled by some of the more severely affected countries, India included in regards to lockdown. As is known, the were known in the world, first got to know about the cluster of viral pneumonia in Wuhan, China on 31st December 19. On 4 Jan 20, WHO tweeted about the same and indicated there were no deaths still reported. On 9 Jan 20, the Chinese authorities confirmed that the outbreak was caused by the novel coronavirus. Between 10 to 12 Jan, the WHO published guidance for countries. In India, the first confirmed case of the novel coronavirus was reported on 30 Jan 20. However, India, like many other countries, went into lockdown only by end March 20. The main focus of the lockdown was to ensure capacities could be ramped up as the situation was looking ominous. Eventually, India would have four phases of lockdown with varied restrictions and the unlock happened in six phases over six months. I must however share with you that there are conditional lockdowns in force in many parts of India, even as I speak at this very moment. A lot has been said about COVID-19 and India, and it is important to try and understand why it is so. Though as everyone presently here is acutely aware, Things may not really be what they are made out to be. Numbers have a major role to play during challenges. So how are numbers stacked up, stacked up in regards to India? India is the second most populous country in the world with a population of 1.38 billion people and a population density of approximately 
470 people per square kilometer. And to give a perspective on numbers, when we combine the population of the US, all countries in the EU, EU Russia, Turkey, Brazil, and Argentina, they add up to 1.39 billion. So India had and continues to have a certain challenges in respect to COVID. However, they are no different from anywhere else in the world. The challenges faced by the civil administration as also the Indian military were both at policy and macro level as also at the micro level in terms of daily sustenance, movement of people, home restrictions, once the lockdown was implemented, medical preparedness, and particularly for the Indian Armed Forces, preparedness, preservation, and posture. So having seen the challenges posed by COVID-19, let's now take a look at the mitigation measures put in place by the Indian military. While the Indian Armed Forces in tandem with the civil authorities across the country, put in various mitigating measures to elevate the challenges being faced due to COVID-19 in India and beyond. It is important to look at how things evolved. India has gone through two waves of COVID-19 till date. Starting in Jan and in the initial days of the COVID-19 first wave, everybody, everyone in India and in the, in the globe were trying to assess the situation adopt practices to limit its spread and adapt to the new norm. The Indian military was no different. Procedures and protocols had to be evolved whilst assessing, assisting fellow, fellow citizens and friends overseas. By the time the second wave struck, procedures and protocols were fully in place. So if wave one was about improvising, wave two was about mature response mechanisms. So what did the Indian Armed Forces do? The Indian Armed Forces identified lines of efforts as shown towards tackling the pandemic. These included outreach, empowering civil administration, innovation, logistic assistance, proactive posture. And let me now delve into each of them. India's digital transformation that started in the 90s has ensured the ubiquity of smartphones in the country. This was harnessed by the civil administration and the Indian Armed Forces to disseminate information of the evolving situation. Excuse me, sir. Yep. We have five minutes more for your presentation. Thank you. Yep. To illustrate this is a snapshot taken on August 10, 21 that provides updates to all Indian using the Telegram messaging application. Recently, an exhaustive report was published by the Armed Forces doctors. These have helped immensely in reaching out to serving service members, veterans, and Indian citizens to better understand COVID-19. As the COVID crisis deepened, the Indian Armed Forces stepped up their COVID relief operations. One of the Indian Naval Dockyard was tasked with national skill development on maintenance of PSA type oxygen plants in the country. The Ministry of nearly 83 master trainers across 30 cities were trained by the Dokya. Indian democracy ensures governors is available up to the grassroots level. However, there are shortfalls in delivery of services and work is in progress. Military doctors and nurses were deputed, hospitals were created, and technical know-how was shared to ensure continuous operation of critical care medical equipment. Assistance of Indian Navy was sought by the state government for audit and repair of oxygen supply systems of major government hospitals across the state, as well as repair and improving of certain oxygen generation plants. In addition, the yard teams have repaired and operationalized oxygen generating plants in the states, thus increasing the capacity of oxygen. Hospitals in different districts have been visited by the naval teams and the synergy between the state government officials and naval personnel has been very fruitful in enhancing reliability of oxygen distribution in hospitals across the state. Further, the armed forces have put their battlefield engineering to good use to undertake innovation and adapt it to ex existing infrastructure to fight COVID-19. The survival of any military is based on sound operational logistics. Logistics. <clears throat> the Indian Armed Forces have adequate assets to assure seamless inter-theater movement of personal and systems. 
The Indian Navy during the first wave launched Operation Sea Bridge to repatriate stranded Indian nationals from countries in the region and beyond. A snapshot of the logistic effort of the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force is shown. As can be seen, the Honorable Prime Minister interacting with the Chief of the Naval Staff to get updates on the assistance provided to the Indian Navy. Amongst all this, the Indian Armed Forces did not compromise on their operational readiness. India inhabits a challenging neighborhood. And while the world was combating COVID-19 pandemic, India was battling both the pandemics. Let us listen to what the Chief of the Naval Staff had to say on this subject. This uh, dual uh, challenge scenario continues as you speak. And the country collectively continues to battle the pandemic and tackle security challenges. So in these uh, testing times, the Indian Navy aims to stand steadfast as a combat ready, credible and cohesive force furthering our national and maritime interests. Whilst India and her military were tackling the COVID-19 in home, that did not stop us from rendering a helping hand to some of our maritime neighbors who were facing similar challenges. The Indian Navy launched Mission Sagar in keeping with the Prime Minister's call for security and growth for all in the region, or Sagar for short. The effort put in by iron ships has shown. As we speak, two of our ships are outbound with LMO and concentrators for our neighbors. The Indian Navy has been working with our friendly countries in every possible way all the time. The way our partners stood along with us bears testimony to the strong bond and the synergy between regional partners. Finally, the takeaways. As I mentioned at the beginning, COVID-19 impacted India significantly. The challenges were overcome through synergy, procedures and protocols have been put into place to address resurgence. The Indian military assessed the situation, adopted best practices to preserve force integrity and perseverance in addressing the pandemic and con concomitant security challenges, or as I would like to say, A2P2 in short. With this, I have come to the end of my presentation and would be glad to take on any questions or clarifications anyone may have. I would like to once again thank the organizing for providing me this opportunity to present the Indian Navy's perspective on tackling COVID-19. I, on behalf of the Indian Navy, take this opportunity to wish you and your families good health and happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Big applause to our second panelist. Now, Dr. Kony, please. Yes, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic calls for a multi-sectoral response to protect people and enhance resilience, uh, support economic re recovery, and restore supply chains. During the outbreak, the transportations needed to, compl to comply with a specific set of rules which, and process, which significantly reduced the cargo demand. In this context, let us discuss the next topic, uh, COVID-19 and the impact of shipping and port sectors for that, I believe His Excellency, Ambassador Ong Kang Yong will be able to share his vision. The 20 minutes floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. One greetings from RSIS in Singapore to all of you. A good day to all of you at the same time. Let me start by thanking Rear Admiral Tunggu Suropati, Commandant of the Indonesian Naval Command and Staff College, CISCOA, for inviting me to speak at the 4th International Maritime Security Symposium. COVID-19 has plunged us into a world of profound and likely persistent uncertainty. This is unprecedented. The pandemic has had major social and economic effects altering the way we live and our everyday experiences. This can range from the need to realign domestic, regional, and international priorities to how we view and work with our friends and partners. Social and mobility reception put in place by different governments to manage the public health situation and save lives have wide-ranging negative economic impacts. Economic recovery in ASEAN 
can only take place when community transmission is contained and lockdowns have been eased. However, as of early August this year, 2021, ASEAN region has vaccines sufficient for less than one-fifth of the ASEAN total population. Less than one-fifth. Low vaccination rate in the region meant that it would take longer for the respective borders to be reopened and for travel to resume. As we consider the changes we are confronted with, it is also important to remember that there are things that do not change. The Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean continue to host important sea lines, sea lanes that remain vital to the region and the global community. The Indo-Pacific is by nature a maritime region. The sea surrounding us has been strategic historically and will continue to shape the destiny of billions of people in the future. <clears throat> we in Singapore are constantly reminded that our country's success depends greatly on the free flow of trade through our ports. Maritime trade continues to be crucial for the development and wealth of Indonesia, Singapore, and countries in and beyond our region. Southeast Asia's underlying economic fundamentals remain strong. The economic prospects of Southeast Asia remain positive. The IMF has forecast that the region's overall GDP will grow by more than 5% year on year from 2022 to 2025. Southeast Asia remains one of the world's fastest growing consumer markets. Despite the rapid advancement in alternative modes of transport over the past few decades, maritime trade remains the backbone of international trade. With over 80% of international merchandise trade by volume being conducted via the seas, Home to some of the world's busier shipping lanes, more than 60% of the world's container traffic passes through our region today. In addition, nearly one-third of the total, grand, total global petroleum and crude oil transits these waters annually. These figures are expected to grow further as the global center of gravity shifts to the east. The ability to ensure our sea lanes and sea lines of communication remain open and secure is therefore critical to the region's continued prosperity and security. We must collectively preserve and protect our right to freedom of navigation as guaranteed by international law. The institutionalization and acceptance of a rules-based maritime order by all countries is a crucial part of this collective effort. However, COVID-19 has brought about a disruption which many of us did not foresee. But ports must remain open so that essential supply can get to where they are urgently needed. And this is also for our own survival. Port must operate 24 seven, as we say throughout the pandemic. To minimize the impact of COVID-19 on ports and shipping, we have seen the maritime industries introducing new ways of working and use technology to aid business continuity. In many cases, this has led to new business models, forced companies to go digital, and in most instances, earlier than they ever wanted but they need to innovate and find creative ways to survive. If COVID-19 taught us anything, it is that if organizations do not change and do not do it quickly, they would not survive. Some countries and companies immediately look at near shoring and diversification of manufacturing base for a more secure supply chain. 
Our ports now have in place contactless operations, new protocol for crew change, and various segregation measures. However, as we prepare for COVID-19 to be endemic, we need to find a sustainable, sustainable way forward. For the port and maritime sector, it is about balancing public health risks and port efficiencies. Let me say a few words more about Singapore's efforts. The issue of crew change emerged very quickly when COVID-19 pandemic started, as countries started closing borders and imposing travel restrictions Many seafarers were stranded at sea. The Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, MPA, recognizes that seafarers play an important role in keeping the global trade going. However, as with all other modes of travel, crew change would not be able to be carried out the same way it was done before COVID-19. Singapore worked closely with various stakeholders and relevant government agencies. They developed protocols and procedures which will allow crew change to be carried out in a controlled and regulated environment to minimize the risk to public health within Singapore as well as to the shipping community. This was done through the establishment of a crew change safe corridor and Singapore shared its experiences at the International Maritime Organization, IMO, with other maritime and port authorities. MPA has facilitated crew change in Singapore under special circumstances since March 2020. More than 160,000 seafarers, vast majority being foreigners, have completed, sea, have completed their crew change in Singapore. This is on top of existing urgent medical cases. Further, there is the Singapore Shipping Tripartite Alliance Resident Fund, in short, SG Star Fund. This is the first global ground up tripartite alliance initiative with international partners, including the International Transport Workers Federation, ITF, the International Maritime Employers Council, IMEC, and the International Chamber of Shipping. They work with stakeholders in seafaring nations on concrete solutions for safe crew changes, starting with the Philippines. Singapore did not stop there. The Singapore Shipping Association has taken the lead to look at creative, feasible solutions. For example, chartering dedicated air flights to facilitate direct ship to plane arrangements and Singapore also launched a handbook on crew change procedure in Singapore, which the industry could use as a reference. Sea crew is, after all, the backbone of the global supply chain. Without the crew, ship cannot operate, goods cannot flow. Singapore is committed to facilitate crew change. To do so, Singapore needs to continue to ready the support of global partners. Another priority is global supply chain connectivity. In this regard, Singapore worked with 174 UN member states for a joint statement on supply chain connectivity. This is to underscore the global community's resolve to keep global supply chain going. MPA also initiated the Port Authority's Roundtable. They issued a declaration where ports from across the globe in the Americas, Asia, Europe, Middle East, came on board to commit to keep their ports open and to minimize disruption to the global supply chain. Singapore is also working with the IMO and other international stakeholders on a global program to vaccinate seafarers. Since March this year, March 2021, MPA has vaccinated more than 80% frontline workers and foreign seafarers working in Singapore. This allow us to keep our port open and our people safe. During these times, we do see an acceleration of maritime digitalization and advancement in automation. 
Digitalization and automation will be part of the new normal so that business activity can go about in a more efficient and effective manner. Port terminals and operations are becoming increasingly automated. As a result, ships are increasingly dependent on network system, advanced communication, and navigational technologies to function. MPA in Singapore has launched a digital portal called Digital Port at SG. This one-stop portal is for port-related clearances. Digital Port at SG has been well received by the industry. Under phase one launch last year, the program has saved the industry about 100,000 100, man hours. Phase two, which was launched this year, 2021, is targeted to benefit more than 2,000 maritime companies and shorten port stay by up to a day or more. MPA will also work with like-minded stakeholders to link the digital port at SG portal to their respective platforms to create a seamless cross-border digital network where different systems can be linked up to interoperate. MPA call this digital ocean. To reduce the need for human interface in our port operation, while maintaining efficiency, MPA has carried out trials for shore to ship delivery. Another initiative is the conduct of telemedical consultation with seafarers so that we no longer need to only have physical consultation. Ladies and gentlemen, while digitalization is an opportunity which drives greater efficiency, we must be reminded that digitalization also exposes us to vulnerabilities pertaining to cyber threat. Hence, Singapore worked with 10 other port authorities in a thing called the PACNET, P-A-C-C-N-E-T, Port Authority Chief Information Officer Cyber Security Network. This is to enhance cyber security awareness in our maritime sector and facilitate early sharing or cyber attack information to counter cyber attack threats. Let me say a few words about crime at sea. Global economic conditions were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the current economic situation may push more into illegal activities that could threaten the safety and security of port and shipping operations. Take the Straits of Malacca and Singapore as an example. While most of the attacks at sea are petty thefts by unarmed perpetrators, unarmed perpetrators, if left unchecked, piracy and armed robbery at sea will fester and put our seafarers and sea lane at risk. Many agencies are responsible to safeguard this major shipping lane. The Republic of Singapore Navy, Police Coast Guard, and MPA maintain strong operational links. They do that with their regional, regional counterparts in Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on. Together, all these partners work with MPA and the agencies in Singapore to issue advisories and reminders regularly to shippers so that they can take proactive measures to prevent any sea robberies or pirate attacks. Singapore has received positive feedback on this public and private partnership. In Singapore, we also have the Information Fusion Center and the Recap Information Sharing Center. They play a critical role in counter piracy efforts in regional waters. They share accurate, timely, and reliable information of piracy incidents and other maritime threats. Maritime Enforcement Agency continue to work closely to collectively deal with this transnational nature of maritime threats. These cooperative measures include regular meetings to enhance coordination and review conduct of operation as well as intelligent exchange and real-time information sharing that in turn cue effective operational responses. Ambassador, you have another three minutes. Thank you. Let me conclude. The maritime industry is a dynamic sector and remains resilient despite the COVID-19 pandemic. One thing we learned 
from COVID-19 thus far is that multilateral cooperation is essential. Singapore's approach to building cooperative networks recognizes that maritime access and order are only achievable through collective means. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Back to you, moderator. Thank you so much, Ambassador. A big applause to Ambassador, yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we had heard clearly from all distinguished panelists the important aspect of maritime security to the pandemic issues, effect, and prevention. Let's thank you and give another big applause for this informative, interesting presentation from our panelists. So now we come to the question and answer sessions. There will be two sessions that will be finished at 11 a.m. sharp. And each session is for three, three questions. We are sure our distinguished panelists will be pleased to answer them. And for that, I would like to let uh, Marine Colonel Verijon uh, to assist this uh, Q&A answer. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Kony. So again, big applause to Dr. Kony as a moderator this morning. Now, uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Kony. And then we are going to the next steps, next session. Uh, we have a, a question and answer session. For the first session, I would like to invite uh, three questions from the all audience in this room. Please don't forget to mention your name, your rank, and which country. Uh, and I would like to give to on my right side first, in the middle, and the, my left side. Please. From the middle side, anybody? No? Uh, and the left side? Okay, maybe all the audience in this room is still preparing the question. Okay, uh, Dr. Kony, I can read uh, our uh, question from the chat box. From the Captain Askari, security and border cooperation, TN headquarters of Indonesia. Uh, delivered to Vice Admiral Raknan Singh, his question, in your presentation, you mentioned about if taken to assist neighboring countries, not only during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in the previous normal time. In which so the good relation, especially among militaries, As we have experienced together, the COVID-19 restricts many military cooperation due to the health concern. Sir, so in your opinion, what is the future of military cooperation post-COVID-19 and how do you envisage it to be done? This is the question from Captain Askari to Admiral Rafna Singh. Please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, this is one uh, question which I was expecting. And uh, during this pandemic, uh, we did uh, do our homework well. And uh, uh, what we had done is the main thing was uh, what the training part, what we conduct with the friendly foreign com countries. We resorted to we, uh, training through the video conferencing, classes on online, and even large uh, training material which, uh, which was uh, sent to the friendly foreign country so that the students could uh, continue with their classes. And as and when the pandemic lifted and as and when the, uh, we, the restrictions got lifted, the students could join back into the class and uh, continue with the instructions as planned. Oh, thank you, sir. Okay, next question. May I see the chat box text? The committee, please.
So is okay. there any other questions from the chat box? Okay. Okay, to Captain Xiang Fong Ren from China, from the First Admiral Rahmat Artoyo. The question is, uh, what are the strategic steps to build harmonized maritime cooperation between countries while the interests of each neighboring country often the conflict with each other? Second, what is the mutually beneficial model of cooperation between two or more countries in relation to disputes in maritime area? Captain, please. Thank you. To strengthen international cooperation for maritime security, peace, and uh, stability, uh, we think we can do practical or put forward practical international maritime cooperation in the following aspects. First, is to continue with programs that had already been planned or started before the pandemic. For example, the maritime information sharing, the program of navigation system, the program of the maritime silk route in the, uh, for, the first, uh, for the 21st century, the regional maritime ecological monitoring problem, a program, more maritime communication safety facilities program, and the regional maritime scientific research cooperation programs. The second is to further expand the fields of maritime cooperation. For example, the cooperation of public health, uh, sedation control, um, Navy med medicine cooperation. Third is that uh, to further uh, promote the willingness of maritime, uh, maritime cooperation in the region. Of course, uh, the, at present, the goodwill of cooperation in the region is disturbed or affected by various factors. For example, maritime disputes, sea power competition, different levels of development, different inter interpretations of international law, pessimistic outlook or hesitation on the future prospect of regional maritime order, uh, domestic policies, etc. Despite all of these disturbances, I'm confident that the neighboring maritime cooperation will not stop and we hold the pr uh, principle of consultation, common efforts, and sharing, and be friendly to our neighbors. Stick to the spirit of openness and inclusiveness. Persistent on um, practical cooperation in maritime domain, and join hands with other nations in seeking peace and welfare for the people. And to make up our region a uh, view ideal of the maritime community of shared future. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Big applause to our great panelists. Already have the answer. Again, I would like to share a question from this room, from yeah. my left side. Oh, okay. Okay, please. Thank you. Captain Navy Otelorcini, Italian Defense Attaché. First of all, uh, I would like to thank our distinguished uh, speaker. And I would raise a question to all of them. How we could uh, really increase and enhance the multilateral cooperation, uh, especially on the maritime uh, sector? Thank you. Thank you. Applause for our uh, 
Atashi from Italian. Please, we start from the captain, Chamfong uh, Rang first, and Admiral uh, Raf Samsin, and the last one to the Ambassador Ong Kiang Ran. Please. Yeah, Captain Ren Simfon, please. All right. Sorry, I didn't quite catch your question. Oh, the question from would the. Would you please, yeah, would you please repeat your question? Yeah. Uh, do you want to repeat again your question to the all three panelists, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I would raise the question to all the panelists. Is a medical concern how we could uh, really increase uh, and uh, enhance uh, the multilateral uh, cooperation, especially in the maritime uh, sector. Uh, just the handing you, man. Okay, thank you. You got the question. You got the question, Captain Simfonren. Maybe mm. uh, uh, finally quite a sector, a uh, sector, a fuse. That means fuse. Uh, uh, as a Navy officer, uh, I believe that we have we can cooperate in many fields of uh, in the maritime domain or maritime affairs. But as a Navy officer, I think. I think or the dialogue exchange or practical cooperations and good relations between navies are an indispensable, even key continent content in international maritime cooperation. I think we can have or carry out in the navy, between the navy or among the navy, many cooperations. For example, the exchange and the cooperation uh, of high-level uh, dialogues, the Navy medical service exchanges, and also the exchange of Navy academics. And also we can exchange experience for maritime health, a public health, event control, it is central. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Xianfeng Ren. Applause to our Captain Xianfeng Ren. Now please, uh, the question, the same question to the delivered to Vice Admiral Raf Nansin. Please, sir. Uh, th thank you very much. I think uh, in the maritime domain, there are plenty of aspects we can uh, cooperate together. And uh, basically we can learn and the best practices. We can share our concerns and uh, we build bridges of friendship and uh, by, I mean, with regular exchange of people, staff talks and participating in HADR exercises, anti-piracy uh, anti ops and the joint ops. So that we know, we we are uh, learn much more about each other, and uh, finally the realm which we are looking at is we are getting into a interoperability aspects. So once we are together, we learn from each other, and it will be easier for us to operate in all the domains of the maritime sector. Thank you. Thank you. Applause again to the Vice Admiral uh, Rafnan Singh. Now. We want to hear from the Ambassador Ong Kai Kiong. Please, sir. Well, thank you very much. From my experience working in ASEAN, I think it is important to have more interaction, more exchanges among the navies, among the port authorities, in order to develop more what I call trust, more comfort among all the individuals involved in the Navy and the port authorities. So, you know, I noticed in recent years, many of these exchanges are built around 
very formal kind of uh, exercises. Yeah, uh, I don't think we need to wait until a particular formal or very official table talk exercise or a uh, joint exercise uh, among the Navy or the Coast Guards or that to have uh, what I call interaction. We should try to bring back, you know, our ASEAN way. Yeah, most of us, we grew up, uh, we do karaoke, we do golf, we do sports to get to know each other. And along the way, we tell each other, uh, we are going to do something like this in a formal manner. Maybe, you know, you like to share your ideas. So my answer to you, sir, is basically, let's have more uh, visits to one another. Uh, don't have to be a very formal, officious kind of uh, exercise. And more importantly, we have many existing mechanisms. There are many that in the region, between one and another country, uh, or like ASEAN, we have a group of 10, our member states, 10 ASEAN countries. We have also cooperation, dialogue with India, with China and all that. So we should try to uh, socialize our individuals from the Navy, from the port authorities more regularly. Hopefully by doing so, uh, we know each other, we can pick up the phone and call each other and say, hello, hello, Captain from India or Captain from China. We want to discuss something quite urgent because something has turned up. Ah, this is a way, uh, we call it the old ASEAN way, which is to socialize and make friends and we know each other better and we trust each other. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a big applause to our three panelists. Now, again, we invite uh, the next question. Okay. Captain Salim. Thank you. I'm Captain Salim. My question for the Ambassador Ong. And the question is, what is the most impact from COVID-19 and harbor for Schiffer and the impact for the maritime security in the region? Thank you. Okay, and also to the, I read the chat box. Any? Okay, from Commander Iwan Hendro Susilo. To Mr. Ong Keng Kiong. Yeah, the same. According to your presentation for new IFC, it's currently very instrumental in providing actual data on maritime events to maritime users as well as with other countries. In your opinion, is the same thing needed to build for the field of natural disaster management, especially for countries in the region around Southeast Asia? Pavarijan, I think all our chief of naval staff want okay. to ask a question. Thank you. Admiral Yudho Margono, Chief of Indonesia Navy. Okay, I'm just Indonesia, Vice Indonesia. Please, Bu Koni, translate. Uh, saya tanya kepada uh, Vice Admiral Rafnet Singh. Ya, pertama saya ucapkan terima kasih pada beberapa waktu yang lalu telah memberikan uh, bantuan oksigen pada pemerintah Indonesia melalui uh, worship uh, kapal perangnya India yang ber sempat bersandar di uh, pelabuhan Jakarta. Ini Prestasi yang sangat membanggakan bagi kita semuanya di saat seperti ini pemerintahan dia memberi bantuan pada kita semuanya. Demikian juga negara-negara lain juga termasuk uh, Singapura yang juga telah banyak membantu kita. Yang ingin saya tanyakan tadi beberapa waktu yang lalu kita tahu semuanya bahwa di India sempat terjadi pandemi varian Delta yang sempat menghebohkan dunia. Bahkan pemerintah uh, India waktu itu sempat kewalahan menghadapi itu. Namun demikian, dalam waktu singkat, India dapat e, mengatasi pandemi COVID tersebut dan tingkat waktu itu kematian, tingkat kematian sangat tinggi. Namun dalam waktu singkat, mereka dapat mengatasi hingga saat ini. Nah, ini apa kiat-kiatnya pemerintah India sehingga bisa mengatasi pandemi COVID yang saat itu sedang e, booming, ya istilahnya booming. Dan saat ini mereka mampu mengatasi dan bahkan bisa memberikan bantuan kepada negara lain. Demikian, thank you. Thank you, Excellency. 
Uh, so the question from Admiral uh, Yudo Margono to uh, Vice Admiral Revnat Singh. First, he would like to thank you for your help when you come with your warship and dropping the oxygen for us. And second thing is uh, the question about the Delta variant. We know the Delta variant is hit all the world. I mean, India, of course, but uh, hit the world as well. So the question from Admiral Margono is actually... What is uh, the key factors of Indian government, especially Indian Navy, to really uh, uh, be, uh, hit this uh, uh, the uh, Delta variant very quick, and uh, and uh, re the result is uh, very excellent. So maybe you can share the experience, Admiral Singh. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, really, on honor honor you for your the kind words. And at the onset, I would also like to thank uh, more than 50 plus countries who helped us when we were going through a tough phase during the pandemic. So regarding your question, I, I would say that the best way where we can control things is uh, your first and foremost is your wearing your mask, social distancing and uh, hand wash. And we always say that we follow the OCTAD principle throughout the pandemic and as we speak uh, we still follow it today and uh, we have been very very particular and uh, to top it up the vaccination drives so we had the uh, vaccinations uh, for large number of population and uh, since we being in the navy we were uh, uh, next to the health workers we were the frontline workers we were given our vaccinations that is a covid shield and uh, covaxin and as for the data, what we have with us is that both the uh, vaccinations have been fairly effective. I mean, it's, I won't say that people didn't get COVID even after the vaccination. They got, the, they got COVID after the vaccination, but majority of them were asymptomatic. Majority of them, a large number of them were treated in their own residences on telephone. And in fact, the medical helpline which we had made was very, very helpful where people were given uh, the advice on telephone by the medical staff. And even some people who did show symptoms went to the hospitals, but at no stage was an opportunity. Uh, we had to take them onto the ventilators. So in all, I would say a very active uh, approach by the Indian government and uh, uh, imposition of uh, rules and regulations, social distancing, mask, uh, uh, PPE equipment, and the hand sanitizer in India never faced the shortages of uh, PPE or the hand sanitizers. We did face shortage of oxygen at one stage, but uh, thankfully for the industrial background we have, we managed to overcome them. A lot of our friendly countries, which I would say more than 50 countries, uh, uh, did come to our help and assisted us in overcoming this pandemic. So we, at the moment, are uh, just keeping our fingers crossed, and we are we are preparing well in case third way comes how we handle them because we we, we think that uh, we would be in a good position to handle the third wave and uh, we have to be alert and the only way is social gatherings mask hand wash these are the things which we have to make sure that the S and the SOP standard operating procedures and the protocols are in place that is the only way we can uh, uh, save ourselves from the third wave or whatever wave you, you can say. Thank you. Dr. Kani. <laughs> Thank you, and please give applause to Advana Singh. Uh, next. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kani. <laughs> okay, big applause to the uh, Admiral Rafnan Singh, clearly about uh, sharing uh, about the pandemic delta in uh, India. So we are going to the next uh, question to Mr. Ong Keng Kiong from the Commander Iwan Hendra Susilo. I would like to, if you again, according to your presentation, for now I, I see is currently very instrumental in providing actual data on maritime events to maritime user, as well as with the other countries, in your opinion, is the same thing needed to build for the field of natural disasters management, especially for countries in the region around Southeast Asia? Mr. Ong Kak Kyung, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
I believe that uh, information and data are very important for all our work, whether we are in the Navy or in the uh, shipping line or in the uh, port authorities. So we must try our best to continue sharing information, sharing data. When we are dealing with the ocean and the seas, yeah, you really don't have to have any uh, confidential or secret information which you can keep for yourself. Because uh, as you can imagine, the open sea, the open ocean, everybody uh, have been using uh, these uh, sea lines or sea lanes of communication. So information sharing, data sharing, is very essential. And what we must do is to find ways to organize how we share the information, how we disseminate all the useful uh, facts that uh, other people can benefit from it. The Information Fusion Center, IFC in Singapore, we believe have done a good job in distributing information, sharing all the uh, facts and data that we have and right now, uh, there are about 20 different countries which have sent what we call liaison officer to the IFC, Information Fusion Center, based in Singapore. Uh, Indonesia, uh, Indonesia has also sent a senior officer to uh, work in this uh, IFC with other uh, colleagues from around the different countries. So continue to do this, and we should try to find ways to encourage other countries, other regions, to also find a formal way, a systematic way, to have an information fusion center and to share more information and data. Uh, so this is something that uh, uh, is good for us, and I think uh, perhaps from this symposium, more discussion can be made with regard to what kind of ways we can share information and data and how can we do it quickly. Yeah. Uh, number two, I think it is important for us to bear in mind that uh, uh, you don't share information, you can get it from other sources. And these days with social media and other kind of digital platform, there will be a lot of uh, facts and information, and some of it might not be reliable. So we have to think about how do we share uh, reliable, consistently effective, efficient information across our formal Navy channels, our uh, official uh, port authorities. Yeah, This is quite important because if we do not think about this kind of uh, effort, yeah, more and more misinformation or more and more disinformation will come about and then it will eventually affect the efficiency of our Navy, our Coast Guards, our Port Authority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Applause to Mr. Ambassador. Any more questions from the chat box committee? No? Okay. Now let us, uh, Captain Salim, where? Mau tanya. Oke. Okay. Ya, yeah. my name is Siswanto Rusdi, uh, the chairman or director of the National Maritime Institute, an independent uh, think tank in Jakarta. I would like to address my question, especially to Ambassador Ong Keng Yong. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Singapore uh, already uh, conducted joint patrol long Malacca Strait, Singapore Strait, and so many achievements uh, have been uh, achieved. The question is, is it possible to increase the cooperation amongst the country uh, to legal aspect? Because this aspect is very lack. One country uh, says uh, pirate or, 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 or armed robbery proprietor, but the case is missing. So, how do you see uh, 
maritime cooperation, at least among these three countries, uh, uh, they, 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 they can uh, push uh, the cooperation into a legal uh, domain. Thank you. Thank you, our colleagues from the Indonesian. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Ambassador Ong Kek Kiong. It's a very good question. And I think that we should make a very strong effort to try to reach some common understanding on the legal system that we have. Uh, bear in mind that in the case of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, we basically have two uh, legal systems at work. Indonesia, as you uh, have uh, the civil law based on the European model. In the case of Malaysia and Singapore, we have the old British model. Yeah. And so one of the leading uh, area of work among the legal experts in Singapore is to try to find common understanding of the concepts in legal terms. And then we find ways to marry the different concepts or close the gap. So I suggest that we can do more together. And in our university, both in Jakarta and in Singapore, we have started to have uh, what we call legal academies, where experts come together and look at the difference in concepts, difference in interpretation. Yeah, It's a long process, but I think we should start seriously doing more about it. Uh, and it can be done. So the other important thing is how our private sector, our shipping industry, look at the legal challenges. Yeah, I think we should consult them more because they are ship owners, they are ship operators, and they have many employees and many crew under their charge. Yeah, they are responsible for all these people. And when they have a problem, uh, they find a solution to the different legal interpretation or the different legal uh, uh, in, uh, concepts. So I suggest the academic side can do more cooperation with the private sector. Uh, maybe you know, in the academic exchange now that we are having uh, on both sides, we should also bring in more of the private uh, business people, the shipping companies, so that they can be more involved in finding a common uh, understanding on some of the legal issues. The last point I want to make is that IMO, International Maritime Organization, they actually have systematically studied all these different legal concepts, different legal systems around the world. And they have constantly put out new <coughs> guidelines, new uh, rules for us to consider. I think we can actually look at some of these IMO guidelines and then we sit down Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia and then we say, okay, IMO say this is the way to go. How about it? Yeah. So the point that I had made earlier in my uh, presentation is that maritime sector is a very important sector. There are so many different uh, views about how certain things are uh, interpreted or how certain things should be resolved. The more we sit together, legal experts, uh, maritime experts and all that, the better it is. And we have really one very good uh, source, uh, IMO. So we try to integrate our respective countries' uh, interpretation with what is there in the IMO uh, guidelines. And perhaps in this way, we can slowly but surely find some common approach to some of these differences. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Applause to our... Pak Verijan, yes. I think we only have ten, uh, nine minutes more, and I still see a lot of questions here. Can, can we just read all the questions? Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's from the first Admiral Joko Edi to Captain Ren, China. You mentioned that the only international law is legal if approved by the UN. The question is, what is the sequences if the, the country refuses? or violate or ignore the UN <laughs> regulations. That's from the Admiral Joko Edi. Next one. Committee. I saw a lot of questions. Okay. 
from the from Captain Goody, PhD. The importance of the maritime area, the, the importance of the maritime area, has created tensions in international relations. This requires the comprehensive resolution steps from all levels. Meanwhile, the new that appears in the media is still conflict at the lower level. To all speakers, how to handle these situations? Any other questions? From uh, Commodore Wahid Ismanto, is it possible if the regional country implemented a unified, standardized process the regional level in port sector, its mean to supporting the establishment of regional cooperations and coordination mechanism for joint responses to the COVID-19 outbreak. Done. Okay, Good. that's all. So I think in these eight minutes, all three panelists uh, will be able to answer this uh, question, including the questions from uh, 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 Captain Salim. Thank you. Okay, we are heading to the last uh, session. Again, we have a, a big applause to our great panelists. Captain Chen Fong Ren from China, Ambassador Ong Keng Kiong from Singapore, and Admiral Rafnan Singh. But I think, I think they have another, uh, they have still five minutes to answer that one, the questions. Oh, the time is limited. Time is up. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. So uh, finally, we finish the question and answer sessions. But before we close, I would like to invite our distinguished panelists to deliver one minute's uh, wrap up, each of you. And I think it started from the first panelist to the third one. The floor is yours. Thank you. Mr. Ren? Mr. Ren? You have one you minute. Moderate. One minute? <laughs> yes. Many years ago, I remember that when I was attending Western Sim uh, Naval Symposium, the Chief of Navy of uh, Thailand gives uh, three words, three terms that make me very, give me many aspirations. That is good seamanship, partnership, and friendship. The Navy needs that three ship. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's a very interesting point. Admiral Sings. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, finally, what I would like to say is that uh, we, we continue building bridges of friendship. And like what we have seen uh, during this pandemic, that uh, all the friendly countries get together. We together can uh, take on anything, any challenges which come our way. So it is essential that we keep our channels of communication open, talk to each other, and as friends, take on the challenges together. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. <laughs> so the last one, Excellency Ambassador. Yes, thank you very much. I think as the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us, we have to work together. Yeah, it is not one country by itself. We have to work with every other country, yeah, because the virus don't respect borders. And I think this is a good instruction for us. We should not allow our national border to divide us. All the questions just now you have highlighted indicate that many of our listeners and participants feel that there are differences in our legal system, our different interpretation of the rules, and so on and so forth. But I think what we need to do is to really uh, continue to maintain multilateral cooperation, have multilateral interaction, and constantly exchange information and look for new ideas. Uh, COVID-19 has actually made us do that. So let us concretize some of these actions that we have taken to tackle the virus, but use it now for the longer term cooperation among all the navies and port authorities of our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Big applause to all these panelists. Okay, there are some points to conclude from our first session this morning. Uh, first is ocean governed mechanisms under UN assistance is a very important aspect. The ocean is future of mankind and new ways of thinking of maritime future is very important. And the emphasis of maritime uh, solutions uh, is another point that we really have to consider. Regarding cooperation and strategy, the world has the tools, but we must take control of our destiny and working together. A disease with no respect for borders and requires a collective response. So we all should make it possible to shape one of the golden ages of mankind. Maritime strategy is designed for state survival and to protect their nation interests. Open and secure sealant of communications for prosperity and security, also for freedom of navigation, 
is a very uh, crucial issue, including the establishment of state, uh, safe uh, corridor. Nevertheless, there is no one, sits, no one size fits all. And uh, this concept, especially on the Fuka era. The region especially needs a massive circle of peace before everything becomes bad to worse and the Asia Pacific society should be alert. Learning from this global pandemic, alternative approaches, such as the need to be reformed multilateral systems, including the ASEAN, I like to underline the ASEAN, and United Nations perhaps should be considered. This global outbreak has imposed pressing challenges for both the import and export trade to most of the ports around the world. Some countries decided to proceed with the closure of certain ports. Additionally, several disputes arose between charters and owners concerning vessels, higher period, late time, and the loss of money and time. <clears throat> so continued and efficient shipping and port operations are crucial for short-term policy response to this pandemic and for speedy and sustainable recovery. For most countries in Asia Pacific, shipping represents a doorway to global economic. So in many cases, shipping is a lifeline, linking local communities to the regional and global markets, and sustaining social and economic development. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of part of our grid session this morning. We would like to say thank you again to our panelists for the informative and interesting talk and to the audience from active participation. Hopefully, the presentation will be beneficial for everybody. That's all our for the forum on the first session. Thank you. Thank you very much. A warm applause to our distinguished speakers, the moderator and the co-moderator for kicking off our day with a very impressive session. Distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude our session today, the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudo Margono, would present tokens of appreciation and certificate to our speakers, moderator and co-moderator. First, we will witness the presentation of mementos online by the Defense Attaché of the Republic of Indonesia in Singapore, Colonel Benny Arfan from the Indonesian Air Force, to the speaker in RSIS Singapore, His Excellency, Ambassador Ong Kang Yong. The Defense Attaché of the Republic of Indonesia in Singapore is presenting a token of appreciation to Ambassador Ong Kang Yong. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you, Your Excellency. Next, our speakers who are not present will be represented by the defense attaché of their respective countries. I would like to invite the defense attaché of India to take your place on the floor. I would also like to invite the moderator and co-moderator to step down on the floor. I respectfully request the Honorable Chief of the Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudo Margono, to please present the mementos and certificates as a token of appreciation. Please, Admiral.
Ladies and gentlemen, another round of warm applause to the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, to the speakers and to the moderators. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our first session. We would like to invite you to enjoy a 15 minutes break. Refreshments are now being served at the Pandopo next to this auditorium. Please come back to this room to start our next session at 11.25. Thank you very much and a good morning to all of you. Thank you.
hidden paradise. God smiled upon creating this land, a beautiful place that will change your life. Start your journey in the land of countless charms and let your journey be immortalized. Hidden paradise. God smiled upon creating this land, a beautiful place that will change your life. Start your journey in the land of countless charms and let your journey be immortalized the beauty of the mountain sides breezing through the fresh air that suits your mind and soul diversity enveloped in unity religious teachings blended in harmony with rich traditional customs. Picture as view from Buntu Burake, the statue of Jesus Christ on a mountain top surrounded by soft clouds. Awaken your spirit and adrenaline. Enjoy the warmth of morning sun shining between the Olon Hills split by river stream. Welcoming the sunrise, with a cup of coffee in hand, sets you into a singular sense of peace. Walking down the aisles of traditional markets with its burst of colors, witness the locals going about their unique daily habits and maintaining the age-old traditions through the abundance of natural resources that can only be found in Toraja. The unforgettable culinary experience. Adorned with the chilly breeze in Pango Pango Pine Forest. Together with nature while sipping a cup of coffee with traditional snack, the patori. The rhythm and movements of traditional dancers tell a story of the Razan people that are rich in history and culture. The harmonious beat of the drums echoes through the cliffs and around the mountain sides. the beauty 
Valley of Toraja, where its many waterfalls scattered all over the region. tourist destinations. A journey that will paint beautiful colors into your life. gentle streams that are genially inspiring, handy in crafts, beaches that energize, lakes that provide livelihoods, is a land that has embraced Christianity. Posted important events with its innate hospitality. Exotic culinary delights. among divers, cherished by the locals. This is the life that blends the old and the new, that does not forget natural wonders, adventure of its own. Easily accessible. Still fascinating. Life in North Sulawesi.
This time, I get a chance to explore Sauti Sulawesi, one of the corners of the world in the central region of Indonesia. With its exotic and mysterious beauty, located in the southeastern part of Sulawesi Island with the capital of Kandari. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we like to invite you to come to IMSS building. The second session of International Maritime Security System 2021 is about to commence. Thank you. Like a step, my journey will also start stories and memories that will surely be one side of the heart, which will also be lessened. Life lessons about the world. It can't be denied. Saudi Sulawesi is a very beautiful and amazing place. One of the places that can be called to heaven on earth or the world paradise. Because you will never be satisfied admiring God's creation and be grateful for it. Everything you saw was truly extraordinary. skills and full of mystery, with a pair of bright shining eyes that hold a million stories. Its local wisdoms and all many hidden games, they will all greet you in this land. Once again, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we like to remind you the next agenda is about to commence. You are kindly requested to come to IMSS building. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, begin. Yeah, I will start it. Yeah. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we like to invite you to come to IMSS building, the second session of International Maritime Security Symposium 2021 is about to commence.
The honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, the second session of the International Maritime Security Symposium 2021 is about to commence. You are kindly requested to take a seat. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we like to remind you the next agenda is about to commence. You are kindly requested to take a seat. Thank you. The Honorable Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, the second session of the International Maritime Security Symposium 2021 is about to commence. You are kindly requested to take a seat. Thank you.
honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Astra. I will be the MC of this second session. The theme for this session is Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief, HADR. There will be three presentations for the second session, presented by Captain Kerry Harris, Royal Navy, USA, Rear Admiral Omachi, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, and Mr. Bebep Nugraha Junjunan, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic Indonesia. Presentation by three speakers would be guided by Moderator First Admiral Yudianto, the Head of Lecturer Coordinator of Indonesian Naval Command and Staff College, and Co-Moderator, Captain Zelvia Purnama Rika, Head of the Department of Education and Training Indonesian Naval Dental Institute. The Honorable Participation, ladies and gentlemen, before we start the presentation and discussion, allow me please to read the CV of our moderator. First, Admiral Yudianto is current, currently serving with Indonesian Navy as staff in the Naval Command and Staff College, where he is the lecture coordinator head. He is graduated of the Indonesian Naval Academy, 1990. He has a degree in Marine Science, the Ponogoro University, 1996. A Master's in Marine and Coastal Management, IPB Bogor, 2001 and a Master in Defense Studies from King's College, London, 2009. He is a graduate of the Indonesian Naval Command and Staff Course, 2006, the UK Advanced Command and Staff Course, 2008, and the TNI Command and Staff Course, 2013. His operational career has been mostly in Eastern Fleet Command as a Surface Warfare Officer. He has commanded the Parchim KRI Chiptadi and the Frigate KRI Kihajar Dewantara. He participated in some maritime security operation and regional international naval joint exercise as well. He participated in UN Mission Congo, Monuk, as military observer 2003. Humanitarian and disaster relief operations, he has commanded the naval base Banten and the main naval base 13 Tarakan. He is also assigned to Canberra, Australia, working with the Australian Defence College as directing staff at the Centre of Defence and Security Studies 2015-2017. He is also assigned as the head of the Centre for Maritime Studies, SESCOAL. The Honourable Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, let's start the second session of the symposium. We would like to invite distinguished First Admiral Yudianto and Captain Zelvia Purnamarika to come to the stage. Sir, ma'am, the time is yours. The Honorable the Chief of the Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudha Margono, the Admiral Group's Chief of Navy and all representing the Chief of the Navy from many countries, honored guests and ladies and gentlemen. A very good good morning and uh, welcome to again to our fourth International Maritime Security Symposium, Session 2. Um, I'm a first Admiral Giudianto and a Captain Sylvie. We will serve as the moderator and uh, co-moderator in this session. Let me take the opportunity to welcome all of you to the second session of this symposium. In this session, we will deal with some important issues based on the experience, the lesson learned of the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in Asia Pacific region from several countries. As we understand well that the Asia Pacific is the most disaster prone region in the world and the fact that the maritime capacity of the most littoral states are not strong enough to individually address this challenge and necessitates that we need to collaborate 
solution for disaster relief among nations. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenge of natural disaster between 2008 until 2018, at least 265 people were displaced due to disaster. As many of you know, there are a wide variety of disasters such as a flood caused by typhoon and heavy rains, wildfires, earthquakes, and its rising tsunami, ship collision, oil spin, etc. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in this session, we will have three speakers from US, Japan, and Indonesia who will uh, share with us uh, their experiences, lessons learned, and some other issues. The first presentation is going to talk about a commitment in past decade from US Navy participations in the Indo-Pacific region, who will be delivered by Captain uh, Kerr Harris. Captain Kerr Harris is uh, currently serving with the US Navy as a service warfare officer in the Pacific Fleet HQ, current operations division, where he is the humanitarian aid and disaster relief brand's head. He has uh, commanded the frigate HMS Campbelltown and as the commander of HMS Illustrious, he participated in relief operation in the Philippines. From the second presentation, we will hear from Japan perspective entitled Japan Navy's commitment in responding to natural and man-made disasters on the last decade that will be delivered by Rear Admiral Omachi Katsushi. Admiral Omachi is currently serving with Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force as Director General Operations and Plans Department's Maritime Staff Office, and has been involved in various HADR activities. And from our last presenter, we will hear from Indonesia ideas about disasters diplomacy as an alternative approach for Indonesia's instrument of foreign policy in Asia will be conveyed by Mr. Bebep Abdul Kurnia Nugraha Junjunan. Mr. Bebep is currently Director for Legal Affairs and Territorial Treaties, Directorate General of Legal and International Treaties, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is also Ambassador Designated to the Hellenic Republic. He is member of International Expert Group to the Secretary General of International Seabed Authority. Those all our curriculum fitness for our from our speakers moderator. Well, honor guests and ladies and gentlemen, let's we kick off the first presentation. Captain Harris, please your time. Admiral you know, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to participate in the illustrious IMSS proceedings. Sadly, the Indo-Pacific is the world's region most prone to natural disasters. In the past 50 years, over 2 million people in the region have lost their lives as a direct consequence. It is also fast becoming the world's principal region at a geopolitical, demographic and economic growth level. So it should come as no surprise that the United States Navy is heavily committed to safeguarding Indo-Pacific security and prosperity in compliance with the international rules-based system. By its very presence in the Pacific, equipped with the full panoply of ships, aircraft, and personnel, the United States Navy has also been able to bring humanitarian aid and disaster relief in recent history to many of our partners in the region. I would like to now provide an overview of the humanitarian aid operations undertaken by the US Navy in the Indo-Pacific in the past decade to help inform our panel discussion. I should begin with a look at the United States Navy's force presence in the Pacific and then its relationship with other departments of government and the conditions that dictate whether or not the Navy will be used in response to a given disaster. I should then look more closely at the significant humanitarian operations undertaken by Pacific Fleet since 2011, before closing with a brief synopsis of the Pacific Partnership Annual Mission, an enterprise that I believe has helped contribute to and will continue to support the increasing resilience of our partner nations in their response to natural disasters. 
Here you can see the US force lay down in the region, notably with the two fleets under the command of Admiral Paparo, Commander of Pacific Fleet. They are the US Third Fleet, which has its principal base in California, and the US Seventh Fleet in Japan. Other significant bases include Hawaii, Guam, Singapore, Korea, and, San, and Diego Garcia, creating a well-established and resourced force laydown throughout the Indo-Pacific region. This infrastructure enables American forces to deploy, deploy widely in the region. So at any given time, forward deployed units could be among the first responders to provide humanitarian aid in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. There are a number of conditions, however, which determine whether the US Navy is called upon to respond. Since 2011, the Navy has assisted with 10 significant missions. But it is important to note that this historically represents only 10% of all responses by the US government. This is because USAID is the lead agency on behalf of the US State Department. And routinely, civilian agencies and NGOs spearhead the US response. The US Department of Defense, DOD, is only called upon to assist by USAID when the unique and special capabilities of DOD are needed. The literal impact of tsunamis and cyclones in the Indo-Pacific, however, often favors use of the US Navy over her sister services, as well as deployable in response to a disaster. And it is often the rapid availability of specialist airlift and medical services, as well as deployable manpower that determines using the Navy. The other criteria which are equally applicable to USID's involvement are that the US will only respond at the request of the government of the country affected. And secondly, it's then only when the response is beyond the indigenous capacity to respond. And finally, the response must inevitably be in the US government's interest. The bottom line is that DOD and therefore the US Navy's Pacific Fleet does not lead a US humanitarian response. USAID does and is often working subordinate to UNOCHA, which principally coordinates the international response. Looking at um, Pacific region disaster trends, the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami in December 2004 was the most shocking and devastating natural disaster in living memory. It provoked an unprecedented international response with 35 countries contributing more than 30,000 personnel to assist in relief efforts. Of these, 16,000 military personnel were from the United States. It also demanded a higher level of coordination of this multinational force than witnessed previously. And many lessons had to be learned quickly against the pressure of a rising death toll and widespread destruction. The Indonesia tsunami refocused thinking in the American military on how best to prepare for and respond to a large scale disaster in the region and ultimately led to the genesis of Pacific Partnership, a PAC fleet initiative that endures today. Sadly, there have been many intervening disasters that continue to challenge the region, and evidence suggests that the current trend in global climate change is destined to exacerbate their frequency and their impact. On the 9th of March 2011, an earthquake 80 miles off the coast of northeast Japan triggered a devastating tsunami. According to UNOCHA, this was the fourth largest earthquake worldwide since the year 1900, and it inflicted 228 billion US dollars of economic damage. The 30 meter tsunami inundated some 433,000 square kilometers of land, killing nearly 16,000 people, and with some 2,500 also declared missing. 17,000 homes and buildings were destroyed and another 138,000 were badly damaged. The disaster forced the evacuation of some 492,000 people, but it was damaged to three reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant that precipitated an unprecedented triple disaster and it deeply complicated the emergency response. It forced the evacuation of a further 700,000 people living within the 20 kilometer exclusion zone created by the government of Japan. Now the Japanese self-defense force responded very quickly, ultimately deploying over 106,000 personnel, 200 helicopters and 322 fixed wing aircraft and 60 ships. 
The bulk of the foreign military response, however, was provided by the US military. As part of US operation Tamadachi, meaning friend, locally based US forces were de deployed quickly at the outset. There were some 40,000 based in Japan at the time, and many were on scene in affected areas, affected areas within 24 hours of the earthquake. The US Navy aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan was redirected to the quake zone of her carrier stripe route to work very closely with the JSDF. Japanese helicopters used American carriers for the first time, and the US Ronald Reagan provided a platform for air operations as well as a refueling platform for Coast Guard and Japanese self-defense force aircraft. Other US warships transported JSTF vehicles and personnel to stricken areas. And years of training regularly together, including many humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, and many interoperable military assets greatly assisted the combined response efforts. By the 16th of March, the US 7th Fleet was operating 19 ships, 140 aircraft, and more than 18,000 personnel in support of the disaster response. They established a maritime response cell to coordinate component priorities on a daily basis for the Japanese security forces and the USAID. And the third Marine Expeditionary Force assisted in deliver delivering supplies and clearing access routes, as well as providing radiological surveillance and decontamination at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility. Later that same year, USS Mustin responded to Thailand's worst flooding in 50 years. In the wake of Tropical Storm Nok 10, more than two thirds of the country was inundated, including the Bangkok metropolitan area affecting 13 million people. Total economic losses reached $46.5 billion, with manufacturing industry worst hit. The two helicopters from USS Mustin flew 69 survey missions with the Thai military, while the ship's crew members aided local communities and donated blood and relief supplies. The next three years, however, were marked by aid to the Philippines in the aftermath of severe typhoons. The first, in December 2012, Typhoon Boffer, it was the third Marine Expeditionary Force again that responded first. And when the Typhoon Boffer made landfall in the Philippines three times on the 4th of December 2012, they were in the islands when the typhoon hit and were mobilized to provide planning, coordination, personnel, water purification teams, and aircraft. Then the big one, November 2013. Nearly a year later, on the 8th of November, Super Typhoon Yolanda made landfall in the Philippines. 14 million people were affected across nine regions, including 4 million who were displaced, according, and according to UNOTA, it was the deadliest natural disaster in 2013, claiming over 6,000 lives and nearly 30,000 injured. Around 1.1 million houses were just damaged or destroyed. And the typhoon hit at a time when the Philippines was recovering from civil conflict in Mindanao and a 7.2 magnitude earthquake in Bohol, which lay along the path of Yolanda. Responding immediately to the Philippine government's request for assistance on 9th of November, the Marine Corps Pacific Forces were directed to lead military relief operations in the Philippines with the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade, acting as a tactical mission commander on the ground. The aircraft carrier, George Washington, was then deployed with elements of the Carrier Strike Group 5. The US military mostly focused on large-scale operations, employing their unique capabilities in transport and logistics, and also formed the Joint Task Force 505 to coordinate multinational military relief efforts. We deployed 13,400 personnel, 12 Navy ships, and 66 aircraft, delivering in total 2,495 tons of relief and evacuating 21,000 people, as well as helping ferry some 1,200 relief workers into Tacloban. More than 1,300 flights were conducted to 450 sites. The military response continued until 26th of November, and the JTF 505 was disbanded on the 1st of December. One of the contributory factors in the speed US forces could respond was the Mature Visiting Forces Agreement, or VFA, that was enforced with the AFP. Other countries had to respond more slowly simply because this framework was not already in place and needed to be agreed during the crisis when authorities were already working at capacity with their own response to the disaster. It pays to have a solid VFA in force.
Moreover, coordination between participating US agencies, USAID, the Office for Foreign Assistance, Disaster Assistance, DOD, US PACOM, and the US Embassy had become slicker and more efficient due to a clear understanding of each entity's roles and responsibilities that had developed across preceding responses. The result was having US forces unique capabilities appropriately scaled throughout the response phase. Of course, not all responses need to match the scale demanded by Typhoon Haiyan. When flight MH370, a Boeing 777-200 aircraft went missing between Kuala Lumpur and Beijing with 227 passengers on board on the 8th of March, 2014, it triggered a two month search and rescue operation by the international community. US Navy forces were employed throughout, often using some of the most sensitive underwater sensors in a peacetime role. They included two destroyers, USS Kidd and USS Pickney, their Seahawk helicopters, a P-3 Orion aircraft from Okinawa, a P-8 Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft, and a US towed Pinga locator and Bluefin 21 deep water vehicle. The latter two were embarked in the Australian defense vessel Ocean Shield, while the fleet support ship, US Navy ship Cesar Chavez provided tanker support to four Australian warships in the southern search areas. When Typhoon Hagabit looked set to follow the same trajectory as Yolanda did a little over a year previously, Philippine authorities and the international humanitarian community were on high alert. They conducted an efficient evacuation of 1.4 million people during the typhoon in one of the largest peacetime evacuations in the country's history. The US Navy helped track the typhoon before it made landfall, informing preparations on the islands, and USAD and OFDA assessment teams in Manila assisted too. US Ambassador Goldberg then reflected that the bilateral cooperation between the two allies clearly showed that the repeated humanitarian and disaster assistance training and exercises between our two countries are an important part of our relationship. The Bangladeshis and Rohingya migration crisis peaked in early 2015 with some 25,000 migrants departing the Bangladeshi-Myanmar border in the Bay of Bengal by sea. Many were reportedly adrift at sea for months in need of water, food, and other basic supplies. In response to this crisis, the US deployed military to assist in surveillance efforts in close collaboration with Malaysia and Thailand. The US Navy conducted daily maritime surveillance flights out of Sabang, Malaysia, to locate boats at sea carrying migrants. This information was then shared with regional partners and it offered a sharing of the sea routes used by smugglers and also helped to locate migrant boats at sea. Although no disaster declaration was made following Kaikoura earthquake on New Zealand's South Island on the 14th of November 2016, the US Navy was able to divert nearby USS Sampson with two Seahawk helicopters embarked to assist the New Zealand Defence Force joining a P-3 Orion maritime patrol aircraft that was already on scene. The earthquake coincided with the New Zealand Maritime Review, so participating warships from Australia, Canada, and Japan were also able to assist local communities. On the 27th of May, 2017, the US ambassador in Sri Lanka declared a disaster following heavy monsoon flooding and landslides. USS Lake Erie was deployed, arriving on scene on the 11th of June to assist with disaster relief operations. More than 400 US sailors from the ship participated in the mission, spending a week ashore, working alongside local government agencies and the Sri Lanka Red Cross to assist communities with cleanup, food distribution, and well repairs. Just a few months earlier in March, US Navy doctors and civil engineers aboard US Navy ship Fall River visited Hamban Dota in Sri Lanka under Pacific Partnership for a two week humanitarian and disaster relief preparedness mission. This served to establish key relationships with the Sri Lankan Navy and civil service agencies in the country. And these relationships significantly helped US military personnel to integrate efficiently into the disaster response mission. That concludes my account of recent significant humanitarian missions by the US Navy in the region. Since Sri Lanka floods, PAC fleet has been poised to respond to the fairly steady drumbeat of natural phenomena in the region that could result into a, in a disaster declaration. 
We have come close a few times, but the recent COVID pandemic has also driven some countries to confront events without recourse to external aid. Fiji is a prime example. In its recent response to typhoons Dennis and Yasa, where contactless delivery of aid by Australia and New Zealand was put into practice and where, much like the Philippines in 2014, advanced warning and preparations have diminished greatly the impact of the typhoons. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, PacFleet's annual Pacific Partnership mission has contributed in some way to regional resilience in the Indo-Pacific region. We have recently completed training in the Philippines and Palau under Pacific Partnership 2021 and have begun the planning process for next year's mission. Activity has biked to this year and last because of COVID and we have needed to trend towards virtual training. I strongly hope that changes for next year. Although it did not prevent us from deploying US Navy ship City of Bismarck this year as a focal point for Pacific Partnership 2021. We are now entering the initial planning phases for Pacific Partnership 2022. And consistent with the mission philosophy since its inception, PAC Fleet will plan around the specific requests and needs of our mission partners, according very much to the needs identified by their governments. No nation has a monopoly on humanitarian response, and it is humbling to learn from our partners their developed best practice and to engage with the UN organization and specialist non-government organizations in the region. It is this open approach embraced by the US Navy that has attracted the participation of other navies over recent years. Countries such as Japan, Australia, Republic of Korea, United Kingdom, and New Zealand have all contributed to the humanitarian, humanitarian aid, disaster relief, medical and engineering lines of expertise around which Pacific Partnership seeks to enhance regional resilience against natural disasters. I cannot foresee its value diminishing given the scale and freak of disasters in our region. And I very much look forward to working with many of the partners represented here today over the months to come to develop a focused and inclusive mission for 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine Harris. Give applause to Catherine Harris, please. So, uh, Captain Harris already uh, gave some presentation about uh, U.S. Uh, response and the commitment uh, to the uh, Asia Pacific region. As I mentioned here, a lot of things that I uh, we can uh, uh, learn from uh, U.S. First is about how to deploy the massive uh, asset, and and the other thing is uh, how to uh, conduct the training, and uh, some of. Uh, some of the uh, document also need to be uh, did, like a, uh, the visiting, visiting force agreement. As in some country, this uh, framework was not uh, already. The key relationships, like uh, uh, how to have a good relationship between, between countries, will make uh, integrated efficiently. And then uh, the US uh, have already the initial planning uh, phase uh, for the, the 2022. So I think it's a very good uh, presentation, and uh, we will uh, learn much from uh, this. So next uh, presentation uh, from uh, Japan, please. Um, good morning, and uh, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm uh, Riyad Naomachi, Director General of Operations of France Department, Maritime, uh, Maritime Staff Ops of the Japan Maritime Seven. Defense Force, uh, JMSDF. So first of all, I'd like to uh, express my respect for the leadership of the Indonesian Navy in hosting uh, the symposium uh, during this uh, difficult time. So I'd like to talk about our uh, overview of several disaster response achievements and our lessons learned as the title, JMSD's commitment in responding to natural and mandate disaster in the past decade. Okay, first let me give you an overview of the natural disaster in the Indo-Pacific regions. Uh, I'll show you the two pie charts. 
According to the 2019 disaster report by the UN Economy and the Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, the number of people who have uh, lost their lives in the natural disaster in the Asia Pacific region since 1970 account for about 59% in the whole world. The economic loss was $1.5 trillion. If in addition, reportedly, Asia Pacific region is about four times more likely to be affected by natural disaster than other uh, areas. But this data for the Asia Pacific region, so the Indo Pacific region would be higher uh, than these figures. The Indo Pacific region is very important for global prosperity but it has a high risk of national disasters. In addition, according to the six assessment report of IPCC uh, shown on the right side of the screens, uh, global warming is expected to continue to in the future and it will affect our lives in the form of heat waves, uh, heavy rain and tropical cyclones. In light of these uh, figures, what can we do as a Navy uh, in this situation? The most uh, distinct Navy feature in the times of disaster is that uh, we can approach affected area from the sea. Not only being able to assess to the area regardless of the damage situation on the land, but also even if the port cannot be used and normal ships uh, cannot enter the port. We can access the area by aircraft, landing boats, and other means. We can also play the important role as a base for the offshore activities. We can move freely across the sea, quickly gather a large number of people and goods to the areas, temporarily protect those who have been rescued and provide food and medical care. These characteristics of the Navy are also useful in the phase of life support and recovery uh, assistance. Next, I'd, I'd show you the major disaster relief mission conducted by the JMSDF in the last decade in Japan. As many of you, uh, Japan has a wide variety of disasters such as floods caused by typhoons and heavy rain ship collisions, oil spirits, as well as earthquakes and its resulting tsunami. As some kind of disaster occurred every year, so self-defense force conduct a disaster relief operation almost every year. The next looking at the disaster in the Indo-Pacific region for the past 10 years, the JMSDF has responded to five cases in cooperation with other navies and non-governmental organizations. This included earthquakes, typhoon damage, and search for missing aircraft as international disaster relief activities. So today, I'd like to take up two domestic cases, the Great East Japan earthquake and the ship collision incident. Also to international two cases, typhoon damage in Philippines and earthquakes in New Zealand. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the Great East Japan earthquake. On March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake triggered a tsunami of up to 18.3 meters in height killing over 15,000 people and leaving about 2,600 missing. The JMSDF deployed 60 vessels, more than 20 aircraft, and 16,000 personnel to deal with this earthquake and tsunami. The self defense force as well uh, sent 100,000 personnel, which accounted for about half of all units. The JMSDF's mission covered a wide range of areas, including the search and rescue of stranded people by the tsunami, 
transporting personnel and necessary goods, providing livelihood uh, support, such as buses and meals, and the cooling of the nuclear power plants and the decontamination activities. The characteristic of this activity are uh, such as, uh, number one, the scale of the disaster was so large that not only the national and the local governments, but also the entire society, including the affected people, responded to the disaster. Number two, we received the warm support from many countries, especially the US military, carried out the operation Pomodachi, which means a friend in English. Number three, uh, we engage in the difficult mission, such as the cooling of nuclear power plants, paralyzed by tsunami and the decontamination activities. Next is our response to the ship collision uh, recent, recently occurred in the Japanese inland sea. On May 27 this year, cargo ships collide with each other, and one of them sank in the strait of the narrow inland sea with a strong current. The James DA dispatched the submarine uh, rescue ship and the mine sweeper tender to mine seabirds and two helicopters. The cooperation between the Japan Maritime Defense Force and the Japan Coast Guard was remarkable in these activities. Of course, uh, JMSDF and the Japan Coast Guard have been working together in missions and training. But this time, mainly uh, Japan Coast Guard divers such the curve ship, but the uh, water depth was so deep and the tidal current was fast. The JMSDF submarine rescue ship carried out the decompression for the divers and planned the quick rescue operation in coordination with the Japan Coast Guard. Next is our response to the typhoon damage in Philippines as oversea uh, case. Uh, uh, in November 2013, typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines and caused tremendous damage, as you know. The JMSDF has dispatched the DDGH ISE. LST, supply ship, and helicopters. Our mission included the car transport, personnel rescue operation, tailored to local needs and livelihood support on the vessel. As a result, the uh, delivery of the goods is about 540 tons by aircraft and uh, helicopters, and the transport the about 2,300 affected people in total. Overseas mission, HADR mission, was not the first time for Japan, but it was the first case for a JMSDF to organize a joint task force with other services to deal with a uh, disaster. In the affected areas, the armed forces, a government, and a non government organization from many countries conducted the support activities. In order to understand the demand and to effectively uh, supply for the activity uh, in the affected area, it is important to coordinate and cooperation, sorry, cooperate with e these organizations. Our last case is earthquake in New Zealand. On November 13, 2016, the magnitude 7.8 earthquake killed two people and injured 57 people. The JMSDF searched for victims and checked the damage with the particular aircraft P-1. In this mission, the P-1 are then participating in the multilateral exercise and the international fleet review was dispatched to New Zealand. The JMSDF participated in the various exercises in the Indo Pacific region, and one of its missions is promptly respond to disaster in the vicinity. From this perspective, New Zealand earthquake case is a good example of the readiness of the JMSDF. 
The next is the three key points from JMS DF's lesson learns. They are readiness, partnership, and cooperation. First, I'd like to talk about the readiness. It's not easy to predict when and what kind of disaster will occur. In Japan, as a nation that experienced the great East Japan earthquake, the concept of disaster reduction has spread, it, which means uh, limiting the disaster causes damage rather than preventing the disaster. In other words, uh, we think about how quickly uh, we can protect human lives from disaster and how effectively we can limit the damage. In order to do that, we need to improve our readiness. To maintain readiness at home, JMSDF designates ships and aircraft as quick reaction force. And they have a certain amount of relief supplies. In addition, uh, one of the examples for the readiness at sea, JMSDF conducts the annual Indo-Pacific Deployment IPD, uh, which holds training and seminars on HADR for regional countries. The IPD forces are loaded with necessary materials for HADR in advance. In the event of the disaster while cruising in the vicinity, JMSDF can provide assistance at any time. Of course, needless to say, this readiness is guaranteed by our daily training. The second is partnership among navies. In cooperation, it is essential to standardize and train rules and procedures. The first, as an example of the standardization of procedures, the Disaster Response Guidebook was adopted at Western Pacific Naval Symposium, and a similar effort is being made in uh, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Through the process, uh, we can share the each country's capabilities, lessons learned uh, from past disasters, and expected support in the event of the disaster. For planning, the JMSDF and the US Navy have established a course of the US Navy uh, NPP, Naval Planning Procedure, uh, called APNIC inviting naval officers from various countries, which can be used for the HADR. Uh, based on the, these common norms and procedures, a bilateral and multilateral exercise, such as Komodo and other cooperative activity uh, will promote mutual understanding, clarify the potential needs of each country, and improve interoperability. The third uh, lesson learned is uh, cooperation with civil entities. We know that military power is very strong. Therefore, generally speaking, the military should be the last resort for HADR. However, the first few days after the disaster are uh, the vital period for civil lives and prompt action is necessary. For this reason, it is very important to cooperate with civil entries, such as Medicine Sans Frontiers, which has effective uh, medical means, but no transportation, and other NGOs who are good at understanding the needs of the affected people. Every year in Japan, a uh, comprehensive exercise is held among the government agency, the Grand Maritime and Air Self Defense Forces, the Japan Coast Guard, the police, local government, NGO, NPO, and local citizens. This aims for effective cooperation in times of disaster. Now, I'll touch on the Japan's free and open in the Pacific region, which aims for the same goal as. ASEAN's AORP. One of the three pillars of the vision is peace and stability in the regions. 
Responding to disaster is also the important agenda in ensuring peace and stability. JMSDF efforts in HADR mission that I mentioned all lead to uh, realize the free and open infrastructure. Many countries uh, in the Indo Pacific region are uh, connected by sea. Cooperation among the navies, uh, which can rescue and support from the sea to the affected area, is effective in HADR. The JMSDF uh, will continue to contribute to work for peace and stability in the Indo Pacific regions in cooperation with other navies and relevant civil organizations while maintaining our own readiness. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Admiral, for a uh, very good uh, presentation. Please uh, give applause to Admiral Omachi. <laughs> Honorable guests and ladies and gentlemen, uh, Admiral already uh, gave uh, our uh, his thought and uh, lesson learned from Japan side about how to organize the joint task force, how to sharing common rule and procedure, how to stand skill among uh, following the exercise, and also uh, how to get a readiness, uh, ready at home, ready at sea, and a continuous uh, training. So I think the, the key uh, point in uh, here is uh, how to uh, have a good uh, cooperation and collaboration and also uh, the relation with the civil entity. Now we are moving to the third presentation. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Bebeb, your time. Thank you, moderators. A very good morning. Your Excellency, Admiral Yudo Margono, the Chief of Indonesian Navy, uh, participants of symposiums, a very good and healthy day to all. It's a great honor for us to be part of this excellent symposium that Indonesian Navy seeing quite a good global progressive cooperation mechanism, cooperative mechanism, and to see the issue on the security, peace, and prosperity is indeed the inner beauty of how the role of Navy as part of diplomacy should take place in the world. At this juncture, I would like to uh, give us on how Indonesia's experience, as well as lesson learned, that disaster diplomacy is one of the emerging issues that uh, connect how conflict and cooperations would close ties to each other on the nature and the issue concerned. Because actually, by the disaster situations itself, the um, wall of conflict between parties are in part in the situations that cooperations may be built. Now, choosing the topic today, I would like to um, share with you how the disaster diplomacy uh, in ASEAN uh, as an alternative approach of uh, Indonesian foreign policy. Uh, I will give you around four issues that might be relevant for our discussions today. Now, first, I would like to discuss and see how the natural disasters in Southeast Asia, which already has been uh, expressed by our uh, previous uh, speakers, which this natural disaster happened anywhere in the world, uh, with or without any invitations, of course, uh, in Southeast Asia itself. Now, we have seen about at least, uh, I took note about four major disasters in Southeast Asia. Next um, those uh, two previous speakers also mentioned about several points of uh, natural disasters, of which Tunisia experienced um, back then in disaster relief and the form of disaster diplomacy. Indonesia learned in the way how along this experience, Indonesia sees the part of collaborative activity is above all. Now, Indonesia's experience in disaster relief, I think when we see about that, when we learn how the tsunami 2004 is a cataclysmic disaster, and at the same time, it's also there is a fact that we have still domestic uh, issues uh, with the uh, free movement, free active movement at a time. 
sebelumnya. Sebelumnya lagi. Ya. So, um, when we learn from the tsunami 2004, there is a disaster. And I think it's quite catastrophic, it's catastrophic. And at the same time, Indonesia has also have a domestic issues with the free Aceh movement. But by the real and direct diplomacy back then, I think there will be a great point that the two factions at a time try to see the collaborations and the cooperative first to uh, secure and save what has been disasters in Indonesia. And because of that, we also need to have what kind of a management of which that I think each of Indonesian, each of the uh, ASEAN member countries learn from how the disaster management has a need a management which ASEAN has worked well on it by establishing what we call it the uh, relevant uh, ASEAN humanitarian uh, assistance. Now, learning from Indonesia's role in disaster uh, uh, management in ASEAN, I think what we have learned so far uh, in particular that several actions oriented uh, named to the view the establishment of Indonesian uh, active contributions in the establishment of national uh, national agency for disaster uh, management, as well as regionally, we established what we call it the ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Center, which of course this is continued commitment through a participations in the ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management, ASEAN National Committee on Disaster Management. So that would also include when Indonesia also trying to express the important on the East Asia Summit statement on regional maritime cooperation. Now, seeing to that point, I think Indonesia at the time tried to see that the risk management is crucial and strategic. So how this kind of the role that disaster management in ASEAN has worked out very well when we try to complete the mechanism itself. So on the, on the, the, the next diagram that we see, Therefore, the mechanism of management took the, the key role to what extent that active contributions by each party concerns is crucial and need coordination. Now, some of the process was created by the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response in 2005. Now, looking towards this, I think when we uh, learn from uh, the crucial needs and then the coordination has to be built when we face any disaster. Uh, in 2005, when I talked about the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response in 2005, I think it was created and built by related ASEAN documents, from ASEAN documents, as well as trying to see whether relevant and related United Nations resolution in 2005, 2002, and 1991 are looking towards that. Now, essentially, this kind of letter documents when the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Board in 2005 has successfully tried to build the collaborations and how the cooperative mechanism among the member states of the ASEAN itself. Now, looking by the fact of these circumstances, the way how the uh, ASEAN Humanitarian Center, United Assistance work, for example, when there is a large disaster taking place in Southeast Asia, these uh, seven approaches, how the center has working out in, in a very uh, uh, meaning well, has visualized and visions as well as mission in the way that the AHA centers work through several process when disasters occur. Now by 2021, uh, information mm -hmm. that the AHA centers also make a weekly disaster uh, update. Now, uh, this information uh, give the ASEAN, next one, ASEAN uh, sees this center and its function perfectly designed and prospect for what might uh, uh, for what uh, management would do by collaboration. So by this information, the ASEAN centers give almost every single point that mentioning. learning from the ASEAN ways, 
Indonesia roles in these functions provide a concrete and action oriented. So first thing and the, main, the, the most that the uh, premises and the facilities for the AHA centers are within the Indonesian uh, soil, in particular in Jakarta as the, cap the uh, capital of asset secretary, as well as try to figure out that the concept of how this management would do from the prey and cause of disaster is completely being covered and being monitored. Now, when we talked about the uh, 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 most obligations, uh, most within like endowment fund, we're also trying to find out that perhaps within the context of our national capacity through the national agency for uh, disaster management uh, can also make a quite a participation in how these ASEAN pillars in the context of a community can, con can actively contribute to the establishments of the work program. Now, uh, seeing into that point, I think one of the issues that we discuss in the context of security, I think we all learn that each country has their own jurisdiction. And I think as an independent country, we have to assure that when disasters uh, happening in Indonesia, for example, we have some uh, point that may be uh, uh, worth to understand how the procedures and, pro and, and, and process that might be when there is a need to have the uh, foreign or overseas military in uh, humanitarian affairs or disaster uh, reduction operations for Indonesia. Now, this is the procedures, and I think uh, this is very generally, but mostly it is about how that the clearance and approval for, in, for Indonesian territory will be applied to those overseas military when they are trying to assist us on the disaster management process. Now, by learning for that, uh, maritime disasters management for a time in the past six years, uh, I think Indonesia learning quite a lot. And those mechanisms on the context of operations for your military, overseas military operations in Indonesia has done very well. And I would like to say and express our highly appreciation for countries that are assisting us in several disasters that has been happening uh, currently. Now, in that context, um, how are we seeing that uh, way forward, perhaps, that we might be able to look towards into the context? I have four important uh, issues that might be relevant uh, for each of us to uh, check in the context of does uh, do this forward may work very well. First, there is no planned maritime disasters on one way or the other. It will come at any time without any, any uh, you know, specific uh, information that it will re still remain a threat. By that reason, I think through what we have done, uh, Indonesia as well as in the ASEAN context, the continued cooperation has always been needed. And we all understood that uh, Captain Kerry has mentioned very well in the context how the US participations in the, in the, in the, in the regions. And then uh, uh, the representative from Japan as well uh, mentioning on how this four important point, when we talked about uh, hands uh, on and then uh, through bilateral regional mechanisms, it has to be continued continually. It cannot be stopped only facing when there is a disaster occur. Now, regional mechanisms or what ASEAN has been done is quite ensuring that cooperation will always be in the sense of uh, respect to international law, uh, one way or the other. And then it will create what the perfections and harmony in disaster diplomacy itself on how it will work it out. Now, uh, once it is uh, pointed that way forward has to be all the time uh, uh, alert in that context. And I think enhancing preparedness is one of the most important points. I think in this future, the key point of integri integrating uh, the, uh, the uh, mitigating disaster is preparedness. I think it cannot be more to everybody because preparedness means a lot in the way how we face the uh, disaster. Then by that reason, on our perspective, that the collaborative attitude, strategic and vision. I think vision, uh, vision on the context of how this preparedness is quite strategic, it is actually been expressed, been introduced from the previous speakers that 
the most important point on how these symposiums today looking towards that. And I think on my perspective as well, I think the Indonesian Navy is rightly in time on saying it. So seeing the progress, uh, shift global change of the uh, world uh, towards international maritime security cooperations and disaster management, I think it will be a key to successful response and preparedness. I thank you for that. Please give a to uh, Mr. Bebeb. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the great uh, presentation. I think it's Indonesia has uh, disaster diplomacy with uh, some uh, agenda also. And uh, let me underline uh, from Mr. Bebe's presentation about the disaster diplomacy. First is how to provide premise and facility to our center, how to pay annually, how to facilitate distribution of donation of goods, and also from the BNPB, information sharing information, and also uh, involved with the ADMER work programs. And the import, another important thing is how uh, the military operation contribution in the overseas. So uh, please, uh, now uh, time for the Q&A. Uh, please, uh, Captain Sylvie. Thank you, moderator. Very well, ladies and gentlemen. Moving along to our session, uh, now we are going to have a discussion. There will be uh, three sessions, and each session is for three questions. To anyone here in Sesquale who have uh, questions, would you please to raise your hand, mention your name, rank, and state to which presenter you address your questions. Please. In Sesquale? Okay. Gentlemen on the back, yes? Please. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Uh, thank you, ma'am, moderator. Uh, I am uh, Captain Arif Badruddin of Indonesian Navy. My first question go to Captain Harris of um, Royal Navy from the uh, Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, after conducting several HID operations across uh, Indo-Pacific area of responsibilities, which civil military relationship that you find as a best, best practice in order to be, uh, which is full of uh, takeaways which can be implemented by other stricken areas. Thank you. Okay. Um, Captain Harris, please, you mm -hmm. can answer directly. Sorry, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, clearly I can't come up with a specific example of civil military cooperation by country. What I can refer to, and, and something that we have used as part of the construct for Pacific Partnership, for example, this year, is that the organizations that promote training in civil military coordination have some excellent uh, training and um, uh, scenarios to work to. And that can either be the United Nations in Geneva or as we used in uh, the Philippines recently, the ASEAN Civil Military Cooperation course is very strong. And the beauty of both of those is that they build upon best practice from any number of countries and organizations. So without singling out a single one, I put a very strong sales pitch to both the United Nations and the ASEAN Civil Military Coordination Cooperation courses. Thank you. Okay. So is it answered to your questions? Uh, Captain Arif? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Most welcome. Okay, to uh, anybody in here who would like to ask? Okay, sir, please. Assalamualaikum and uh, good afternoon. My name is Brijan Rizwan, Malaysia Defense Attache. My question is to the uh, Captain Kerry, U.S. Navy. In one of your slides shown about U.S. participation in solving the problem about the immigration of ethnic Rohingya, could you share with us what are the challenges and how to overcome the issue of the uh, Rohingya migration, particularly in the south, in the area of Malacca Straits? Thank you. Captain Harris, 
Um, Thank you very much, sir. Yep. Are you happy for me to go ahead? Please. So it's that, thank you very much for that question. Now, we categorize humanitarian aid disaster response operations in a number of ways. And one of them we talk about is a complex disaster. And whilst the immigration crisis at this stage wasn't complex disaster, it invariably means when there's a form of conflict in the background, a conflict that might make it difficult for uh, NGOs and civil agencies to be involved, but also to implicate militaries because of the sort of potential lack of impartiality. So the challenge when you have IDPs, internally displaced personnel or people or refugees, is, is what's the cause of that movement at the outset? Our fundamental driver is assistance and support to life, life-saving and the immediate response. Where you go with the potential border disputes or domestic political and international political sensitivities around a given scenario is always open for debate and will influence eventually the outcome of or the response of a, a given nation and how they do it. For us looking at this as principally a surveillance mission and operation to enable um, the regional powers in particular, and we talked about, I talked about how we based ourselves in Malaysia, allowing them to help um, dialogue and um, diplomacy to work its course to prevent the root causes of these disasters or displaced people. That, that, that's the key part of it. So we can provide the search assets, we can uh, provide the support to NGOs still, but inevitably there's a decision to be made about where you sit on any given political divide. And it's sensitive and it's difficult. And I think that's an example of that. And I think the, the outcomes of the international response was broadly effective. Thank you. Okay, does this reply to your question, sir? Yep, okay. One more question from a Uh Yes, Captain uh, Kirsa, please, time. Thank you. I'm Colonel Girsang from Cops Mariner Headquarters. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, what I will ask is a personal question and not represent of uh, Indonesia Navy or uh, Indonesia itself. Uh, according to the past disaster in the Pacific Rim and the trend of the future disaster uh, regarding of a climate change to the Captain Kerry, I will ask, do you think the number of the combat material or asset, including vessel, aircraft, and supporting material, and also the number of personnel, still enough to face the further challenge in this region? And also the budget of uh, U.S. provided in this region especially to balance the hegemony and the free and open Indo-Pacific are still meet or matching to U.S. interest requirement. Thank you. Captain Harris, please. Colonel Girisang, thank you very much for that question. A very deeply probing one. And I'm sure if I were to talk to either Admiral Aquilino, who's the commander of the Indo-Pacific Command at Camp Smith in Hawaii, or my own commander, Admiral Paparo, they would all tell you that for the mission of the United States Navy in this region, they could always do with more assets. I mean, that's a typically military response. We never have enough ships, aircraft, or personnel, and we have to balance them against conflicting demands in other regions of the world. And the way the US military is structured around um, combating commanders, we are Indo-PACOM, but we have a boundary with North Command and also with um, Central Command. Central Command clearly deeply invested in recent um, conflicts in Afghanistan and in the Gulf and in Iraq. So there's always a, a, a battle for where those resources are placed. Now, the corollary to that, of course, is the more partners you have, the more interoperable you are with them, and the more you exercise with them, 
you have a significant force enabler. So even when your own order of battle or your capabilities are not exactly as you would wish them to be, you can call upon that support, that mutual support really between nations and particularly in navies, because I think um, we're largely better adapted at working together with allies and partners than sometimes is possible with air forces in the land, just by the nature of being mariners and the fact we face a common, um, I hesitate to call it diversity, but um, mother nature and the nature of the sea and the ocean and the risks that presents and poses. I think it brings us together. So when we look at the responses that were done and the forces that were sent to assist with various operations and humanitarian aid and disaster relation, responses uh, by the US Navy, they used what they could at the time available, largely forces that were pre-positioned because you don't have long to respond. And, you know, under the Oslo Convention, we can only keep military forces there for the time of, um, necessary to achieve the mission with our specific um, capabilities. So the sort of list of ships and aircraft and personnel you saw responding was based very much on what could get there within a reasonable time frame to conduct the mission, but really to hand over to the civilian and United Nations organization and NGOs who are the sort of real experts at humanitarian aid and disaster relief. We're the, we're the first responders. Uh, and I think we have to keep that in mind because we are largely expensive um, so it really is a specialist capabilities of our forces that um, people are looking for. Thank you. It's good, thank you. I think there is a uh, Captain Bambang and Captain Salin here, so please. Uh, Captain thank Bambang you. first, maybe after this, Captain Salim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Captain Bambang Permawan from. Uh, Operation Staff uh, HQ, Navy HQ. I just want to ask about uh, to the first and second panelists. Uh, we know that one of the difficulties of uh, HADR operation is uh, the limitation of resources. That's why we need to cooperate uh, to conduct the HADR operation. We need to. We cannot work alone as a country to handle the. SADR issue, but the problem is uh, sometimes is the interoperability uh, between the, the countries that involve in SADR operation, both of uh, hardware and software. The software usually, uh, so far that I know that some of uh, uh, countries has developed some standard operation procedure. Uh, to uh, work in uh, SADR operation. However, until now, we don't have uh, any SOP that recognized internationally by, by the whole country as a whole, internationally. Usually, uh, only part of countries that work together to develop the SOP. And also the, the, the hardware, the ship as uh, the main uh, the main uh, asset that we use to SSDR operation. Usually, we don't have uh, some kinds of standard that we could use uh, to work together uh, to get more interoperability between, between the countries. So the question is, is it possible for us to conduct this kind of uh, development, to conduct, develop uh, SOP that uh, recognized by the whole country in the world internationally, and also like a commitment for the countries to when they develop their asset, uh, they able to dedicate some part of the development to be able to uh, dedicate it to work uh, as a asset to be uh, handle the SADR operation together. So it's like a, a commitment of a country when they develop the, the asset they should uh, concern about the, how the asset could be uh, operate operability, interoperability during the HAD operation, something, something, like, some, something like that. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, Captain Bambang, uh, question is goes to Captain Harris and Admiral. Please. Uh, 
maybe uh, Captain Harris will uh, answer the question first. Sorry, Captain Harris, I can't hear you. Or perhaps... Uh, um, Sorry, I was waiting for um, okay. Abril um, Omachi to, to take the words. But I'll, I'll start then and give him time to sort of compose his thoughts. So... Um, very good, inter very interesting question there, Captain Vanabam. That's, um, you know, how do you, how do you bring the scale and capabilities of the US Navy to work alongside the Indonesian Navy uh, or others, all the British Royal Navy as an example, you know, close to my heart. We do know that technologically they have certain advantages and sometimes that, particularly in terms of software and communications, can be problematic because, you know, in terms of investment by other nations, it's difficult to keep up with what they do and how they do it. Um, the US Navy recognizes this and they are very keen to be inclusive of all partners and allies and will work to their best efforts to make sure that that sort of access is provided. Now, the good news in humanitarian aid and disaster relief operations is they are inevitably conducted at the unclassified level. So that opens up a whole raft of um, unclassified communication routes that wouldn't otherwise be available to you um, when you're operating in more sensitive military operations. And where you go from there, in terms of an SOP, actually what you're doing is you're providing to the United Nations Office for Central Humanitarian Aid or, or your own national authority who, can, who coordinates disaster response reliefs. You're providing them with a shopping list of what you can do. And we have to prioritize that. The way that works for us in America is that USAID will develop what they call a, a military task um, matrix, a MITAM, and they will work out that for a given response, they need to be able to put uh, US Marine Corps ashore to assist on the ground. They might want uh, desalination plants delivered, generators, um, first aiders. And what you can do is you can start bringing in some of those first aiders from civilian agencies that you've worked with, that you're accustomed to working with, and they form part of that military response. You become the vehicle to deliver them. Now that can work well on a large scale with aircraft carriers and amphibious ships if you can get the access. And there we're predominantly talking about getting teams ashore to create landing sites when airfields aren't available and to make it safe to get aircraft in, accepting that military aircraft cannot, and ships can inevitably operate with a greater appetite for risk. Our operation envelope just tends to be wider. The problem is if you try and put those big ships somewhere, and I could use, for example, Palau, where you just can't get the access easily, you need to bring in smaller units. You need to bring more like, uh, I can give an example of the Royal Navy, my Navy's operational patrol vessels that will come to the Indo-Pacific. Perfect size for dealing with disaster response where access is difficult. And that part of disaster response relief could even be um, doing diving operations to make sure there are no obstacles to safe navigation in the approaches to ports. This, your imagination, you use your imagination in terms of all that might be required for a given disaster. As to whether you need an SOP, I think I've sort of answered that from my perspective is that um, we're not operating at the high-end fighting scale of naval cooperation, and we don't have the constraints over communication. So it is relatively easier. Um, what we do need to understand is what our constraints are. You know, when we're working with allies and partnerships, I need to know what, what are the Indonesian Navy capabilities and how do they like to operate? And if they're working with me, how can we work efficiently together? And that sort of thing you don't get from James Shipping or um, other or Wikipedia, this is you get from working alongside your allies and partners, operating with them, talking to them. Events like this symposium that bring together heads of navies and um, chief operators who can who can form the personal relationships and make that happen. So I would contend that in that light, we don't necessarily need a written SOP. 
I think we do need to harness best practice and we do need to collate our operational reports and share them, um, which for my part is available from the Americans. If you use the Center for Excellence Disaster Management here in Hawaii, there is an agency that works for the Pacific Fleet, but, but captures those documents and makes them readily available um, online. Um, and I've learned a lot from that, and I'm sure many others could. And I've learned a lot from ASEAN and from the United wow. Nations. So maybe not an SOP, but exactly what um, you know, both the Admiral said and Mr. Bebe said is it's about preparedness and working together and exercising together to make that possible and to create that military task matrix that the Joint Force Commander can use in the event of a disaster response. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Harris. Uh, please, Admiral Omachi, perhaps you can uh, deliver your thoughts about this. Thank you very much. But uh, allow me, please allow me to the use the uh, interpreter. May I? Please, sir. Thank you. So, ah, uh, ah, the now question is, ah, the 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 question uh, includes uh, my answer uh, to the question. Uh, uh, at first, uh, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, software uh, uh, part. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there are many kinds of uh, SOPs uh, in uh, uh, regional uh, perspective. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, one of the uh, uh, idea is that uh, so we have already uh, standardized uh, SOPs uh, developed in uh, WPNS uh, and uh, uh, IONS. So uh, we can develop uh, and make it deeper uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, SOPs uh, into the more uh, worldwide one. Uh, and also uh, speaking of uh, information sharing and uh, communication, uh, so we can develop uh, these kind of things uh, through conducting joint exercise. So uh, next, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, hardware part. Uh, I think uh, defense equipment uh, that each country has uh, is uh, different uh, according to the uh, demand uh, of each country. え、社外まして、ハードウェアを統一することというのは、これは絶対に不可能ですので、え、これらをどのように使っていくかは、やはり、え、共同の訓練等を通じて、それぞれできることを明らかにしているのが良いかと思います。So, uh, 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 u
uh, other uh, uh, Navy's uh, equipment. あのヘリコプターの世界では船に乗せるヘリコプターを持っている国の間では、えっと、ホスタックという形でどのような船がどのような航空機を使えるのかといったようなあフレームワークがあります。So,、uh, talking about the、uh, helicopters、uh, that can be able to、uh, onboard、uh, ships,、uh, there's, a, uh, oh, uh, there's a document uh, named uh, HOSTAC,、uh, which indicates uh, what kind of uh, helicopters uh, can be used to onboard、uh, ships. What kind of、uh, helicopters can be onboard what kind of ships? So,、uh, yeah. まあ、アンクラシュファイドのその情報の中で、これらはまあどのようにシェアするかというのは難しいんですけれども、少なくともこのホスタックについては、あのアンクラシュファイドの情報で、非常にまああの船でヘリコプターを運用する人たちにとっては、良い数字になっています。あ、uh, least、uh, I would say uh, this uh, host a c k、uh, document uh, is Uh, comprised of、uh, only unclassified information. So,、uh, in the、uh, helicopter community,、uh, this document is uh, really uh, uh, helpful and useful. So, in the post a c t in the way that the post act is 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 in the way that the <laughs> so, if, uh, if uh, this kind of uh, documents, uh, such as uh, HOSTAC, uh, is spread uh, among the uh, parties, uh, uh, I, I, I believe uh, interoperability uh, among navies will increase.、Uh, this is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. It's really good explanation. We understand well that the, the difference uh, between uh, uh, assets is、uh, really it's not easy to join. We have a different standard operating procedure, we have a different asset, we have different uh, 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 operational.、Uh, okay,、uh, Captain Harris, please, you raise your hand, please. Yes, if I may, and, I, and I'm sort of、um, having had a bit more time to think and, and listening there to what Admiral. I'm actually had to say is、um, go back to Captain Arief's question previously about examples of civil military cooperation. I think、um, the 2011 example in Japan of the Japan self defense forces and civil authorities working together has to be a, a beacon of、um, an outstanding achievement, effectively, just given the scale of that triple disaster. And so,、uh, coincidence that in this sort of Pacific. Exercise our principal Navy's exercise, the RIMPAC exercise. It's Japan that, that coordinates and hosts the HADA training part of that. And this is one of those steps to improving interoperability between the participating navies. But I just wanted to say, based on my experience in Typhoon、uh, Yolanda, Haiyan in the Philippines, you know, that、um, it's all very well. The sort of question that、um, Captain Bannerman asked about、uh, the software and communications. Actually, that you can very quickly overload the system, even when you're trying to operate independently on national satellite services. If you're feeding into a nation's communication network, which is part of its critical national infrastructure, and you're doing it with lots of bandwidth demands, the whole system just collapses. And, and I saw that a little bit, if I may say so, with、um, JTF 505, is that many of the products that were excellent that we could have seen were just too time consuming to sort of visit online or elsewhere. And so the best bit of、um, best way to operate was always、um, telephone communication to the multinational coordination center, talk to your national representative and let them sort of agree the priorities at the, the, at the principal coordination headquarters.、Um, I hope that sheds a little bit more light based on my personal experience. It's in no way to contradict Admiral Amachi, because、uh, as I say, I think sort of、uh, Japan has some excellent examples of how we can learn best practice in HAD operations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Captain Harris. So we have here at least uh, three uh, questions. I think it's a Captain Uday Kiran from Indian Navy. We'd like to uh, ask the question to Captain Kerry Harris. Um, the question is, uh, as you have rightly brought out the U.S. response to SADR is spearheaded by U.S. aid, is it a good model for all countries to follow? This is considering that a civilian face could be more amenable to most compared to a military footprint. Thank you for your response. Captain Uday Kiran from Indian Navy, please. Thank you very much, Captain, for that question. Uh, I'll answer it this way. Um, and I'll answer it as a Brit in this example, because um, I'm not in a position to sort of criticize the sort of American system and how their interagency works. But I don't think it's a coincidence that in Great Britain, we operate on very similar lines and that it was our sort of um, foreign office who would be the principal, like State Department would be the sort of principal authority. And that through them, our DFID, our Department for International Development and Aid, would be the sort of principal responder on the ground. And so we, the military, would be working in accordance with their wishes and priorities and supporting them. And then you would have on all the aid delivered, there'd be stickers that say, not USAID, as you saw in the photos in my presentation, but UK AID and a British flag. So we've sort of reached the same conclusion. And I don't think it was mimicry. It was, um, it's just the way we're structured. But that's the sort of Western liberal democracy. It's not for everybody. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to work. But remember the Oslo Conventions and how they restrict and limit how militaries can operate in response to a humanitarian disaster. Um, we're actually quite restricted. And really the expertise, as I alluded to previously, lies with those long-term presence of um, NGOs and civilian authorities, the people who operate and work on a daily basis with local civil authorities and government. Um, so we have our role to play. We're the first responders. Um, I think it works. I wouldn't contest it, but I recognize that it's very much a function of how your own governments and nations are structured and organized as to whether or not it works in your particular case. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, please. So, highly appreciate uh, to uh, everyone who is joining us online and uh, has submitting uh, questions. The next question is uh, come from uh, Captain Robert Marpaung from uh, TNIHQ. Uh, it's uh, the question to Captain uh, Kerr Harris. The question is, what you as Navy strategic consideration to cope climate change and what modification if any platforms C4 ISR and facilities are required to adapt to the effect of climate change? That's the question. Captain Harris, please. Gosh. Somebody's doing some serious staff course thinking, um, yeah, if I could solve the problem there, I think I would be, um, I probably wouldn't be wearing a Navy captain's uh, uniform. But it's a very good question because actually that C4I star, we do have a role in monitoring and surveillance. Um, there's clearly a role to play for sort of um, those elements that we have in space, depending on your nation's capabilities, but satellite surveillance. And you see how that's used. I mean, we term that sort of technology, sort of dual usage technology. That can be both used in a military environment, but that can also be used for the benefit of civil agencies and organizations. And you know, here we've talked about how we need to work and operate together in response to a humanitarian disaster. You know, that, that's um, magnified many times when we look at what a global response would have to be to make our lives and prosperity tenable in the current trend in, in climate change. Um, however you, do, you define the sort of um, the root causes and, and to what extent humankind can actually intervene and how much this is sort of a, a global trend that is perhaps beyond our control. The military clearly has a part to play in that, um, but we're also instruments by governments and state. And in that respect, we don't necessarily have the same liberty of expression of um, some of the think tanks, um, lobby groups, environmentalists, and people who probably deal with these issues more regularly on a, on a daily basis. But it's clearly evident that it's going to impact our lives. It's already, we seem to be seeing evidence of that and the frequency and scale of tropical cyclones. Um, earthquakes, I think, are a trend apart, but, you know, earthquakes and tsunamis and rising water levels. None of this bodes well for the future unless we can, we can contribute in some way to sort of controlling it. So I would just say, 
to be brief, it's all about what we can contribute in the surveillance and data capture. And in the meantime, I think those navies that are reinvesting in equipment are already generally looking at ways in which they can do it while reducing carbon footprint, um, not only to be more environmentally friendly, but also because we need to consume less fuel because that's a constraint, uh, cost driver, and, and we're all in that competing budgetary environment that we need to make our militaries relevant and efficient and keep them at that level. Um, so I think um, with the backdrop of global warming and trends so that um, that has a part to play on how our efficiency is perceived. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Harris. Uh, moving on to uh, other questions. The question comes from Commander Wahid uh, from Law and Political Ministry. Uh, questions to uh, Rear Admiral Omachi Japan, from Japan. And the question is, I see in your present, uh, presentation, GMDSF sent approximately 20 minesweeper vessel while the grid is Japan earthquake. Will the purpose send a lot of minesweeper? That's the question. I answered. So, uh, uh, presentation on Akade, は、マインスイーパーを入籍を作ったということではありません。トータルのおお、デストロイヤーも含めて、え、60隻を、え、送りました。あの、グレートイーストジャパンアスクエイクのところ。あ、あ、thank you. Uh, so, so uh, I would like to uh, 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 I'd like to say that um, so I didn't I didn't in my presentation I didn't say um, uh, twenty uh, mine sweepers were sent to uh, the Great uh, East Japan earthquake tsunami. Uh, what, what I said is in total uh, six uh, sixty uh, vessels. Uh, including uh, destroyers and other uh, ships uh, were sent uh, to the scene. Uh, and also, uh, in the uh, first place, uh, uh, Japan uh, that, uh, does not have uh, 20 uh, minesweepers. Uh, uh, this is my answer. Uh, is it, uh, is it fine with you? Yeah, hopefully it's uh, answered the questions, yes, sir? Okay, we still have uh, a few questions from online. It uh, comes from uh, Rear Admiral Greg Agung uh, from the Beauty uh, Giandra Setjen Wan Tanas. Uh, the question uh, is to Captain uh, Carrie Harris. The question is, when the nation, especially the Navy, is addressing the issue of climate change about the rise of sea level, what is the consideration and what we should be aware and prepare regarding our assets, operations, and our structures? That's the answer to uh, Captain Kerry Harris from Rear Admiral Greg Agung. Admiral, thank you very much for your question. I think. Um, Admiral Udiato will uh, remember his ACS C-12. There was probably a document that was floating around at that time from um, a British um, doctrinal uh, organization, um, set of uh, doctrine and concepts that was looking at strategic global trends, trends, I think it was global strategic trends. Uh, and it was really fascinating because it's as relevant today as it was then, and it identified many of the risks. And we recognize that within Africa, they were probably uh, manifold uh, and the potential impact of them would, would like to be more dramatic. And this is climate change, rising sea levels, one part of that, but it's also about urbanization of populations, um, competition for resources in drought conditions and mega loss, if you like, large cities, which 
you know, if you think back to the example of the floods in Thailand, the sort of Bangkok, when I said, you know, you had 13 million people affected, that brings a scale of um, risk all of its own. Uh, how do you contain those problems? So in the Navy, I, I, hopefully I answered that in the previous question, that, the, you know, the, we have limited resources to bring to the sort of causes of climate change. But our capacity to respond to it is something that we need to think about in the design and development and acquisition of our vessels, ships, aircraft. And I think our role is, you know, it's a little bit like the um, response to the third typhoon I talked about in the Philippines is actually by clever forecasting and preparedness, you could, you know, move, you know, a significant number of people and evacuate them quickly. Um, we can contribute as we do in military in terms of recognized maritime picture, ISR, all those good things are about in building in the indicators and warnings. And I think if we can do that, we can hope to provide sufficient warning and alert to civilian and national authorities to take the necessary responses to protect people. But sadly, the longer term consequences or impact is going to be more about how you either displace and move people in cities or you find a way of defending them. And there's a lot of infrastructure that's going to be required. And here I don't mean defending against military threats I'm talking about tsunamis and inundation and flooding and um, you know, a lot more clever thinking going into how we develop our urban areas to sort of preserve drainage areas and the like. Um, but these are these are questions more for you know, the sort of um, COP uh, meeting and, and perhaps less for us at the IMSS, but clearly it touches our lives. And it'd be interesting to see what is discussed in Scotland um, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Harris. We are still a few uh, questions uh, online. It's for Captain Kerry Harris and Rear Admiral Omachi from Mrs. Janet Diah Ekawati, Master Degree Graduate Unhan. The question is, as the pandemic remains eminent in the world, how far will the COVID-19 pandemic measures will be taken into future HADR practices and cooperation? Thank you very much and all the best for these years, IMSS, IMSS from Mrs. Janet. Yes, sir, please. Um, would you like me to go first or the Admiral? Uh, Captain Harris first, please. Okay, uh, I honestly think that Mr. Bebeb is going to have quite a lot to say on this as well, so perhaps we could sort of obtain his views. Um, because this is, uh, it, it's been remarkable really, and depending on how you see the risks of the current pandemic and you know the measures that we're taking and the validity of them, the fact is we're in fairly unusual circumstances. I alluded to it in my presentation in 2020 and 2021, we just couldn't, um, we couldn't really get the same sort of access to make Pacific partnership work in a sort of face-to-face um, -face way, if you like, and do real on the ground stuff with engineers and doctors and the like. We gave a lot of thought into how we could provide um, assistance and aid in terms of medical responses and vaccinations, but clearly each nation as a priority is also addressing its national priority and in vaccinating its own people first and, and then looking at um, within aid or, uh, responses, what it can do for partners and allies and other nations, um, and particularly where you know, it's critical. And as an example, we provided um, oxygen generators to India in recent months, and we're looking at vaccination programs. Um, COVID's been, difficult, but I also would like to sort of again say how remarkable the response was to Typhoon Yasa by Fiji you know, just before Christmas when we we're looking at a Category 5 typhoon approaching and a lot of people potentially affected. Um, they took very effective national measures to sort of take timely evacuation, put people into good shelters and actually um, did say to us, you know, please, please don't come in great numbers and help us because we're more concerned about the COVID aspects to this. And I think the sort of New Zealand Defence Forces and Australians did a great job in, in developing how they could deliver aid in a contactless way. And clearly that's a part of the world in which they have primacy over aid responses as well, along with France. So COVID's had a big impact on us. I like, I'm an optimist, so I like to think we're going to come out of this irrespective of the sort of Delta variant and permutations. And 
how we look at, um, you know, to my mind, the evidence seems to suggest, suggest it's less virulent, even though it's more easily transmitted. And perhaps at some point we'll come up to come to an agreement that we have to learn to live with it, improve our vaccination programs, but effectively, you know, get on with life in the international community and, and renew all the activity that we had before. But it's difficult and it's a charged um, charged discussion point. So that's why I think um, the Admiral and in particular sort of Mr. Bebeb might like to sort of provide their responses. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Amaji, please. Okay, uh, uh, now, uh, uh, I'm talking about the relationship between uh, COVID-19 and uh, HADR. え、日本では、え、災害対処、災害派遣 um, so in, in Japan, uh, in HADL mission, uh, the basic policy is human lives are uh, uh, prioritized. Uh, therefore, um, so uh, not all personnel uh, is not yet uh, vaccinated. Uh, uh, that, uh, that's the current situation. So, uh, uh, repeated, uh, uh, repeatedly speaking, uh, <clears throat> so human lives are uh, 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 prioritized, uh, uh, firstly, so, uh, uh, so we conduct a HADL mission uh, in such manner uh, and the uh, local government uh, that received our HADL uh, uh, so support uh, that recognize uh, that situation. <laughs> so, uh, but on the other hand, uh, talking about the uh, international uh, HADL cooperation, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, talking about the uh, personnel that we send to uh, uh, overseas, uh, uh, basically all of them uh, are vaccinated. Uh, however, um, uh, in an uh, uh, international uh, mission, uh, so there's a uh, consideration uh, in uh, a diplomatic consideration, so uh, there's a, uh, there needs a, a diplomatic uh, coordination uh, with uh, other uh, relevant nations. Uh, this is the uh, answer to this question. Uh, and also, uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, answer uh, to the uh, previous question, uh, additionally, uh, about my three points. えっと、スライドの中で20席のマインスイーパーと書いてありました。この意味は、えっと、延べ20席です。So, uh, I have noticed that uh, in my presentation slides, uh, there's a description that uh, in total, uh, 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 20 minesweepers were sent. Uh, this means uh, in total, uh, 20 minesweepers were sent to them uh, during the operation. The mission then was uh, search and rescue uh, and this, uh, approach to small ports. Uh, and also uh, search and rescue operations uh, by divers. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, One last question from Myanmar Navy. It's okay. Oh, okay, please. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Still to Captain Kerry Harris from uh, Myanmar Navy, Captain Kyo Swarthep. The question is, HADR reverts to unpredictable events, such as an earthquake, a tsunami, a volcano erupting, a plane collapsing, and so on. The United Nations... The United States has the best HADR capability in the Indo-Pacific, and Indonesia has the best among Asian countries. The question is um, about preparing for a high-level HADR alert, and I would like to hear your thoughts and recommendations. Okay, um, another excellent question, actually, from Myanmar, and yeah, the. The US Navy has um, strength in numbers and presence, and hopefully that slide showed that in terms of where our force laydown was. So we have an ability to respond, and, and clearly, you know, we all know US Navy, the United States is that sort of global superpower, so there is a capacity and capability that uh, other nations, like my own, can, can only really sort of aspire to, to match, but it's very um, unlikely we, we will in the near future. Um, as to whether they're the best, we're the best to respond. Um, I'd say the jury's out on that because, uh, not because, you know, I, I just think we all have to look sort of fairly critically at our own organizations. And this isn't a criticism of the US Navy. It's more a way of saying that there are natural disasters that could occur in parts of the world that you instinctively understand and know better than you do. That your own local knowledge, community knowledge, the capacities you have, the, your ability to respond quickly just means that by dint of that, you're the better place to, to work and respond. Now, clearly, the um, US Navy is always going to be keen to help and support. Uh, I talked about the sort of part where one of the three conditions where USAID decides whether they're going to deploy aid is that the third one, it has to be in the interest of the US um, government. Now, there's a lot of cost associated with this, which, which isn't um, recuperable. It's not something we ask for reimbursement for. Um, but I think the American people are not unfamiliar with natural disasters and phenomena in their own territory, be that from the current forest fires, um, type, tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, you know, and they, they, are, they understand, you know, how devastating that can be to communities. And there is an altruism that when you need to go and help your partner nations, you just step up to the plate and you do that with whatever you can spare subject to this filter over um, MITAM, the military task matrix imposed on us by the USAID. So, you know, we, we have scale. We can do large scale. There's no doubt that aircraft carriers and amphibious shipping bring a capacity of their own when you're operating off a coastline that's been devastated by a natural disaster. Clearly, we're never going to prevent those from happening, and particularly when it uh, in the, is in the realm of earthquakes and tsunamis but we need to respond quickly. And I, I you know, I sort of uh, take the accolade that Indonesia is very well prepared. I think that is um, more widely we can interpret as ASEAN um, and the nations involved and other multinational sort of um, partnerships within the region, bring um, cooperation, uh, partnerships, training, exercising together. That means that they in their own turn are uh, well-placed and capable to respond. So I've perhaps ducked some of the issues behind the question, um, but what I don't want you to think is, um, that you th I don't want you to go away thinking that I believe, or anybody in the US Navy believes, that they have a monopoly on humanitarian aid and disaster relief. And, and hopefully my presentation ex expressed that. And I, I talked about the humility one feels and how humbling it can be when you, you encounter other nations and their best practice and what they've done and how they've worked together with their own organizations and authorities. Uh, so it's an international community sort of issue here really and responding well. And I, I think the sort of previous uh, group of speakers addressed this too when they talked about international rules-based system, be that you know UNCLOS or anything that means that we have a certain freedom maneuver and that we have things like uh, VFAs, visiting um, forces uh, agreements, or I think it was a quit in, um, so clearance and approval for Indonesian territory. These are all things that are really important to have, and they come from working together. So we're not going to prevent them, we need to respond quickly, and I think that's the way to do it. Um, and we don't all need to replicate the US Navy to be able to do it well. Good, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we are running out of the time. 
So please uh, give a big applause to all of the speakers. <laughs> so before, before we end uh, this session, I would like to ask uh, every speaker to give a short statement, one minute. Please uh, start from uh, Captain Harris and Admiral Omachi and uh, Mr. Bebe. Please. Well, I, I, I finished as I started and saying what a huge privilege it is to be able to participate in this illustrious International Maritime uh, Security Symposium. I think um, addressing things like humanitarian aid disaster relief operations is hugely important because it's one of those areas that really brings the maritime community together in a, in a positive way. Clearly, we've got many other challenges to address. And I think some of those are being looked at over the course of the symposium, and I'm looking forward to sort of listening into those. And I just want to thank both the organisers, but also those of you who posed questions. Um, they were, you know, I, I did say it was a bit like an intense staff course, the level of thinking that's gone behind them. Uh, and I really appreciate that level of interest and uh, enthusiasm in an important subject. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Captain Harris. Uh, Admiral, please. Very much for uh, thank you very much for having the opportunity to uh, speak at this symposium. First of all, thank you very much. So I mentioned that uh, today uh, three uh, lessons learned uh, from my experience, but more importantly, I think uh, these efforts should be linked uh, in the uh, in the in the Pacific region. The regional cooperation framework uh, for HDR have been formed at various levels, especially in the ASEAN countries. Of course, international organizations such as the Red Cross of our Red Crescent are uh, also playing a greater role than uh, ever before. I think, however, it is true that the international cooperation, such as accepting assistance from uh, foreign countries in the disaster or stricking area, uh, still have difficulty due to difference in the procedure and organizational system or culture. So I believe it is important to promote uh, mutual understanding, uh, remove many constraints, uh, evolve the coordination mechanism at every level, and link the efforts of uh, various actors at home and overseas. Anyway, uh, we are contributing to uh, our peace and stability in the Pacific region. Thank you very much, today. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Bebe, please. Thank you. Um, basically, I just want to underline the context of business of diplomacy itself it's, it's not a new to diplomatic uh, diplomatic creation but it's an act as a as a catalyst for diplomacy um it is trying to explore uh, how and why disaster impact reduction and i think from several questions that i really follow as well as the way how uh, the context of that reduction is through a preparedness is very very useful and very very uh, um uh operation. Uh, in the context of prevention and mitigation, I think the response and, 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 and recovery will be part of it. So to some extent, disaster diplomacy is trying to contribute to peace and security, of which there is no boundary in the way how we should face disaster uh, reduction as well as disaster management. And I think diplomacy is, uh, is, is working together in a family. And I think the way how the symposium is doing today uh, quite uh, relevantly express that the excellent uh, point of Navy is a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bebe. Uh, let me conclude this uh, session uh, to have uh, some uh, underline. First is about the documentation publication about the outlining the respective approach and the strategy for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Domestically, such document would provide guidance for planning and conducting military support to HADR effort. And they will govern the allocation of available military resources of disaster relief effort. For the external audience, such a document would signal states to resolve the contribute of their military asset in the future HADR. They will also serve as a means to show transparency. And because uh, we are working with the civilian, I think work together to increase their respective national and collective institutional infrastructure to ensure future military SADR will be accommodated effectively. So for our Navy, 
I think the HDR series of the naval exercise are need to conduct it with a view to develop interoperability in terms of doctrines, sharing common rules, standard operating procedures, organizational and logistic systems. So, honor guests and ladies and gentlemen, those are to promote understanding and the development of a regional and international naval capacity to sustaining skill through exercise for speedy, responsive and uh, effective uh, SADR. Once again, on behalf of the Indonesian government, but in particular on behalf of the Chief of Indonesian Navy, for the speaker, thank you for sharing experience, lesson, and uh, some important, important issue. And also for the participants, thank you for your question and sharing information. I think uh, that can be as our guidance to conduct SADR in the future more better. I wish you all the very best over the coming day as you deliberate in this symposium. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, moderator and all speakers, for sharing your knowledge. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the second session of the symposium is ended. And may I thank you for your participation in this session. Now, we would like to invite U.S. Defense Attaché, Japan Defense Attaché, on behalf of our speakers, to please take your place on the stage to receive a memento of appreciation. We also invite First Admiral Yudianto and Captain Zelfia to come forward. We respectfully invite the expert staff coordinator to the chief of the Indonesian Navy to hand the mementos of appreciation and certificate. Special for Japanese speaker, the miniature lighthouse and the T-set will be handed directly by Indonesian Defense Attaché for Japan. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seat. Well, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the second session of the symposium is ended. 
And now you are invited to take a break for 20 minutes. The lunch are now served at Pendopo next to the this to this auditorium. And I would like to remind you the third session of the symposium will be at 14. Thank you. A land of myth with ancient temples stretched far and wide as the legacy of historical greatness like the ones found in this 15th century palace of Cherubon. Take the train, let it take you back in time, and enjoy the timeless feel of a magic ride. Here, every tale is expressed by genuine human relationship. by the deft touch and tender care of artistry. The great beauty of Batik has a life of its own in this land. Time-honored values are preserved in body and soul. us wisdom about life and the goat fighting demonstrates the meaning of survival bamboo has a special place in everyone's heart its melody is nothing but an infectious charm the charm that echoes throughout the world the plant is everywhere. It is a part of life. It unites the people with the mother of nature. In a sense, bamboo has become the epitome of harmony. Meanwhile, in the south coast, witness the existence of a sustainable life. A life reserved for the generations to come. In this wonderful hidden paradise, if you love water adventures, you are in heaven. From the ocean up to the river, nothing is off limits. Adrenaline Rush knows no boundaries. 
gives you the moments to live for. Just outside the city, there's a collection of wild animals from all over the world. Social understanding is developed. Trust is established. Intimacy is formed. In the capital, tradition comes in style. Urban festivals frequently grace the streets. Local dishes and international menus are presented. In the warmth and friendly manner, Bandung is known for. Fashion and lifestyle have long been the synonym of the city. It is a shopping nirvana. The lush and beautiful landscape offers only the best of serenity. From the five-star hotel's luxury to the intimate lodge's tranquility. You can always take a journey to the mountain and walk down to the crater. It also has the most extensive botanical garden in the country. It's a perfect choice whenever you want a place of solitude. Your time and effort will be immensely rewarded by the spectacular beauty of West Java.
Bora Buddha and its surrounding is like one spirit that brings serenity, a conquered heaven. Bora Buddha leaves so much meaning to the people around it, true happiness. Look at their faces. In this empty hallway, it's like we are invited to appease ourselves before we see all the collection inside. As one of the biggest art collector in Indonesia, he will astonish you with his painting collection. Here you can get genuine tranquility while tasting delicacy dishes. Did you see a small version of the Borobudur? It's so wonderful! You can pass the time by conversing heart to heart. Enjoy the nightfall. Spawns oneself. Enjoy the motionless solitude. Enjoy the nature. Meditate. Feel the mute of the water. Dancing with your free thoughts. Express your soul. Feel their honorable greeting. One of the reasons why you will want to come back here again someday. A unique story that you can see the chronicle story in chronological order if you walk in a clockwise direction. the center of all the beauty surrounding it. A spiritual experience that's different and you can never find in any other temple on earth. Even coming here dozens of times won't feel enough because of its indescribable beauty. Never change.
mesmerizing getaway. A holy sanctuary. A captivating culture. Sublimely sacred. yet also excitingly profane. The ultimate paradise. A luxurious escapade. Here you have some of the hippest spots on the planet. Release your inhibitions for an adventure of a lifetime. Whether you fancy the beach or golf, Just love food served exotically. Or adrenaline rushes. Enjoy oases of tranquility. Where pampering is art perfected. Mysteriously festive. Tourism. I'm 
Cuman saya gini. Bukan hanya pokoknya kalau kalau pejabat kayak sama si apa si Rui itu Rui dua dua arti itu empat hari itu nongkul apa Cek, satu, dua, tiga. Satu, dua, tiga.
Cek cek Ladies and gentlemen, all participants, we are going to proceed the session. So uh, please be seated. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are going to proceed the station. So please be seated. Thank you. Mohon izin untuk seluruh peserta MSSS untuk menempati posisi karena kita akan melanjutkan sesi berikutnya. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, after we have enjoyed a delightful luncheon, now we come to the third session of the 4th International Maritime Security Symposium 2021. The theme of this session is Building ASEAN Sail Training Organizations and ASEAN Tall Ship Regatta Program. Ladies and gentlemen, in this session will be three presentations and will be presented by First Admiral Haris Bima Bayuseto, the Commander of Maritime Security Task Force of First Fleet Command Indonesia, Ignacio Hornes Amenedo, the Chairman of Sail Training Association España, Spain, Jonathan Cheshire, the Chairman of Sail Training International Group, STIG, UK, 
and Raul Mimbakas, the trustee of STIG. The Honorable Guest, ladies and gentlemen, this session will be guided by moderator, the First Admiral Akmal, Vice Assistant Chief of the Indonesian Navy for Intelligence. And as co-moderator is Commander Luis Nainggolan, the Commanding Officer, Indonesian Warship, KRI Karel Satsuitubun 356. Before we start the presentation, please allow me to read the curriculum vitae of moderator. First, Admiral Akmal became the Vice Assistant Chief of Indonesian Navy for Intelligence since June 2021. He graduated from Naval Academy in class of 1990. Finished his bachelor degree in public administration in 2011. And his military education has been completed with the last course is Defense and Strategic Studies in China in 2019. He's assigned to various strategic positions. He has previously served as Commander of Tahuna Naval Base and Commander of Indonesia Strategic Intelligence Agency in TNI Headquarters. In 2011 to 2014, he served as Naval Attaché for Russia. He also accomplished his duty as Commanding Officer of some Indonesian warships, such as KRI Dewa Ruchi, KRI Multatuli, and KRI Yosudarso. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite First Admiral Akmal and Commander Luis Nainggolan to come to the stage to proceed the session. Sirs, time is yours. Good afternoon, the Honorable Chiefs of Indonesian Navy, Admiral Yudo Margono, all Chiefs staff from all participant countries, all senior officers, distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, all presenters and participants. I would like to welcome you to uh, for the third session of the fourth International Maritime Security Symposium 2021. I am the first Admiral Akmal as your moderator and will be accompanied by Commander Lewis Nainggolan as co-moderator for this session. Let us go to the third session with entitled Building the Asian Cell Training Organization and Asian Tall Ship Regatta Program. This session will consist of three presentations, which are the first, the importance of Asian Cell Training Group, ASTG, as a beacon of international friendship and understanding around the world, bringing contrasting cultures and nations together. Second, Cell Training Association, STA, Espana promotes cell training in Spain for young people and international friendship through tall ships, events, and cell training. And the lastly, Cell Training International Group, STIG, Develop and educate young people. For your remainder, the question and discussion will be at the end of all presentation proceeded and will ask the presenter to answer the question.
Uh, before we start for this session, allow me to invite uh, first presenter uh, to come on the stage, uh, First Admiral Harris Bima Bayuseto. Ladies, gentlemen, and all participants, before we proceed the presentation, let me introduce the, of the first presenters. First presenter is First Admiral Harris Bima Bayuseto SEMSI. He's currently the commander of the C Security Task Force of First Fleet Command of Indonesian Navy and was appointed since April 26, 2021. He was completed a number of military education. He graduated from Indonesian Naval Academy in Surabaya 1994. And the last military education was Indonesian Armed Post Command and, and Staff College in 2009. His number of prominent assignments in staff and command such as Commanders in some of Indonesian naval warship, Sea of KRI of Dewaruchi, the training ship of Indonesian Navy, KRI Sultan Hasanuddin, KRI Ahmad Yani were in the second fleet command. And the last assistant to the commander of second fleet command for the operation and commander of main naval base, Tarakan, in northeast of Kalimantan. Ladies, gentlemen, and all participants, participant, I may call First Admiral Harris Bima Bayuseto SEMSI to deliver his presentation. Thank you, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable Chief of Staff of Indonesian Navy Admiral Yudo Margono, Mr. Chairman, Commandant of Naval Command and Staff College, Rear Admiral Tunggul Suropati. It's my honor to have this opportunity. All distinguished guests, whether in Jakarta or in other places. Good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, and thank you so much for still staying here. I know this is so challenging when you have to deliver a presentation after lunch time, but I promise that I will make it quick, that I will make it quick. Once again, please stay with me. At this session, I will take this chance to deliver a short presentation as a proposal idea to all my colleges with the topic is building essential training group or STG for is hunting Asian Seaman Brotherhood. But before anything else, allow me to introduce myself, a uh, little narcissist maybe. I am First Admiral Haris Bima Bayu Seto, Indonesian Navy. My position as the Commander of Maritime Security Task Force in the First Fleet Command. I've been serving for 27 years in the Indonesian Navy. Command some warship include Dati and became Commanding Officer of Karai Dewaruchi. For beginning of this topic, I try to flashback a little bit into my experiences, whether uh, as a cadet in Naval Academy or when became commanding officer of Karai Dewaruchi. I am involved in many international tall ships, even like Lear Madarong, Opsail, and many regatta events. Many benefits we could took from those events. Beneficial, beneficial results in terms of friendship knowledge and sharing best practices among the tall ship crews around the world. Moreover, the experiences that 
good for the skills of the crew itself. We also had a lot of chance to explore the destination cities, learn about cultures of the local people, socio-economy, the art, maritime infrastructure, and other things that we never knew before. And one thing that was not less important is Port's Simon Brotherhood among us. We meet some Asian tall ship in Europe or American continent. Ironically, we rarely found them in Asia region. And then pop up, pop up a big question, which is become a the fundamental argument of my today presentation. Why don't we have similar activities or even of tall ship in Asia region? Because I do believe that ASEAN region have similar potential as like as other region. The ASEAN people also have similar spirit, same passion together to develop ASEAN land for ASEAN people. And then I realized on one thing as the reason why we could make that sucks akin of even. Because we don't have an organization or group of tall ship in ASEAN region, and I think we need to establish it. So, I step on the next question. Why do we need to establish a tall ship group in Asia? In my personal option said, we need to do so, to do so, because actually, we have potential since some countries in Asia had already tall ship. Let's say Malaysia, Tuna Samudra, India, Taranggini, Indonesia, Bima Suci and Dewaruci, South Korea, uh, Koreana, China, Japan, Kaiumaru, Vietnam, uh, Lekun Yun, uh, Pakistan and Oman with the Sabbat Oman. I think this asset was sufficient enough to begin for establish tall ship group in Asia. By establishing ASEAN tall ship group, it will open the window of opportunity for Asia region to host tall ship events like regatta and others. And we will invite all tall ships around the world to join regatta events in Asia region and explore more than Asia. I also try to put some objective to advocate my argument and also as the fundamental basis in establishing the group. First objective of the Asian tall ship group is enabler to coordinate such a kind of tall ship regatta, maritime festival, and periods in Asian region. Secondly, this group must be able to be facilitator for the info and knowledge sharing among the tall ship operator in Asia region. Then, the third objective, the group shall be promoter to publish or to broadcast the tall ship event in Asia region and to around the world. As the fourth objective, in particular for youth generation, to galvanize of devotion to the tall ship as the word heritage. And the last objective, this group may become as developer of ASEAN future leader by facilitating interaction among the youth people like cadet, trainer, or crews through some fruitful agenda during the tall ship events. Then I will explain a little bit more and specifically its objective as I mentioned it before. The first objective for this group as enabler to coordinate such a kind of tall ship regatta in Asian region. It means that the group as the organizer in regaining, regaining schedule of tall ship event for every one time the event will be implemented. Annually, biennially, or only in some certainly time. 
and then the group will defining the routes of regatta, formulating agendas, and have the concern for all member of group, and appointing who will become the host of the event. The second objective, that the group must also able to become the facilitator for the info and knowledge sharing among the tall ship operator in Asian region. Which are mean that the group shall become as the vessel for info and knowledge sharing, particularly the best practices in operating the tall ships. It also able to provide regularly update information for the tall ship operator, information that may assist in problem solving among the operators. For instance, best practice in handling the tall ship during the bad weather or anything else. The group must able to be promoter, in particular, purpose in handling the tall ship event. It shall work heartily to publish or to broadcast the event in Asia region and to around the world by circulating invitation to the potential participant in the region or to extra region participant. And the group shall be able to give clear information to the potential participant. So they must capable in formulating comprehensively the mechanism for the event, including the time, area, phone, logistic for the tall ship participant, and etc. In particular objective that I think it will be more have beneficial result for youth generation is that the group have capacity to galvanize the devotion of the youth generation to the tall ship and bring the them of the tall ship is one of the world heritage. To meet this, the group shall to facilitate ship store for visitors, especially for the youth. And I think I will be nice when be the group urging agenda to give opportunity for conducting joy selling to the youth people in every destination site in the Asian region during the events. And the last but not least of the object of the group is become the deliverer of Asian future leaders. Again, I like to bring back my experience when I was a cadet and influence the regatta event, that we were so rarely to had Sufis time to interact with other cadet or student. Based on the experience, I will be good if the group to have objective to take part in the floating putter leader in Asian region by facilitating interaction among the youth people, cadet trained on cruise through some fruitful agendas during the tall ship event. To that end, some other method can be adopted as well then I think it's quite feasible, like for instance, cadet testing or open the opportunities to some naval cadet in the region particularly to the navies who not operate the tall ship during the events. On the last point, we need to discuss about organization structures. Maybe we could adopt from other group that I think they are so robust, that I think they work, performance can be seen by the way and I managing some event. And personally, I do agree if we request a mentoring from them as initial step to establish the same group in Asia. And also, not less important, is the funding. I think this is the most crucial matter in operating an organization. And we shall discuss this one, hostility. And if there are any input from our Asian friend and other, we are so pleased to have those and maybe we need some other time to discuss later on. And I think First Admiral Suharto, as the host and also as one of the initiators to establish this group, will arrange it for us. That's all. And if there are any questions or some input for this proposal idea, 
I'm so happy if I could answer it. Or maybe some ecologists for Indonesian Navy participant will have some idea for well. Thank you. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for the admiral. You may be seated. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation, Admiral. I note uh, some points on the presentation uh, as follows. The importance of having the Asian tall ship training since many, many benefits could be taken. Friendship, knowledge, experience, and sharing best practice among the tall ship crews around the world. Second, some ASEAN countries in the region already have tall ship, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, China, Japan, Oman, South Korea, and Vietnam. And last, the ASEAN tall ship training group proposal may adopt the mechanism of other organizations for the example ATG or STIG for comparison. However, there are challenges for discuss such as funding and more. Uh, before we are going to the second presenters, uh, let co moderator will guide for this presenter. Thank you, Admiral. After such an intriguing and interesting first presentation, let us now move on to the second presentation. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, the second speaker for this session is Mr. Ignacio Hornes Amenendo, the president of the Spanish Sailboat Training Association since 2015. From 1998 to 2014, he has been the secretary of the Juan de Langara Association, one of the oldest sail training associations in Spain. He has participated in the organization of all the tall ship races held in Spain since 1990. In 2012, he was awarded the Volunteer of the Year by Sail Training International, and since 2016, he is a member of the Sail Training International racing team, being the first Spaniard to hold this position. As a sailor from a very young age, he has been a sailing instructor and skipper of different types of boats and has been sailing all over Europe. He will deliver a presentation today on how Sail Training Association España promotes sail training in Spain for young people and international friendship through tall ship events and sail training. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. Ignacio Hornes Amenindo to deliver his presentation. Mr. Amenindo, the time is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Hello, selamat datang di presentasi saja. Sorry, but if my Indonesian is not so good. Well, uh, authorities, members of the organization, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the for the opportunity for talking about sail training in Spain in your in your congress. Let me, if I share my screen to uh, show you my presentation. Uh, okay. I ah, know it's not this screen. Sorry. Let me let me a moment, please. Oh, sorry. Ah. Oh, sorry for the. This is the life. Sorry. I am not skilled with this technology. A ver, espera. Ah, well, okay. Okay. Now. Okay. Right. No, right now. No. Could you see my presentation or not? Sorry. 
uh, not at the moment, Mr. Aminendo. We not not. Oh, so sorry. Let me let me try to share the correct presentation. Uh, Well, uh, I tried to, to share, but I tried to speak about sale training in Spain. Uh, we, we are a sale training association. In, oh, so sorry. I am. Mr. Aminendo, sir, if I may suggest, uh, I think the committee have a copy of your slide. Yes, please. Yes, I think it's better. So if I may Sorry ask for, for the IT team to put up yes. the slide of Mr. Aminendo because I think he is having a bit of a technical issue, so he cannot um, put up his presentation. I do believe that we have yes. a copy of the slide. Can we have it up, please? Thank you. So, sir, what will happen is that uh, our IT team will put up your slide and then you can just say next if you want the slide to move forward, sir, because you'll be able to okay. see the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry for, for this inconvenience. Okay. Okay. Uh, please, next. Well, uh, oh, this is the... No, this is not this. this oh, joder, me cago en la puta. No, momento. Okay, sorry, but I don't. I I think that is not the last version because it's in Spanish, not not in English. This is a little nightmare for me. Sorry, uh, because I sent this morning the, the the my presentation. Well, these these words that start my my conference uh, in English is uh, this these words uh, is. Uh, it has been created for the benefit of Zhao to give them a sense of fear, discomfort, and adventure in a time when it's possible to live comf comfortably, safely, and, and boring. This, these words are the founding object of the tall ship races. These uh, words today are very, very uh, common for the young people, this very real uh, situation. They live comfortably, safely, and boringly. And through the sale training, we are trained or change this this situation. Uh, okay, I have to find the way to. Wait, let me let me next, please. Uh, this, this. Okay, next, please. Uh, it's an animated uh, presentation because you need to push the buttons. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, our history starts in with the first tall ship races, but as a National Trade Training Association starts in 2002, because in the in the first uh, in the first time. We uh, Spanish Navy use the this uh, sorry uh, assume this this organization in Spain. We start as national sail training in in 2002, but uh, in first uh, our first participation or our first activity in Spain was in 1958 with the first tall ship race in Spain. Oh, please, we are a, a national association. We include federations, association, sport clubs, sailors, and public administration, and some people that promote uh, individual uh, sail training. Please, next. Our goals, goals uh, as not as a non-profit objective, is the promotion of navigation and sailing, and sailing ships as the way for the development of the individual, the learning and the teaching for nautical and maritime culture. 
we are uh, based in four uh, values. One of them is the maritime education, working with the universities and some the schools. Maritime and culture and heritage, working closer with uh, museums and organizations that promote the culture uh, of sea and the Spanish culture. Uh, participation with the host sport, as later we can see, in the events, uh, uh, giving the organization support in the organization and uh, with the trainees and the young people, and making youth exchange with other, with other countries. Because uh, every year we, uh, <coughs> we make activities with other national safe training associations in Europe, sharing experience and uh, young people and projects uh, and searching fund and funding uh, with the European uh, bonds. <coughs> Our activity, oh, please, next. Uh, okay. In this uh, slide, you can see the, the, the most important ports in Spain that in, in which uh, we um, work. And this is the dates of soil training activities. The last toll ship race is in 2002, was postponed by uh, the COVID pandemic, pandemic. But we are working in the next year in, in, other, in other activities and other, in other races. We are, work, we are working closer with the John in the last 19 years, uh, work, uh, sending two, more than 2,000 young people to the toll ships and the, and the races, plus 50 activities and in 19 European projects. One of our goals is funding, uh, searching funding for these activities for uh, help the young people to go to, to the sail training activities and for the ships. Oh, please, next. This is the one, well, okay, another one because there are some activities. This is the most important activities in the last years. Here, uh, we have uh, another of on one festival del mar in Santander in 2019, and a small, a sailing route in, in Galicia, in the north of Spain, closer to Coruña and Vigo. And, uh, okay, for the last two years, 2020 and 2021, we stopped this, our activities, as you know, uh, about COVID. Oh, please, next. Oh, it is... <coughs> this is a, a sample of, uh, of the crew that we sent to to toll ship races activities, young people, and to improve his skills, his knowledge, uh, friendship, and, and abilities in, in seamanship. Please, next. Our challenges for the next years is uh, identify what young people think today. It's very important now that they think about, uh, about the life, and what they want, what are his motivated them, and what they believe. Our challenge here is to offer a new and extraordinary, uh, and extraordinary challenges for these for this young people. Because uh, for us, in our experience, the most uh, gap in, in, for the young people is the excess of consumed technology. They consume a lot of technology, but they don't consume life. It's more, we move away from it and create a barrier dividing the virtual from the real things. And, the, and this is where the sales training has to work to offer to our young people values that are very deal with in the, in the networks. I think there is a task for all of us and it's our responsibility to give another opportunity to the young people. Please, next. And, uh, for, and for the last, we work with, uh, uh, for work in this area, in, in Sail Training Association, we have a youth, uh, youth Council 
uh, that uh, we are uh, young people who participate in our activities, joined to the Council. Uh, it was created in 2009, in, in which young people are, we are trying to involve young, or young people in our activities, sharing our objectives and working for the future of sail training. And at last, uh, are our representatives in this international sale country, international youth country. Sorry. Next, please. And this is uh, for 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 the end of me of of my presentation. I think that the, in the last seven, seven five years, there are not a lot of change in our. Uh, youth people. We found the same problem that we could read in the first word that uh, I use in my uh, introduce this presentation. And uh, please, uh, next. And uh, I, <coughs> I talk about uh, our challenges is promote the, navig the navigation activities uh, found Founding resource because no, uh, sailing is not cheap. There we are uh, a, a lot of problems about about funding because the maintenance of the ships and the organization of the ships is is a little bit uh, expensive. And from our association, we try to uh, decrease the the budget of the activities for give the opportunity of all of young people to participate in in these events please next and terima uh, kasih salam hormat and thank you very much for this opportunity and sorry for for the problems with my presentation thank you very much thank you very much mr amenendo a warm round of applause please for mr amenendo thank you very much sir for a very interesting presentation how you have brought up the long history of the sail training association in spain what are the goals and values of the organization but i think what is most interesting is that how your explanation connects with the first speaker about how you are organizing and working together with other associations and trying to tackle challenges including lack of interest, how young people today, as you said earlier, are being consumed by technology and being taken away from real life. I believe that uh, the first speaker already take up these issues and you have caught up with it. So I believe that the next speaker would be more enlightening on this topic. So I would like to hand over to our moderator to introduce our third speaker. Admiral. Okay, thank you, uh, Commander Lewis. Uh, in the last presentation, uh, we have two uh, presenters. Uh, the first is uh, Jonathan Chisayar, and the second, Commander Retired Mimbachas. Uh, before they proceed uh, his presentation, I would like to to read uh, his biography. Jonathan Chesayer, a chairman of Sail Training International, is a leading social entrepreneur and developer of charities with expertise in employment and training, outdoor education, and young people's issues. He has started and led several charities addressing homelessness employability and disadvantaged youth. He was national director of Ocean Yacht Club, at the time Europe's largest sailing training organization. He was a trustee of Association of Sail Training Organization until 2018. He was won a number of awards for his work on employability and social enterprise. A keen sailor and oarsman, he wrote for England in 1969 and sailed across the Pacific Ocean in 1978. He is married with uh, two adult children. And the second, I will 
let me know. Uh, Commander Retired Raul Mimbachas, Oriental Republic of Uruguay Navy Retired Naval Officer living in Spain for 25 years, member of Board of Trustee of Sail Training International and Director of Tall Ship Races International Limited, a subsidiary a company of Sail Training International that manages the cell training races organized by the charity. Member of the STI work, working group for the relation with military vessels and responsible for relation with the Latin American NAPIs. Chief of the deck, navigator and executive officer of Uruguayan cell training vessel, ROU Capitan Miranda. He lived in Spain, married with blessed three children. Ladies, gentlemen, and all participants, I may call Jonathan Cesar to deliver his presentation and maybe will be continued by Commander Retired Mimbachas. Jonathan, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. <coughs> um, as, uh, as you mentioned, I'm <coughs> Jonathan Cheshire, the chairman of Sail Trading International, and Raoul, who's following me, is a, a co-trustee and a, uh, sorry, just sharing my screen here, um, and a, uh, a director of the company, our subsidiary company that organizes the events. <clears throat> So, um, STI is a non-profit organization. We're registered as a charity in the United Kingdom. We have about 30 member organizations. Um, the, uh, the Spanish Sail Training Association is one of them. For, you, heard from, you heard from Ignacio just now. And there are about 30 others spread around the world, though at the moment, the majority of them are either in Europe or North America. We have one or two members in the Southern Hemisphere, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, <clears throat> we work with the South American countries, which Raoul will talk about. We have other members uh, in the process of joining. Japan is, uh, is uh, joining us shortly. And we're very keen to spread the membership uh, further around the world, particularly in Asia. So I'm particularly pleased to be talking to you today. Our purpose, like most sail training organizations, is the personal and social development of young people. So improving their confidence, their responsibility, their teamwork, their communication skills. And an equally important aim is the promotion of international friendship and understanding. We do this <clears throat> through organizing large international events, our races and regattas for sail training tour ships. And we organize those events all around the world. Uh, Raoul will tell you more about that. We were due to have an event in, uh, in Asia this year, but had to cancel it, unfortunately, because of the uh, coronavirus. On top of that, we provide direct financial support to young people we run conferences and seminars for sail training vessels, sail training operators. We uh, <clears throat> issue publications, we do research into sail training, and we provide a range of other services to sail training operators. And I'll deal with these in a bit more detail uh, in a couple of slides. It may interest you to know that in 2007, the Norwegian parliament nominated STI for the Nobel Peace Prize because of our long history of work promoting international uh, friendship and understanding. Um, a brief word about how we organize ourselves. This may be of interest to you if you're setting up your own organization. Um, our members uh, own the, the charity, uh, the, those are the members I mentioned earlier, the 30 uh, national organizations. They elect the trustees who are the governing body of the charity and the group. <clears throat> we also have an international council which is made up of our members plus a number of uh, significant 
partners that we work with around the world. And then the trustees manage, um, first of all, the subsidiary company, Tall Ships Races International, which is the company that organizes all our events. And that company employs our staff. Alongside that, we have uh, a youth council, which is made up of uh, about 20 young people under the age of 25. And they run their own program, they run their own conferences, they organise a very successful conference uh, earlier this year with about 400 delegates from around the world um, by Zoom. Um, and that's very, they're very important to us in letting us know what young people are thinking, what their issues are, and how we could improve our events and our other practices to benefit young people. Then we have our Ships Council, which is a gathering of all of the operators of, of tall ships and other sail training vessels around the world. And that meets regularly to discuss operational issues, uh, safety, uh, safeguarding young people and improving uh, practice. So a little bit about <coughs> financing. I, I noticed the first uh, presentation um, this morning was talking about how an, a group might be financed. Um, for STI, our main source of income is fees paid to us by the host ports who host our events. So we operate a little bit like the Olympic Games. Um, ports bid to us about four or five years ahead uh, for, the, <coughs> for the chance to host our events. And they have to provide, uh, our contract uh, asks them to provide a large number of facilities for the ships and, and activities for the young people when they're in port. And they then also pay us a fee to cover our costs for organizing and running the event. Then for some of our events, we, have, we get commercial sponsorship because the events are a wonderful opportunity for publicizing uh, companies uh, or countries. Uh, our main sponsor at the moment is uh, a large Russian shipping company, and they are the company that sponsored, are sponsoring the race we're running in the Sea of Japan, from Korea to Japan to uh, Vladivostok, which should have happened this year, but uh, we hope it will happen next year or 23. And finally, we get a number of purely charitable donations and grants from uh, foundations. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about a very generous donation that we get from the Royal Navy of Oman. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So the Tall Ships races started in 1956. <clears throat> and they were originally the first event uh, was started because there were a number of enthusiasts around the world who could see that commercial sail training, sort of commercial sailing ships were on the decline. And they wanted to have one last big gathering of the ships that still remained to celebrate them um, before, as, as people thought, they might all start to disappear. In fact, that was so successful that uh, it was repeated next year and it's happened every year since then, apart from last year and this year because of the uh, coronavirus. Um, so today our events, they vary a lot in different sizes and different numbers of ports and different numbers of ships, but uh, normally the main summer race is uh, we'll have around between five and 10,000 uh, people participating. And of those 50% must be under 25. That's, that's um, one of the rules for entering the races. And again, it varies, but we get anywhere between 60 and 120 vessels uh, from up to 30 countries participating. One of the most um, notable features of the events are the numbers of visitors that come to see the ships when they're in port. And this is why uh, companies want to sponsor us because it's a wonderful opportunity for promoting their brand. Um, and uh, it's also a great platform for national ships to promote their own country. 
So our best year for visitor numbers was 2017 when we ran three different events and we had a total of 8.6 million visitors came to see the ships in port. Our single biggest port is, uh, was Szczecin in Poland in that year. And that single city had 3.5 million visitors over four days. On top of the events, we organize uh, a, an international conference every year uh, with about three to 400 delegates. <clears throat> and uh, the delegates come from ports that are interested in working with us, sail training operators, and other organizations uh, that, are, uh, that work with us. We then run specific seminars for particular groups. So the Tall Ships Forum, which I mentioned earlier, um, it's, uh, that, that gets together regularly to discuss technical issues. And we have a, a seminar every year to help host ports and give them advice and, uh, on how to run an event in port and uh, to, for them to exchange ideas between themselves. Our other activity is to provide bursaries financial support for young people who can't afford or couldn't otherwise afford to take part in our events. And those are main, we have two main event, uh, of those at the moment. We have um, a, a bursary provided by the Burnett family to help people with disabilities participate in, in a sail training vessel. And the one that's been longest running and is most generous to us is the uh, Sultanate of Oman scheme, which is funded by the Royal Navy of Oman. And they've been supporting us for 10 years now. Every year, they provide a large amount of money to help young people uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds join in the activities. Um, the other way we support uh, cell training is we provide project, we find funding for projects where operators want to maybe experiment a little bit with running a voyage a different way, or want to uh, reach out to a particular group of young people who, uh, who might not otherwise hear about cell training. And that's funded by the Youth Development Fund, uh, <clears throat> which is an international fund that we, we administer. Uh, and we also have one that's dedicated to Canadian young people, which is funded uh, from the uh, surplus we made from the uh, 2017 rendezvous event. Then we also fund research projects to look at how sail training works, what, what um, the best way of running it, what sort of outcomes you get from sail training, the impact on young people, how it improves their lives. And we're, we're hoping to expand that activity to demonstrate exactly what the benefits of sail training are. Okay, that's my bit. Um, I'm now gonna hand you over to Commander Mimbakas, who will talk about our future plans and our work uh, with military ships in particular. Well, thank you, thank, thank you, you Jonathan. Jonathan. Uh, let me share the, the screen first. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in Cell Training International, we usually develop um, a lot of activities in order to, to achieve our goals. But the most important activity is to organize the tall ship races. Uh, we organize two kinds of races, the tall ship races and the regattas. Uh, the tall ship races are setting up in summer, matching with the young people holiday period and it's the one with more vessels, more ports, and more trainees. And we have a rule in that uh, tall ships race that is that uh, the 50% of the crew has to be uh, between 15 and 25 years. And the regattas that are in autumn or spring, they don't have a defined uh, period of time uh, between them because uh, it's depending on the financing uh, we can get, get from them. Uh, this year, and from 2020 and this year, uh, due, to, due to the COVID situation, we were forced in agreement with the ports involved 
to take some actions that uh, have led us to the postponement or cancellation uh, of our races in 2020 and in 2021. Uh, sorry. The, um, this year, uh, for 2021, we had planned to run the, 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 the tall ships race in, in the Baltic, between the ports of uh, Lithuania and Kalaipedia, um, Turku in Finland, Tallinn, Estonia, Marienheim, and Poland, in, in, Chechen, in the port of Chechen in Poland. Uh, and after that race, uh, the Tots Race 2020, Magallanes Elcano, that we had already postponed from 2020 to 2021 within the ports of um, uh, Falmouth, A Coruña, Lisbon, and Cadiz, in the three ports in the Iberian Peninsula. Unfortunately, in, in agreement with the ports, we had to cancel the Baltic race and to postpone again the Iberian Peninsula race and the the Magallanes Ricano race we carried out uh, will be carried out in 22 or, or, or 23. For this year, we have also planned uh, a regatta called Subcon Flood White Sails of Peace, coinciding with the Eastern Economic Forum and sponsored by Subcon Flood. Subcon Flood is uh, one of the world's leading energy shipping company, and the regatta. Uh, was planned to be between the ports of Yoesu in South Korea, Nanao in Japan, and Vladivostok in Russia. But we have to postpone it as well. So, hopefully, in 2022, uh, we have the next Tolchit race in the north, in the, in the North Sea, between the ports of Exer in Denmark, Harlingen in the Netherlands, Antwerp in Belgium, uh, Albor in, in Denmark as well. In 2023, in the torchy race between the ports of uh, Den Helder in the Netherlands, Hartlepool in the United Kingdom, Frederikstad in Norway, and Lerwick in the Shetland Island. And in 2024, we'll be back in the Baltic again, uh, where we already have seven, eight candidates, ports, uh, some of them, the same ports of the 2021 Tonsil race, and the plan is to have a regatta in the Mediterranean as well, uh, if, if we, we get uh, some ports to do it. All these events have a fantastic media coverage at local, national, and international level. Uh, Navy tall ships especially can benefit from media coverage since sometimes are interested in highlight their presence in certain ports and we can collaborate with them. In fact, we, we, we collaborate with them in, in, the, in highlight their presence in the ports. Uh, we have our, our own media and marketing people and also we usually work with local media agencies because they have the market knowledge in, in, in the area. The relationship with the military vessels is strategic for us. And, and because of that, we, we create a um, military vessel recruitment working group. And depending on the circumstances, uh, we organize a specific action for this kind of vessels. For example, a, a couple of years ago, we organized a seminar for Latin American Navy tall ships in Valparaiso, Chile, uh, with the collaboration of the Chilean Navy. And taking advantage, um, and was taking advantage of that advantage that the Latin American navies were running a, a race uh, around South America called um, Velas Latin Americanas, Latin American sales. But what's really interesting about this seminar, this kind of seminars and relationship with the navies. Uh, besides exchanging experiences and knowledge, uh, was that uh, we, a civil, a civil organization, 
and the representatives of uh, the different Latin American navies, were, we were talking about, uh, we were talking the same language regarding the skills we pretend to develop in young people, some of them civilians and the other young future Navy officers. Uh, one of the advantages that uh, the vessels have, have in our ports is uh, that the ports are re required to give service free of charge to the participant vessels, such as pilot, tax, berthing, water, waste disposal, liaison office system, a cruise center, and extensive uh, crew activity program, cultural, sporting, and military vessels uh, don't have to pay um, an entry fee. Uh, now, uh, I promise it will be very short. It's a, a promotional video that uh, where some of the activities that the trainees do on board are highlighted. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, here you have our uh, personal details from Jonathan and myself. Uh, if you need something, you want something, you, you, you need uh, some information, please don't hesitate to contact us by mail, mobile, uh, WhatsApp, uh, whatever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presenters, uh, Mr. Jonathan Cesar and Commander Retired Min Bajas. Uh, from your presentation, I note some points on the presentation as follows. The purpose and philosophy is development and education of young people and promotion of international friendship and understanding. STA was nominated for Nobel Office Prize in 2007 for value of work in promoting international understanding and friendship. Uh, around 5,000 to 10,000 particip participants crew, 60 to 120 parcels from up to 30 countries every year. Financial assistance for disadvantaged young people to gain cell training experience. Some of uh, Tulsi prices uh, for the next year. And now we are coming to the uh, next session. Question and answer question. Uh, please, uh, Commander Luis will be guided for the question and answer. Thank you, Admiral. Um, a warm round of applause for our moderator and our speakers. Thank you very much, our speakers, for giving us three consecutive very interesting presentations on cell training and the idea of forming a cell training organization in Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, participating both here in SESCOAL and those participating online, we are now opening a question and answer or a discussion session, both for you here with us and those of you who are online. For those of you who are here, I would like to invite you just to raise your hand, state your identity and your affiliation, and just deliver your question. If you would like to go for a certain speaker, then you may, and thank you. I noticed one, two, three uh, questioner, if you may, sir. For those of you online, please type in your question into the chat room. 
So I would like to invite um, the gentleman, the captain from the back of the room, sir. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. And then we will have next Captain Bambang Darmawan and Captain Salim waiting up. So, sir, uh, please. Thank you. Um, it's me again, uh, Captain Arif Badrudin. Uh, I'm a big fan of sailing vessels and all the adventures carried along with it. Um, ocean adventures like uh, Zheng He, Magellan, uh, Captain James Cook, and Joshua Slocum, um, and the modern, uh, modern ocean explorer like Brian Troutman with his wife Karin and his um, child Nuggets. Uh, they gave us a clear message that uh, sailing vessels and its ocean adventure is not only expanding our horizon, but also strengthening our humanity. So I'm not going to ask a question, just a suggestion to all the gentlemen that uh, it is important for us to keep this ocean adventure alive. And, there's four, and therefore, we need to uh, strengthen the knowledge, skill, and uh, experiences of our sailors and uh, fishing vessels crew by establishing uh, probably something like circumnavigator school. We don't have one yet here in Indonesia, so I suggest we can have one. And having instructors from uh, real skippers who have traveled a thousand of miles from their homes and when they are around, we invite them for giving us first-hand lectures on what it really likes at sea. So by having a circumnavigator school, we will uh, strengthen the bond between sailors and also our very existence as human. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask for a warm applause for Captain Arif Badrudin. Thank you very much, sir. So Captain Badrudin was uh, offering a suggestion to our speakers on the importance to keep the sailing skill and sailing tradition alive for all the benefits that it brings. Uh, to that end, Captain Badrudin is suggesting to establish a navigator school with the ultimate aim of a circumnavigation and inviting instructors of consisting of those skippers who were real life sailors to share their skills and experience. So I will be offering the opportunity for our speakers, uh, First Admiral Haris Bima, Mr. Amenendo, or Mr. Chesser uh, and Commander Mimbakas, if any of you would like to respond to the suggestion coming from Captain Badrudin. Uh, to the speakers, please. So, first Admiral Haris Bima, please, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Captain Arif Badudin. Yeah, I am uh, to agree, and your uh, offering to experience and keep it important thing sailing around the world with uh, young people, offering the circle. Circular, uh, circumstances, navigation, and another. My idea in Asian region, we have a traditional route like uh, Indonesian rempah, rempah traditional route in Indonesia. Space, space. Uh, we can arrange the Asian tall ship. I think it's just Indonesia. But we can offering the tall ship another country to come to Indonesia and uh, try to road Indonesia. After that, we can expand uh, to another country, maybe around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral, for your response. Before uh, I continue with other uh, questions, do Mr. Amenendo or Mr. Chesser or Commander Mimbakas, do you have any response to the suggestion from Captain Arif Badrudin? If not, sir, I would like to invite the question from Captain Bambang Darmawan from the center of the floor. Please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Captain Bambang Darmawan. 
I have some also some suggestions actually. Uh, we know that we already had uh, this kind of phrase, Toshi phrase, in 1995. That we know that the name is uh, Arung Samudra 95. And now it's almost 26 years that we don't have uh, the same activities again. One of the reasons it may that, like uh, all the speakers said, the funding. Yes, to conduct this kind of event, we know that we will need a very a lot of resources, including funding to conduct. Uh, also, the facilities like port. Not all the ports that in Indonesia can handle, can accommodate when all the toll ships came to Indonesia. Like the last event, we should uh, give the ships to berth in vicinity area, not to uh, berth in our ports. That's why the funding has become the major problem to conduct this kind of event. So we also think that sometimes it's cheaper to send our ships to join to the uh, kind, this kind of event to uh, abroad to uh, promote our culture. It will be easier and uh, cheaper. And then for this, I have a idea, like a. To conduct, uh, like uh, the, the the first speaker said, that uh, form the Asian Asian Sail Toship Group. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of we conduct it, conduct it, uh, 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 it for one uh, country uh, by one uh, itself, we may join as as, as Asian, including Australia to host this kind of event, not only Indonesia. So, for example, from Jakarta to Singapore, Singapore to Bangkok, Bangkok to... So we, we join and uh, fund this kind of event together. It will be easier, it will be cheaper, and then also uh, uh, it's, 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 it's more uh, easier for us rather than we conduct it by ourselves. And then the other problem is also uh, the schedule. If we conduct this event in Asia, it looks like we compete with our, with our friend in America and Europe because we know they also uh, conduct this event regularly almost every year. So we, might, we, may, we may find the difficulties to find the, the right schedule to conduct this. So rather than bring our own uh, activities by ourselves to compete with our friend in other uh, continents. Why don't we bring all the activities to, to Asia? So we work, uh, like I, uh, in, the, in the other word, we work with them, not uh, uh, conducted by ourselves, but we work with them and bring all of them to come to Asia and also to fund this. Uh, event together. So the schedule, the funding, it will be uh, could be uh, uh, paid together. So it will be easier for us. Maybe just for the suggestion, uh, I would like to hear the, the opinion from uh, from the all the panelists regarding this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Bambang Darmawan, for a very interesting idea. And a round of applause, please, for the questioner. Captain Bambang Darmawan brought up the idea that to view, in view of the challenges to hold such big Tolsi Purgata, um, he mentioned about limited funding, limited number of ports with uh, sufficient facility. Uh, Captain Bambang, I believe, uh, suggested that the regional country will work together and uh, host or co-host a, a tall ship training, sir, right? And instead of competing in time with similar events being held at other continents, that we can arrange such as that people uh, com completing 
similar events in other places can come together to Asia and join the events that is being co-sponsored or being joined uh, by the regional countries. He mentioned Asia, Australia, and other regional countries. So I think this is a very interesting idea. I don't know whether it's new or not. So I would like to first invite, uh, I believe, uh, Admiral Bima should close up, but we can ask for Mr. Chesser. I believe that you, will, you should have some insight on this, sir. Uh, Mr. Chesser, if you will, sir. Yes, no, I, I think we would welcome the idea and we would certainly very much like to uh, be involved ourselves. Um, as as we as Raoul said, we are already we have already organised one event uh, in East Asia um, a couple of years ago. Um, the the main issue, your second uh, questioner mentioned funding. The problem uh, we have is attracting the ships to travel long distances to events. So. I think with the naval and military ships, it's less of a problem because the, the navies either want to go or they don't, <laughs> and uh, they can get there themselves. If you wanted a larger fleet of the, either the commercial ships or the, the, charity, the, the ones run by non-profits, which is the majority of the ships uh, in Europe and North America, then <clears throat> what we found is we have to uh, get a sponsor to pay some of their expenses to get there. But if, if, there is, if there's sufficient sponsorship, then we can do it and we've done it before and we'd be very happy to do it again. We are um, hoping to move to, to run the postponed uh, white sails of peace regatta, the one that should have happened this year. We're hoping to run that again, uh, well, run it either next year or possibly in 2023. And one of the ideas we've already been discussing is whether we could organize a feeder race from uh, somewhere like Indonesia or Malaysia or, or um, somewhere in that part of the world. Uh, we could organize a feeder race up to uh, Iosu, which is, will be the start port for the White Sails of Peace regatta. So that would be one way of doing it, uh, which would possibly be slightly uh, cheaper because this other event will already be happening. So we'd be very interested in hearing from any vessels, any navies uh, that would be interested in joining us for that. And if apart from that, if you wanted us to help you organize an event, then we have obviously, we have a lot of history in how to organize the events, how to we have rating systems uh, for um, allowing vessels to race against each other on equal terms. We have a sort of handicapping system, uh, which we can, uh, we can work with you on. Yeah, that was it, ready? Thank you very much, Mr. Chesire. Um, thank you very much for your response, highlighting the possibility as well as your willingness to help up with organizing based on your previous experiences in organizing similar events. So let us go to our first panelist, Mr. Bima, and let us see how he would like to respond to the idea from Captain Bambang Darmawan, sir. Thank you, moderator. I am very uh, happy uh, about your idea, Captain Bambang. Uh, is, uh, your idea can be first step to building the Asian Selling Training Group. Because, yeah, we know uh, funding is a problem, a big problem for uh, Asian countries, I think. Uh, problem, uh, second problem is not uh, Asian countries have a tall ship. I think like uh, Kaiwomaru maybe can shelling. Tarangini, I know, maybe canceling because uh, last time I joined the official in America, just Indonesia sends tall ship, not another Asian countries uh, send uh, tall ship. Yeah, I agree with uh, your opinion. First step to building Asian 
cell training group is a work together with a current organization and offering with the organization to come Indonesia, to come Indonesia or to come another Asian countries, make uh, events, make uh, parades, and second step, we can uh, learning for, from STG or ST to building Asian training group. But uh, this is uh, more time to discuss. We need more time to discuss uh, to building Asian training group. Thank you. Thank you very much, First Admiral Bima, who see that uh, Captain Bambang Darmawan's idea can be a first step before creating an, an Asian sail training group or sail training institute uh, that Asia can actually start by hosting events, uh, co-hosting with regional countries, while still being realistic enough to highlight that the challenges remains uh, the limited assets that are available in Asia, funding as always, before the idea of creating an Asian sail training group can be realized. Much to think about, but opportunities abound. So finally, I would like to invite Captain Salim for his question. Thank you very much. I'm Captain Salim from Indonesian Navy. My question for first president of Spanish sail training, Spana, Senor uh, Ignacio, and the second for the Chairman of Sail Training International, Mr. Jonathan. Everybody knows that it is important to exercise, keep fit, and be healthy. Many people choose a sport to keep themselves activity like rugby, tennis, football, or soccer, swimmer, or many other that out of there. But here, <laughs> at Live Style Die, we know something that many other people don't know, that the best sport by landsliding is sailing. But on the other hand, place in the world, sailing is one of sport that less people like and there is small number of federation and yacht club. My question is, what is the spin effort and sail training international group effort to the young people to love or like this kind of sport? Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain. A question for our panelist from Spain, Mr. Amenendo, and our panelist from uh, the UK, Mr. Chesser. Uh, basically, same question. How do you raise interest from the young generation into sailing? How do you actually attract them to sail? Uh, did I get correctly, Captain? Thank you. So um, I would like to invite Mr. Amenendo first to respond. Sir, please. Okay. Uh, well, uh, with the young people, we have a, a great challenger because, uh, in my opinion, some people are, or the, the young people today, is not very interested in the sports in general. And not, not only for sail training activities or sailing activities or marine activities. Uh, <clears throat> we are losing a, a battle against technology, as I told uh, in, in my presentation. I think that the, the, the best way to, to improve the young people interest in, 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 in the sail training activities starts in, in, the, in the ports, in the yacht clubs, and, 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 and it's very important, the full collaboration of the public administrations. <coughs> because uh, the public administration has the power to to <coughs> oh sorry to to move his uh, capa capabilities uh, for uh, for create these uh, opportunities in the in the coast or in the clubs or in the ports and uh, <coughs> the the best way for 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 us is understand what is the, the what is the things the people, uh, the young people uh, needs for, for, for this. And uh, I think that uh, each country needs, know, uh, needs to know who, who his, his young people uh, think. And uh, it's not, it's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. In, in our country, uh, we support 
uh, small activities and uh, the clubs and, and another another um, organization uh, about uh, about this no about, about these questions and universities for is a, a good a good place for 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 work in this in this way no because they are closer with the young people but but it's a it's a it's a challenge. It's, it's a it's a it's a good challenge, and it it not uh, it not has a, a a easy answer for for this for this question. But I think this is our responsibility is work for for give uh, the opportunity to the young people. But uh, for in my opinion, technology is uh, uh, a very <coughs> complicated uh, scenario. To, to fight again the, against against it oh, I think uh, I don't know if I my answer is completely for for your question but I, I is my opinion about about this thank you very much mr Amenindo for your answer your insight how technology is the greatest challenger for us to grab the interest of the younger generation to to sport and sail training. I would like to offer the opportunity to Mr. Chesser or Commander Mimbachas if you have any insight into the question. Please, sir. Um, yes, I think um, what we find in Europe is that there's a, there's a fair amount of interest amongst young people from more prosperous backgrounds. Um, so they may come through yacht clubs or through schools uh, or, their, or, through, or through parents. I think where we've been doing a lot of work the last few years with our youth development funds that I mentioned is encouraging sail training operators to promote the activity to groups of young people that wouldn't normally think of uh, going on a sailing ship. So. <clears throat> the best way to do that, in my experience, is to work with uh, schools maybe in more deprived areas or with uh, social workers or youth workers. Um, you really need to get to the young people through what we call gatekeepers, people who are already working with the young people that would benefit the most from the experience. And that approach is uh, has been very successful in one or two um, instances and we have some uh, reports back from those projects uh, which uh, we will be putting on our website before too long just to give uh, sail training operators more ideas as to how to how to attract young people. I do agree about the technology issue I think that's a um, very uh, a huge distraction for young people um, on certainly on a lot of the UK uh, sail training ships, they um, they take the the phones away from young people when they come on board, and they allow them to use them at specific times during the voyage, but they can't have them with them all the time. Um, and um, well, actually, one of the problems we've had, uh, a couple of operators have had, if young people keep their phones, is that if there's uh, an incident that any, any experienced sailor would, would be perfectly comfortable with, an inexperienced young people may get into a panic uh, about the, the, the ship heeling over or something like that, and then start texting people saying, how exciting the ship's sinking. <laughs> and we won't get to hear about it until afterwards. So, it, it, and if there's a serious incident, there's a problem managing uh, communications because uh, the, the, if the young people have got their phones, then people on shore will be hearing about it before uh, the operator has time to manage the incident and, and manage communications. So that is a big issue. I think the only other thing that we've, I think everyone has noticed in the last few years is the interest that young people have in the environment, in uh, preserving the oceans and, and saving the planet in the context of the climate uh, crisis. Uh, and so I think sailing ships are a wonderful way of communicating the uh, lessons about the planet uh, and about the oceans. So I think that's another way of, of selling the idea to young people. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chesser. Uh, Commander Mimbakas, do you have anything to add, sir? Um, yes, I have to agree with both, with Jonathan and, and, and Ignacio. Um, I, I think the key, the key issue is to, to try to go to school, to the yacht clubs and to the, uh, I don't know, where, where the young people can um, join and explain what are we doing, why are we doing, and I think in, in, in Spain and in, in my opinion, uh, um, we, we have very good results. For example, in, we, have a, a, we have gone to several schools, we have gone to youth groups, and uh, once you explain, it has to be attractive for them <laughs> because we are, we are dealing with teenagers. But uh, once you explain that and try to convince them the, the benefit of, of and the fun that we can that they can have uh, sailing, um, perhaps you can get from each talk three, four, five uh, trainees that for a, for a um, country uh, of uh, um, um, uh, from Spain is a very good uh, figure because we don't have any tradition of sail training. But the key, the key issue is to try to convince them, to talk with them and, and, and try to show what we are doing and why we are doing. Thank you very much, Commander. I believe that there are still questions lingering in the audience, but nonetheless, we have the time limiting us. So I would like us to show our appreciation to the speakers to the questions and to the panelists for their answers. Let's show uh, a round of applause for everyone. <laughs> Distinguished audience, before we continue with our session, I would like to return the time to our moderator for his concluding remarks. Admiral. Thank you, Commander Lewis. Uh, before we are coming to the end of this session, I, I would like to invite all uh, presenters uh, to give the short statement before we are coming to conclude uh, the session. Uh, please, from the first speaker, Times. Thank you. Uh, according the, to the Times, International Maritime Security Cooperation and Peace and Property. I think every emerging conflict among the states actually can be resolved peacefully without showing power by one to other party in region. By establishing a training group in Asian region can be considered as one or a new approach in solving a conflict as long as every state is able to put mutual respect and mutual trust as fundamental in basis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, First Admiral Bima. Uh, the second presenter, Mr. Ignacio Honnes Amenendo, would you like would you like to give a short statement? Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity and um, for final words. I think that the. Uh, uh, as I told, uh, our responsibility is work with the young people and to try to attract it is to for the for the sail training because the sail training is a, a great opportunity for the for the <clears throat> for the world for our countries because it's the future and is the a good way or for me is the best way for transmit the values and the goals for friendship and uh, sports and working about uh, the <clears throat> and as told as john told the 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 climate the climate crisis and and working in this in this area thank you thank you very much thank you next uh, to mr jonathan Cesare, please Thank you very much. Um, I think I said most of what I wanted to say. I think um, we are very, very keen at STI to spread the message to new countries and to work more actively uh, with countries uh, 
with whom we haven't had quite so much contact. We really are particularly keen to develop sail training in Asia and to come up with uh, events where we can bring all of the Asian countries together and hopefully persuade uh, uh, ships from other parts of the world uh, to journey there, to join in an event. It would be a, a great achievement if we could do that. Um, and uh, we'd be very happy to help any events that you want to organize. Uh, and we'd be even happier if you could find us uh, a generous sponsor for, uh, for those types of events. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, and the last, uh, Commander Raul Mimbachas, please. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, just to highlight uh, that uh, our organization, the organization who tried to, to spread is the uh, international friendship and to highlight the values that the young people can get from uh, doing sail training. Um, skills that uh, they will use uh, not only at sea, they, they will use in, in their lives, in the civilian or military or whatever life. So uh, that is our goal to spread our skills and, and the international standing. Thank you. Thank you for all speakers, for all your uh, statement. Ladies, gentlemen, and all participants, I wish to thank you all for demonstrating your attention in this session. And I want to thank the presenters for sharing knowledge, sharing thoughts that you saw throughout this afternoon. At the end, I believe that we have common understanding that at cell training is essential to develop, to educate young people, to promote friendship, and to unite them through diversity. It is also an interesting idea to have Asian Toship training group in the region for promoting and enhancing maritime culture. Now I call the MC to close and continue for the next session. Once again, thank you very much for all attention and participation during this session. MC, please continue. Thank you, sir. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we just now finish all the discussion for this session, and hopefully the discussion will be beneficial for all of us. And now I would like to invite the speakers, First Admiral Harris Bima, moderator and co-moderator, also the representative from United Kingdom Embassy. Please come forward to receive the mementos of appreciation. And I would like to invite the assistant of operation of the Chief of Navy, Rear Admiral Dadi Hartanto, to give the momentos of appreciation.
Thank you, sir. So please, uh, back to your seat. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the end of day one of the symposium. Tomorrow we will continue for the second day of the International Maritime Security Symposium 2021 with all the comprehensive presentations and discussion. Thank you for your participation and we will see you all here again tomorrow. Have a great day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.